I was on patrol one night in my town, and we were told to go to some weird place that none of us had ever heard of. Cernan Lake is how it was pronounced. I haven't been able to find it on any maps after the fact, and we had to be directed by dispatch to a back road which was barely visible from the highway. Grass had grown over most of it, and you could only see tiny gravel rocks here and there. We're not strangers to small towns out in the middle of nowhere, seeing as there is a ghetto calling itself Lake Annette nearby. We don't ever go out there. Anyway, someone had reported a woman screaming inside of a motel, and two men had gone into that room and not come out. Naturally, this sounds like a pretty big deal. So, another officer, in his own car, and I, went out there. We were sent out, being guided over radio by dispatch. And when we get there, it's basically just a set of eight buildings, one of which is a gas station. There were no pumps, and it was basically just a house with a concrete drive-in. The motel is the closest thing to the road. A bunch of people, maybe around nine, were standing outside the motel. Most of the lights inside were on, and at first we didn't hear any screaming. We tried briefly talking to people outside about what was going on, but everyone said something along the lines of, I don't know, I just woke up because of the screaming. Seeing as this was a potentially dangerous situation, I drew my taser and my partner drew his service pistol in case the taser didn't work for whatever reason. Thick clothing, probe going off too far to one side, lots of things can go wrong with a taser. And as soon as we open the front door to the motel, the screaming starts up again. It was incredibly painful on the ears, and it caused us to run to the room from which it was coming, yelled in that we were the police, and entered. As soon as the door is open, the screaming stops. Just gone. The room looks completely ransacked, scratches on the walls. No blood, though. Nothing seemed to be missing, just misplaced or damaged. The bathroom was completely clean, no scratches. Closets were empty. Looked under the bed, nothing there. We poked around for as long as we felt necessary and radioed in that we didn't find anything. We waited for other people to come out to help. We left, went back to the station, and wrote up our written reports. We still have absolutely no idea what happened. Investigators don't have any idea. And we haven't heard anything from the lake town since. I've been having sleep paralysis fairly frequently, hearing scratches on the walls and footsteps ever since, as well as nightmares. I've been working with a psychiatrist to deal with it, trying to see if Ambien or something will keep me from experiencing sleep paralysis. I've been tempted to go out there again on my own time, but I haven't been able to work up the nerve. Our department can't afford body cams for everybody, since we're a small town department. We can barely afford repairs on vehicles, so we didn't get any footage. Does anybody have any idea what the cause of this may have been? I'm leaning towards some elaborate prank of some kind, but it just seems odd. It would have taken way too much effort and coordination to actually fake that. And for what? It wouldn't have been worth it. We've seen the guy who owns the gas station coming up to our gas stations and filling up gas cans, putting them in the back of his pickup and driving back toward the highway with them. I also asked around at the post office and they said that they do occasionally get mail to and from that area, but mostly tax stuff. I haven't been able to find it on any maps. The view is blocked by trees on Google Earth and you can't really see the turnoff on the highway from it. I have been having trouble finding any official records related to it at all, aside from one case file from the early 90s, way before I was even born, about a textbook domestic disturbance. I don't know what it was, ghost town, something else, but it's haunted me ever since. These events occurred two summers ago in the Grand Teton area. 
My boyfriend at the time, now husband, let's call him Harry, was an avid outdoorsman and also served in the military. I was an ecology major and wanted to spend more time outdoors. So he decided to take me on my first backpacking trip, just the two of us. For those who aren't familiar, the Grand Tetons are well known for their wildlife, specifically grizzly bears. My only experience with bears up to this point was watching a little black bear cross the road from the safety of my car. Seeing grizzly country signs around every corner wasn't doing much to calm my nerves. The first incident. My boyfriend looked like Indiana Jones, machete hanging from his belt, large knives attached to each side of his pack, bear spray strapped to his waist. You get the picture. The beginning of our 25 mile journey was all uphill. When in bear country, you're supposed to make noise so as to not startle the wildlife by accidentally sneaking up on it. As you can imagine, going up a steep hill while carrying a 40 pound pack makes it a little difficult to make conversation. We were an hour in and almost at the top of the ascent. I noticed that the woods had gone completely silent save for the rushing stream that was to our left of the trail. Silent woods are never a good sign. This usually indicates that predators are nearby. At this point, I was in front of my boyfriend and we were about to crest the hill. For the past 20 minutes, we hadn't said a word to each other, having been too tired to speak. We noticed the silence at the same time and gave each other knowing glances. I came up over the top of the hill and immediately froze. Sitting not 10 feet in front of me in the middle of the trail was a grizzly bear. My husband wasn't aware yet as he was behind me. So I did the first thing I could think of. While still in my frozen stance, I managed to take my arm and start flinging it wildly behind me trying to get Harry's attention. I was too terrified to speak. The bear went from sitting to all fours, not looking away from us once. Harry quickly swung me around so that I was behind him and he just started yelling. Being in the military, he knows how to yell. The grizzly wasn't quite phased as it started to walk slowly toward us. At this point, I was on the verge of passing out from terror. This bear was about five feet in front of us when we heard a loud crack coming from the woods to our right. The bear heard it too, and he bolted toward the stream. A second crack boomed again, this time much closer than before. My boyfriend said, it's probably just some falling branches but we both knew that wasn't the case. At this point, we were walking quickly up the trail in an attempt to create some distance from the grizzly and those strange noises. I felt the hairs on the back of my neck stand straight up. And at the same moment, my boyfriend stopped moving in front of me. He turned around to look at me and I turned around to look behind me. To this day, we're not sure what we saw. Back where we had been standing was a large black brown mass. It looked to be three times bigger than the already large grizzly that we had seen just a few moments before. Its back was facing us and then it stood on its hind legs. It looked similar to a bear, but something about the shape was just off. At this point, it was probably stupid to run away, but that is exactly what we did. We were aware of heavy footsteps behind us, but neither of us looked back. The footsteps eventually faded. At this point, I was a mess. My boyfriend was doing his best to console me. Honey, this is extremely unusual. The bears usually stay away from humans. We're going to be okay. 
I'm sure that won't happen again. That was enough to convince me to continue on the backpack. Not another hour later though, we reached a clearing where we decided to take a rest and have a snack. About a minute after we had sat down, I noticed bushes moving in a line toward the clearing, toward us. Out of the brush comes this adolescent grizzly who looks just as spooked as I'm sure we did, but he came straight for us. My husband, being the crazy nut that he is, decided to charge back at the bear while screaming, bear spray at the ready. That did the trick and the bear ran off. All I could think was just my luck, but that wasn't even close to what happened the second night. Night two. Before we began our backpack, we had to let the ranger station know which trails and route we planned to take. With this information, they usually send a ranger on horseback at some point during the backpack to check on you, just to make sure everything is okay. There weren't many approved trails left for us to choose from, and it was just our luck that they were the most difficult. Apparently, over the three days that we were on those trails, we had been the sole hikers. We didn't see a single other person once we were en route. However, I guess we missed the ranger who came to check on us. We had been following hoof prints the entire second day, and we hadn't seen any the day before. I had some foot problems, so we spent valuable daylight trying to adjust my boots, laces, and socks to compensate for the pain. When we started on the trail again, we had maybe an hour or two of daylight left, and in the woods, it gets dark fast. I was exhausted. It was now dark out, and Harry was the only one with a working headlamp, as mine wouldn't even turn on for some reason. We needed to find somewhere to set up camp, as we still needed to eat. It was freezing, and the wind was blowing. It was creating a howling sound as it rushed through the trees, which made it difficult to hear Harry or discern any other sounds coming from the woods. After another hour of hiking through the dark, we found a clearing. Well, it was more like a bowl. It looked to be about 200 meters in diameter, with the sides being about 10 meters down from the trail to the bottom of the clearing. This place was strange. We both felt it, though he didn't tell me how freaked he was until after we had left. There was no moonlight, so all we had was the illumination from his headlamp, our small camp stove, and the flashlight that I had fished from my pack. Half of the trees were dead or fallen, but just in the bowl. The vegetation everywhere else was very dense. To help alleviate my anxiousness, he started playing some music out of his portable speaker. This didn't help much, as it just echoed off the trees, creating a dissonance of sounds. He also thought that it would ward off any predators nearby. This is when we knew our anxiety was not paranoia. The silence was back. There hadn't been a single bird chirp since we arrived at the clearing. It also may have had to do with the obnoxious music, but because of our previous experience, we decided to turn off the music and head into the tent. Aside from everything else, it was freezing. As soon as we were situated in our sleeping bags, we heard deep cracks and thuds echoing from beyond the tree line. Falling trees? There had been a lot of wildfires and very little rain this season. Thud. We both froze. That sound wasn't an echo. It came from inside the clearing, and it was definitely not a falling tree. Thud. It came from right outside our tent. We both stopped breathing. Harry's hand found mine, and we clung to each other, paralyzed. 
something dragged across the outside of our tent, making an indent as it went along. It was thin, almost like a finger. What is it? I whispered, shaking. I don't know. It shouldn't be a person. We're the only ones on this side of the mountain. I was trying my hardest to stifle sobs, trying to listen to what was outside. I could hear steps, but I couldn't decipher what it was. The steps stopped, and then the whole side of the tent was slowly pushed inward. At this point, whatever was outside knew we were inside, so I shined my flashlight at the side of the tent. What I saw made my blood run cold. Pressed into the tent wall was the shape of a human face. I could make out the nose, an open mouth. Each time they breathed, it made the tent around their mouth billow in and out. Harry said, F that, and pulled a Glock from his sleeping bag. He cocked it and the sound shattered the silence. The face pulled back, and we heard fast footsteps heading toward the edge of the clearing. We didn't leave the tent till the sun was shining the next morning. The first thing we noticed was the smell of urine. We came out of the tent and looked around. Whoever it was had peed on our coals that we had left on the fire, leaving a disgusting stench of evaporated pee. Footprints surrounded our tent, circling around it multiple times. Muddy handprints decorated the outside of our tent. At least, we think it was mud. The takeaway? Wildlife is not the most dangerous thing in the backcountry. telling this story for 80% entertainment value and 20% feedback. This is entirely true. I'm not a spiritual person. I'm resistant to energies and vibes, though I do believe that there are others who are more tapped into their surroundings than I am in that regard. And I'm a cynic with most paranormal things, except Bigfoot. I believe in the Squatch, but we ain't talking about him. I live in the foothills of Western North Carolina, near the base of the Blue Ridge. I lived in the mountains for a few years and hated it up there. I despise the woods with a burning passion. Yet, just my luck, I've moved back in with my folks, in their cabin, surrounded by woods. The land my family owns stretches across about 15 acres of woodland. Now. These are the woods I grew up in. Despite my typical aversion to nature, I do feel pretty safe in them. I climbed the trees and splashed in the creek and played with stick swords when I was a kid. These woods are home, except for the area behind the backyard. Our cabin is positioned at the top of a pretty steep hill that slopes down for about a half mile before it bottoms out at a creek down in the woods. The halfway point between the house and the creek is this little patch of woods right behind the fenced in area around the house. It's always in shade, no thick undergrowth, just trees, Carolina red clay, piles of leaves, the usual, but it feels really weird down there in a way that I can't explain. I feel very unwelcome out behind the house, and I'm not the only one. My parents avoid it too. Even our pets, past and present, have always steered clear of it. I'm going to list some experiences that might get my point across better. A. I was about eight or nine, and one summer, I thought I'd try camping in the backyard. I set up my family's unused tent, 
loaded it up with an air mattress and a pile of blankets, copper, my beloved deer stuffy, and some comic books. I guess I wanted to be excited about it, but even before the sun went down, when my mom was helping me set up my little camping trip, I felt uneasy. The shady patch of woods around the backyard was just weird, but I was a kid, so I figured, screw it, I'm 20 feet from the house, I'll be fine. I was not fine. I got set up for the night, stayed up reading comics, felt like an outdoorsman, and it had barely gotten dark when I began hearing loud, rhythmic crunching in the woods behind the backyard, like something big was walking in circles around the undergrowth. We don't have bears in my neck of the woods. Besides, whatever it was, it was definitely walking on two legs. It never tried to approach the backyard, even as I sat there with copper, just listening to it. It just kept walking. I barely lasted an hour in that tent before running inside and getting into my own bed. B. My mom is an avid gardener and decided that she was going to put together four or five raised gardening beds in the backyard for herbs and veggies. This was when I was 11-ish, so naturally I was roped in to help. We spent the first part of the spring putting them together and getting them started. I began noticing that both of us would get really edgy and irritable back there. We're best friends and we never fight, but we would be snapping at each other, constantly raising that stupid garden. I also noticed for the first time that the woods behind the house are deathly quiet. Playing music or talking didn't make any difference. It was that kind of silence that presses in on you. And it's always like that back there. The beds actually thrived for a little while, but mom would always ask me to come with her when she tended to them. I thought it was silly at the time. When I got older though, she told me she just couldn't be down there by herself. She'd wait until I was home from school before checking on them because she too felt uneasy and unwelcome. Eventually, we just abandoned the project. The raised beds are still down there, by the way, just rotting away in the undergrowth. I haven't checked on them since middle school and I'm 23 now. C. Lastly, and in my opinion, the creepiest, was the time that I asked mom to cut my hair. We were poorer then, so rather than go to a salon, mom just gave me a twice monthly trim. It was late spring and warm, so she suggested we cut it in the backyard for easier cleanup. I was maybe 13 or 14 at this point. So we ventured down, I brought a stool, and I sat diligently while she cut my hair. Side note, my mom has always cut my hair, so she's very good at it. She doesn't make mistakes. This is important. As she worked and we talked, I noticed that the old familiar feeling of unease was back. We were not welcome back there. The tree stood still and shadowy, despite the brilliant sunny day. And I remember that it was cold, very cold. Mom finished up my haircut and I shook off the extra debris to let her admire her handiwork. She stepped around in front of me, angled my head this way and that, and said it looked good. Three things happened then in very quick succession. First, I felt this squeeze of pressure on my lungs, like I couldn't breathe. It was such a weird sensation that I just froze. All of the uneasiness of the atmosphere pressed in on me all at once. Second, my mom got this weird, vacant look on her face. I remember her smile fading and her eyes going a little glassy, like she was lost in thought. And then she reached out with the scissors, still making this empty expression. 
and snipped a deep cut into the skin over my left eye. I freaked out, jumped down off the stool, and backed away. At that same time, the third thing happened. She seemed to gather herself again. She was almost in tears. She apologized over and over again. We didn't even bother to take anything with us as we ran back up to the house to treat the cut and stop the bleeding. I still have a little scar there and she's never forgiven herself for it. There wasn't even a hair hanging over that eye either. I had a pixie cut at the time. So, yeah, a few of the many weird experiences that make me avoid the backyard now. I haven't even been down there in seven or eight years, but now that I'm living here again, I just sometimes look into the backyard and feel that weird shudder of apprehension. So what's the deal? Why don't we feel welcome in a 50 square foot patch of land that we own? Why is it so dark and quiet all the time? I have no idea, but my parents and I, we just work around it and pretend it isn't there. When I was young, I attended the local scout group based in my village in Hampshire. The amount of things that I learned from scouts and the lessons that it taught me are innumerable, but one particular memory stands out. Once on a camp at an old scouting campsite, I remember we were playing a game at night, which was World War II themed. Our leader loved creating military themed games. In this game, each team had a bomb a colored string of wool, that they had to fix to the enemy base, which was a random piece of rope that was put up in the woods, making sure not to get caught by the enemy soldiers, which were the leaders carrying flashlights. As somewhat of a tactician, I departed from the other scouts, who were heading straight down the main path toward the enemy base, and also toward the leaders, instead opting to flank around deep into the woods which took longer, but proved to be more successful in the dark. Eventually, deep in the woods and on my way to another bombing run, I heard the distant sound of the whistle. This signaled that the game was over and that everyone should return to the camp. I began making a leisurely stroll back through the darkness. I can't remember if I was alerted by sight or by sound, but my attention was drawn to a short silhouette walking through the woods about six to eight meters away. Assuming that this was one of the younger scouts who was also returning to camp, I decided that it would be funny to try and scare them by making growling noises. Immediately after making the noises, the silhouette stopped dead in its tracks, turning toward me. In the darkness, I couldn't make out any of their clothes or features, but I could clearly see the blacked out silhouette of a child. After the figure had clearly noticed me, but not made a sound, I decided to carry on making growling noises. But then the silhouette just turned around and began to walk away from me. They were clearly unfazed by my attempt to scare them. So I figured that I would just follow them back to camp. However, after a few steps, the figure literally face planted into the ground, still about eight meters in front. I jogged a bit to catch up with them and make sure they were okay, but upon reaching where they were, there was no trace of anyone. Confused, I looked around for a short while, seeing if they had scrambled off, but there was no noise of someone running away, and I didn't notice them get up. They had just vanished. Still in a state of confusion, I continued to walk back to the camp alone. I didn't really tell anyone until years later when it clicked in my brain that things just didn't add up. Something else that sticks in my memory from that camp, which is probably unrelated but still strange, was that part of the woods had been cut down and the grounds heavily churned up by some sort of heavy-duty machine. 
Whilst exploring this area, some of my friends and I found an old leather briefcase that looked like it had been churned up by whatever machine had been in the area. Upon opening the briefcase, we found a really old scouting uniform, think sand colored and military style with shoulder lapels, with quite a few loose badges and some other personal items that I can't remember. I don't know if it was related to the boy or not, but it's still kind of strange. Everything happened this summer when I was working and living in the Chicago area. I don't know much about spirits or paranormal events, so I'll give you the facts of what happened and you can come to your own conclusions. In the first few weeks of my new job, I met this really great guy. We'll call him Paul. We hit it off immediately, and one day he suggested that we go hiking in the woods. I'm originally from Russia, so I was practically raised in the woods. I spent half of my childhood in them, and I was really excited about his proposal. As we're hiking, it starts raining, like pouring rain. I've never seen anything like it. We go deeper and deeper into the forest until there are no more paths and we're practically treading swamp water. All this time, we're just talking about random stuff and getting to know each other while not really paying attention to the surroundings. There's no one around since we've gone pretty deep into the woods already and it was pouring buckets. Eventually, we stumble on the skeleton of a teepee, just the bare wooden structure of it, and thought that it was pretty cool, so we kept going in that direction. Suddenly, we both hear someone crying. It sounded like a baby. It is a forest, so lots of animals can imitate that sound, like deer, cubs, etc. And the cry sounded distant anyway, so we thought nothing of it and walked forward. Within seconds, we heard this thing right next to us, which seemed strange since it sounded so far away at first. It was so loud now that it could have been a few feet away. We start looking all around, even looking up into the trees, and absolutely nothing was there. It was a pretty weird situation, so we kind of speed walked in the other direction. As soon as we stopped for a break, the sound starts up right next to us again. It was like something was telling us to book it, so we did. We ran faster than what was probably safe in that kind of weather, half looking at Google Maps and half relying on memory. We made it back to the entrance of the woods. Both of us agreed that what happened was pretty weird and decided to look into the history of the place. Immediately websites like most haunted forests in Illinois started to pop up. Turns out that the place was the site of ancient Native American burial grounds. Not surprising since a lot of tribes used to live in various parts of Illinois. And apparently, it's where three young boys were brutally murdered and left naked in a ditch. Pretty dark stuff. Paul and I went back and I kind of forgot about the incident until one evening after work, he tells me that he can't stop thinking about the cry and he wants to go back to see what was there. Naturally, I think it's a stupid idea, especially because it was already dark out. But then Paul's friend Ryan joins him for kicks. And since I'm worried for both of their safety, 20 something fresh out of college dudes can be very dumb. I come along thinking that at least I could try to keep them out of trouble. So we hop in the car and we drive over there. Traffic is insane and my friend takes a wrong turn, so we get there at around 11 p.m. We get out and head into the forest. Now there's no street lights anywhere near us, except right at the edge of the road, and flashlights can only do so much, so our visibility is pretty bad. We eventually get to a small wooden bridge that leads us across the river into the actually deep part of the forest. As soon as we cross, I start feeling uneasy. We weren't supposed to be in the woods that late in the first place, but this was a deeper feeling of guilt. 
like we were intruding or disturbing something that was there. Ryan, who's been leading the way and feeling all confident and cocky, saying that there's nothing out here, stops all of a sudden. On the other side of the bridge, the three of us were hit with this feeling of dread and panic, one that I've never felt before in any forest, and I've been to lots, both in the day and at night. We all exchange nervous looks, and suddenly, we hear crunching, coming toward us from the dark. The feeling at this point gets so intense that Ryan, confidently walking ahead seconds ago, now looks uneasy and says, I think we should go back. We all slowly turn around and start speed walking toward the bridge. No one talks until we get to the other side. And Ryan says, I, I was just nervous because, you know, it might have been a homeless person and I didn't want to deal with that. Right. Eventually, we get to the road where our car was parked, along the side, and that's when I see a girl, maybe in her early 20s, just walking along the highway. She was wearing very little clothing and looked a little strange. Her walk wasn't a drunk one, she just seemed to be almost, I don't know the right word for it, but vibrating, undulating, I'm not sure. But there wasn't a building around for miles, just straight road. My stepdad is Malaysian, and he's told me a bunch of ghost stories about young ghost women on the side of the road killing drivers. But I was willing to risk it, because I didn't want to leave this girl all alone, ghost or no ghost. So I convinced Paul to slow down a bit when we got to her. I called out to her from the passenger window, asking if she needed help. The girl slowly turns around, and with the creepiest, slowest smile spreading across her lips. She nods. I was hit with that same feeling that I had gotten back there in the forest and almost regretted slowing down. But whatever, my sense of wanting to help that girl was greater than whatever weird stuff I was feeling. And if I died, well, at least I'd have a clean conscience. She gets in the back of the car, right behind my seat and next to Ryan, and he just starts to chat her up flirting, asking her where she's from and what she's doing. Typical. All this time, I'm turned halfway around keeping an eye on her because I feel like as soon as I turn around and face the road, something bad is going to happen. She's keeping steady eye contact with me the entire time, even when Ryan is talking to her, with that slow, creepy smile. While slightly undulating, I still don't know what to call it but it seemed snake-like. Ryan asks her where she's coming from, and she says, oh, just around. He asks if she's coming from a bar, and she nods her head yes. Except there's not a single bar anywhere even close, not for miles and miles. She said she was walking home and gives Paul an address, which is 15 minutes away by car along nothing but forest. My eyes literally hurt from keeping eye contact with her, and she just keeps smiling and undulating and giving off this feeling of dread. This feeling just keeps increasing, so eventually we drop her off at her street. There are lots of old-looking, smaller houses there. When I turn back to look at her a second later, she's completely gone. I couldn't sleep that night. I kept imagining her creeping up the stairs her smiling face undulating from the shadows. About three years ago, I was on a family vacation to Eastern Washington, and a central aspect of our trip was visiting Lake Paragon State Park it's an extremely rural area with a tiny western town about a mile away. And that's about it for miles. Anyway, we had just arrived for our 10 day stay in the afternoon and it was now around 11 p.m. My mom and I left our hotel to go down to the park as she was really into photography and the moon was full. If you're not familiar, Eastern Washington as a whole is pretty desolate 
So the night sky is generally incredible, with very little light pollution. There were no clouds to be seen, and we were a ways down a dirt back road over the park, above the campground, with no real roads anywhere in sight. We got out of the car and took some pictures, with nothing more unusual than the eerie silence. About 15 minutes into our visit, we're both facing away from the moon, looking at the rolling hills, and we notice this odd concentration of light on one hillside, about a quarter mile away. Before either one of us could point it out to the other, the mass of light shining on this hill rolled away into nowhere. It took two seconds and was entirely gone. The whole hillside was brightly lit up, and then nothing. We freaked out and got out of there as fast as humanly possible. We both saw it. There were no other people, no moving clouds, and no roads from which headlights could shine. We still have no explanation for what we witnessed. I was on patrol one night in my town, and we were told to go to some weird place that none of us had ever heard of. Cernan Lake is how it's pronounced. I haven't been able to find it on any maps after the fact, and we had to be directed by dispatch to a back road, which was barely visible from the highway. Grass had grown over most of it, and you could only see tiny gravel rocks here and there. We're no strangers to small towns out in the middle of nowhere, seeing as there's a ghetto calling itself Lake Annette nearby. Anyway, someone had reported a woman screaming inside of a motel, and two men had gone into the room and not come out. Naturally, this sounds like a pretty big deal. So, we're sent out there and being guided over radio by dispatch. When we get there, it's basically just a set of eight buildings, one of which is a gas station. There were no pumps, and it was basically just a house with a concrete drive-in. The motel is the closest thing to the road. A bunch of people, maybe about nine, were standing outside the motel. Most of the lights inside were on, and at first we didn't hear any screaming. We tried briefly to talk to the people outside about what was going on, but everyone said something along the lines of, I don't know, I just woke up because of all the screaming. Seeing as this was a potentially dangerous situation, I drew my taser, and my partner drew his service pistol in case the taser didn't work for whatever reason. Thick clothing, probe going off too far to one side, something like that. As soon as we open the front door to the motel, the screaming starts up again. It was incredibly painful to the ears and caused us to run to the room from which it was coming. We yelled in that we were the police, and we went in. As soon as the door is open, the screaming stops. Just gone. The room looks completely ransacked, scratches on the walls. No blood though, nothing seems to be missing, just misplaced or damaged. The bathroom was completely clean, no scratches. Closets were empty. We looked under the beds even, and nothing was there. We poked around for as long as we felt was necessary and radioed in that we didn't find anything. We waited for other people to come out and help. We left and went back to the station and wrote up written reports. We still have absolutely no idea what happened. Investigators don't have any idea, and we haven't heard anything from the lake town since. I've been having sleep paralysis fairly frequently, hearing scratching on the walls and footsteps, as well as nightmares. None of this happened until we went there. I've been working with a psychiatrist to deal with it, currently trying Ambien to see if it'll keep me from experiencing sleep paralysis. I've been tempted to go out there again on my own time, but I haven't been able to work up the nerve. Our department can't afford body cams for everybody, since we're a small town department. We can barely afford repairs on our vehicles, so we didn't get any footage. I have no idea what this might have been. I'm leaning towards some kind of elaborate prank, but it just seems odd. Like, it would have taken way too much effort to actually fake it to be worth it. We've seen the guy who owns the so-called gas station coming to our gas stations and filling up gas cans. 
He puts them in the back of his pickup and drives back toward the highway with him. I also asked around as the post office said that they do occasionally get mail to and from there, but it's mostly tax stuff. I haven't been able to find it on any maps. The view is blocked by trees on Google Earth, and you can't really see the turnoff on the highway. I've been having trouble finding really any official records related to it, aside from a case file from the early 90s, before I was even born, about a textbook domestic disturbance. A couple of years ago, my pops and I decided to go on a road trip. It was very out of the blue. I wasn't even expecting it, but I decided to go anyway. It would be some solid father-son bonding time. After driving for what seemed like a couple of hours, it was maybe around 8 to 9 p.m., we pulled up into this gas station for snacks and water and to use the bathroom. And we went back inside our car. Keep in mind, this gas station was basically in the middle of nowhere. Anyway, we got back into our car and decided to look for a motel, but there were none. And I mean, there wasn't a single one anywhere near us. My dad was really tired, so we decided to sleep in the car. We pulled up into this sort of resting area slash parking lot and decided to go to sleep. My dad fell fast asleep, but I was on my phone for a couple of hours and around 11 p.m., I just felt suffocated by the tense air and I decided to step out for a bit. I felt safe because the gas station was still in sight and there would be a couple of trucks that would occasionally drive by, so I felt at ease. At this time, I was also texting my friend who lives in Seattle, Washington, and we were on the phone for a bit. Then I saw what looked like a large cornfield. I was a city guy, so I'd never seen a cornfield in real life. So I decided to cross the road and just get a closer look. So that's what I did. I walked extremely close and started feeling like I was being watched. But again, I thought, well, you're literally outside in the dark standing next to a tall cornfield. Of course you're going to feel weird. So I brushed it off. I even considered going in, but then I thought, why would I even do that? So anyway, I decided to just take a step back when I noticed a barn, a large white barn with red, maybe black strips. It was hard to tell in the dark, but it surely was a barn. And I was stupid and young when this happened, maybe 14 or 15. So out of curiosity, I decided to just check it out. The barn was next to the cornfield, kind of tucked in a little. I literally thought to myself, I wish I could see something that would freak me out as a joke because I never really thought that anything would happen and I love being scared. Anyway, I started making my way toward the barn. Getting closer and closer, I remember very vividly that I was wearing no socks and just slip on slides. I remember the dirt rubbing against my toes while I walked. I remember sending pictures to my friend in Washington jokingly saying that I saw something and I was going to go check it out. As I got closer, I did see something. Behind the barn, but sort of to the side. Like how when someone peers from a corner. At first, I thought it was a bell. Literally, I assumed that it was just a bell attached to the corner of the barn. So I just walked closer. I kept moving toward it. And then I saw the head of something or someone just peering around the corner at me. At that moment, I straight up froze. My flight or fight was out of function, apparently, because there I was literally seeing someone or something peering at the corner, and I didn't do either of those things. After about five to 10 seconds, the noise that Snapchat makes when you get a notification snapped me out of it. And I just ran as fast as I could across the road to my dad's car and got in. I felt a sense of relief wash over my body. And somehow, my dad was not awake. Me gasping for air wasn't enough to stir him from his sleep, I guess. I really considered waking him up and telling him that we have to leave and telling him what I saw. 
but he would assume that I was joking or having some kind of episode since he's never believed in anything paranormal or out of the ordinary at all. I took deep breaths and just texted my friend telling her what I saw, but she didn't believe me. I don't blame her and I won't blame any of you either if you don't believe me. I have a hard time actually believing what I saw sometimes, but I know it was real. I was sober and fully aware, but from the bottom of my heart, the part that disturbs me the most is that whatever was peering at me from around that corner was very tall, at least seven, maybe eight feet tall. And every time I think about that, I get a sense of dread and paranoia. I haven't told any of my family, not even my dad, but if any of you have a clue of what I might have seen, let me know. I wasn't hallucinating. And this was way before I figured out anything to do with psychedelics or drugs in general. I've been trying to piece it together ever since it happened. I was sort of 50-50 on paranormal encounters before, but after that experience, I believe. I believe in walkers and windigos and ghosts and everything pretty much. It's completely changed me. I want to know what's out there. I want to know what I encountered. I'm a sheriff's deputy in a fairly busy county. Along with the job comes the unfortunate familiarity with what a decomposing human body smells like. To me, it's very similar to an animal carcass, but with a much sweeter odor. Not sweet in the sense that I enjoy it, hell no. That smell normally means a bad night for me and another gruesome memory to add to my catalog of things I would rather forget. With that out of the way, I'll get to what happened. Last night I was patrolling a geographically isolated area of the county, which is very large and sparsely populated. Having completed the hour-long trek to the northwestern county line, I began driving through the mountains back toward civilization. About 25 miles from town, or the closest semblance thereof, I hit a straight stretch of highway through a wide valley. Since the weather was nice, I had my windows rolled down. As I passed the entrance of an old logging road, that familiar smell of sweet rot suddenly filled my car. Not just a whiff, a cloud of it filled the cab as if there was a weak old human corpse sitting in the front seat next to me. It was all too familiar, but this time there was something else that I couldn't place. It lingered for a few moments, then went away just as quickly as it had entered. Realizing what I had just smelled, my heart sank and I pulled to the side of the road. I told myself it was just a dead animal in the ditch and that my mind was playing tricks on me. I turned my car around and drove slowly back toward the logging road. The closer I got to it, the smell became stronger and I grew more certain that I was about to find a body. Holding on to a shred of hope that I was wrong, I parked my unit on the side of the highway just before the dirt road. I radioed to dispatch, told them my location and that I would be out of my unit for a moment. I didn't say why to avoid an awkward disregard on a possible body on the side of the road. I shined my flashlight into the ditch and into the encroaching briars and weeds as I walked closer to where I believed the source of the smell was. Once I was a few yards away from the dirt road, I saw the opening of a concrete culvert going under the highway. At this point, the smell was nearly as strong as it had been when I first passed. The opening of the culvert was about three feet in diameter, just large enough to hide a body inside. I cursed and held my breath as I leaned over and shined my light inside. An empty tunnel stretched the width of the highway. Somewhat relieved, I stood and looked around. It smelled as if I was standing on top of whatever was emitting the odor. I searched around the brush for a moment, but found nothing. Thinking the origin might be on the opposite side of the highway, I crossed to the other ditch to continue searching. As I walked away from the other side of the road, 
the smell grew faint. I stopped at the opposite end of the culvert and peeked inside, just to double check. The odor was nearly gone at this point. I stood up and checked my surroundings when I heard a crack in the brush behind me and the smell engulfed me even stronger than before. Thinking for a moment that the wind must have shifted, I froze when I realized the air was dead still. Whether it was fear or something else, a shiver went down my spine. In the distance, I saw headlights coming down the highway. As the car came near, the odor seemed to move away, farther into the bushes toward where I had heard the crack. The car stopped, and the passenger rolled down the window and asked if I was all right. I lied and told him that I was. I thanked him for checking, and I walked briskly to my car as they drove away. I got the hell out of there. Once I was able to get cell service, I called my friend who was patrolling the opposite side of the county. I explained what had happened, trying not to let on that I was spooked. Once I was done, he paused for a moment, then asked about the unusual hint of something which accompanied the smell. He asked if it was sulfur, and I put two and two together. It was sulfur that I had smelled. I asked if he thought I had found a demon in the middle of nowhere, to which he responded with a concerned, yes. This guy is the son of a missionary and has been all around the world. He has seen, rather smelled, this before and told me that it was a very concerning experience. This spooked me even more because his responses were very out of character for him. Maybe something else happened. Maybe there's some shred of a possibility that there's a scientific explanation. But honestly, I think I agree with my friend. I think there's a demon in the valley. I've lived in rural Massachusetts for 17 years of my life, and I've encountered a lot of wildlife in my time here. One day I was moving my mare up toward another pasture, which was a little ways down from my house, a good 15 minute walk. I tacked her up and we were making our way down the main road. The road is still very rural, dense forest lies on either side, and cars rarely drive on it. It's a perfect main road to horseback ride on. All of a sudden, my mare wouldn't keep going. Annoyed, I dismounted and decided to lead her on foot to the pasture. We were making our way around a corner when I noticed my mare's gaze fixated on something. Less than 15 feet away from us was a large black bear. As we made eye contact, my heart sank into my stomach. I was 16 years old at the time and barely weighed 100 pounds. Staring down something so large is unforgettable and it was one of the scariest things I've ever experienced. Not only do I have this thing's attention, but I have a whole damn horse with me, and I'm on the ground, not even on the horse. Maybe I didn't act the way I was supposed to, but I'm alive, so I'm not complaining. I slowly started walking backwards with my mare, not wanting to risk anything. Adrenaline does weird things. After I re-rounded the corner and the bear was out of sight, I mounted my mare and made my way back to my house. I actually drove up with my car and managed to get a few blurry pictures of it, but nothing to write home about. I have had a lot of weird ass borderline paranormal encounters in the woods, but nothing beats mother nature's creatures. I lived in Germany for many years while my father was stationed there in the U.S. Army. We lived off base in private housing and I loved it. That country is amazing. The vast forests, the mountains, the countryside, the farmlands, the little towns, everything. I quickly became really good friends with some local boys whose parents owned the town's dairy farm. We were always in the forests running around and exploring 
fishing, playing army, stuff like that. I was around eight or nine years old at that time, and I'm over 40 now. One night, I stayed late at the farm hanging out with the guys. I left at about nine or ten-ish. It was dark, but the moonlight gave pretty good vision. I lived just across the soccer field, and then across a small cornfield from the farm. As I'm walking through the soccer field, I see a bit of movement, just really quickly, out of the corner of my eye along the tree line at the edge of the field. I quickly stepped up my pace. As I turn to take my usual path through the cornfield to my house, I see at least a half a dozen silhouettes emerge from each side of the rows of corn on the sides of the path. I froze. They just stood there. And then all of a sudden, there's one standing behind me. Before I can snap around and get out of there, he asks in German where I'm going. I turned around and what I see surprises but also relieves me. I answered in English and told him I was headed home. He was then curious about my English. Turns out it was a team of special forces operators. I mean, these guys were decked out so much in tactical gear, I couldn't comprehend how they were able to move so stealthily. Night vision goggles, packs, bags, weapons, there was even a dog. They looked like total badasses. Apparently they were using these small towns to do some off-base training. I just happened upon them this particular night. I will never understand why they chose to break cover and show themselves. They could have easily just stayed put and I would have walked right by them none the wiser. But they all walked me home as it was on their way back. It started off super creepy, but it was actually pretty cool. And it's an experience that I will never forget. In college, I lived up on top of a mountain road, but still only five miles to town, down a trail through the woods. There was a hundred plus year old oak in the yard, slab stone porch built by hand. I lived in the studio apartment that was outside of the main house. The main house was haunted, but my shack was cozy. The woods up there were weird too. I never really was in the main house at all, but the three who lived there said some nights you couldn't sleep for all the noise. Floorboards creaking, thumps and knocks, that kind of thing. My experiences happened outside. Like I said, I hunted small game up there, as there must have been a rabbit colony in the vicinity, plus a few squirrel drays. Often out there while I was stalking, I'd get the distinct feeling of being stalked myself. Keep in mind, this stand of forest is only several acres, but was preserved mainly because of the historic oak trees scattered around. It's old woods. I would hear laughter, like children's laughter, but not quite like in a creepy movie. It was a bit distorted, and almost like flirty giggles that you imagine a fairy might make. It would come from a different direction each time I sought it. I eventually decided to stop following it and hunt. It never did stop. I would sometimes spend an afternoon in town having drinks or hanging at my friend's place. I'd finally leave and have enough liquid courage to hike back up the trail in the dark. That laughter would be replaced by noise, just like things running all around you and dashing about in the trees. I've been an outdoorsman for a long time, and I know the woods are noisy at night, particularly in the southern Appalachians. But this was different. It was dead silent out there, in that stand at night, except for this rushing to and fro by some unseen feet. Not like game fleeing, though. Deer run away and crash about doing it. I was a big-time night owl back then, and was regularly up doing schoolwork until three or four in the morning. One such night, it had just snowed a fresh 20 inches or so, decent accumulation for the area. 
Our yard and the woods were like a paradise for me and my dog. I was excited to hunt around the next day for tracks and see if I couldn't locate the rabbit den precisely. I was up working and the dog came scratching to get in, not frantic or anything. I let her in and she lay down to sleep. Odd, because she's a husky and preferred the snow to my tiny heated apartment every time. I decided to call it a night too and went out for a cigarette. It was 3.24 in the morning. I can still see it on top of my MacBook display before I closed it. I went out and noted that the clouds were dispersed a bit and the moon was bright on the snow. I lit my cigarette and was just looking out across the fence and into the woods when something caught my eye. It looked just like a silhouette of somebody leaning against one of those big oak trees, like you'd see somebody with a palm planted against a wall with the arm straight out, leaning against it. It's not moving, so I can't tell if I'm just tired, or the lighting is funny, or what. So I walked further to the end of the porch, and as soon as I stepped off onto the fresh snow, it took off. The thing was tall. My estimates based on that tree put the thing at seven feet. It ran along the border of the fence and back off into the woods. It was hairless, as far as I can tell, and completely naked. Otherwise, though, its form was just that of a tall, skinny man. I went inside and switched to boots, grabbed my rifle and my flashlight, and I went to check the tracks. I picked up what had to be a set of size 14 or 15 barefoot tracks. It ran along the fence and down the treeless stretch of backyard, as if heading into the woods. But then, the tracks just ended about 20 feet short of the wood line. I don't know if it jumped to the tree line or what. It probably could have, but there weren't any more tracks that I could find that night or the next day. It was like it just vanished. Never could explain that one. So this happened last year in Virginia, and is also the reason I never backpack alone anymore. I was taking summer courses at the time, and we ended up with a three-day weekend in June. So I thought it was a great time to go explore some of the Virginian wilderness. I did a Google search, found a state park with a trail that looked nice, and let my roommate and family know the trail I was going to be on. When I got close to the park area, I saw a little outdoor shop where people hiking the Appalachian Trail stop. I went in to grab a map of the area, just in case I got lost. As I was talking to the owner, he mentioned a trail that's not well known that has a pretty cool waterfall and a swimming hole. This piqued my interest, so I had him show me on the map. It took me outside the state park but he said it was a great place to go. I paid for the map and thanked the owner. I texted my roommate and my parents about the new trail, and I parked my car and set off on my adventure. I should note that the waterfall was going to be a side trip from my journey. I was planning three days and two nights. I started on part of the Appalachian Trail, and it was pretty packed with people, and some of them are really fun to talk to. As expected, I got further and further from the main trails, and I saw fewer and fewer people. Around early afternoon, three miles from my destination, I noticed it was unnaturally silent. No birds. No bugs. Not even wind. And I had the distinct feeling of being watched. I shook it off as me overanalyzing the situation. I got to the waterfall, and it wasn't too spectacular, but it was cool to look at. Plus, it had a good size area to swim in, so naturally I stripped down to my skivvies and took a dip. It was pretty refreshing. As I was getting my clothes back on, I started whistling to myself. That's when I heard something whistle the same tune back. I thought it was a bird copying me, 
So I went back and forth with it, and it would repeat whatever I whistled. I thought it was pretty neat. As I was setting up camp, I couldn't shake this feeling that I was being watched again. Like I would get goosebumps and my hair would stand up on end. As night fell, I built a small fire and lit my jet boil to make some dinner. As I did this, I became hyper aware that again, there was no sound, just deafening silence. Some part of my brain was telling me that I wasn't safe and that I should leave. I ignored it and crawled into my tent with my flashlight and book. I went to sleep without incident. When I woke up the next morning, my sight was trashed. My camp stool was nowhere to be found. My bear bag with my food was cut down and the contents were thrown across the site. My first thought was that a crafty animal had chewed through the rope and got the bag. But I looked at the rope, and it was cut with something very sharp. Plus, none of the food was even touched. I also noticed bare footprints, human footprints, all around my campsite. Keep in mind, I'm at least six to eight miles from any road. As I was looking at the mess, I heard a branch snap off in the distance. I turned to look in that direction. I saw nothing. But I heard that whistling again. My whistle from yesterday. But it was different. It sounded more sinister. It made my hair stand on end. And this is when I listened to my instincts to get the hell out of there. It sounded like it was a little off in the distance, so I packed up my camp as fast as I could. As I did, the whistling got closer and closer as I finally finished stuffing the tent into my bag. I didn't even bother with putting anything away properly. I just wanted to get out. The whistling was incessant and sounded like it was coming from all directions. I got fed up with it and finally I stood and yelled into the woods, Shut up! What the hell do you want? It stopped whistling, and it was quiet for a moment. And then it repeated everything I had just said, in my voice. It sounded just like me, but distorted, like it was coming from an old television. After I heard this, I immediately threw my pack on and ran in the direction I'd come from. I heard it moving just behind me, fast switching between the whistle and my voice. It felt like it was toying with me, not coming too close, but never being too far. Eventually, it sounded like it got farther and farther away from me, and then it suddenly stopped. When it stopped, I stopped and turned around. I wish I never had, because I heard the most bone-chilling screech I've ever heard coming from right next to me. That's when I started running again. I didn't look, I just ran. Less than a half mile, I ran into a couple that was also backpacking. They saw the look of terror on my face and asked if it was me that had screamed and asked if I was okay. I told them about what happened and they decided not to go down from where I had just come from. We moved to a more populated trail and, as quickly as we could, all got the hell out of there. As soon as I got back in my car, I drove to one of the park's ranger stations and reported what had happened. Since the site was off park grounds, they told me it wasn't in their jurisdiction but that they would send a ranger to investigate. The ranger station's parking lot runs right up to the woods. As I was getting into my jeep, I hear the whistling coming from the woods just in front of me. The neighborhood where I grew up was more or less suburbs, 
except the back end of it borders a massive field where nothing has been planted for decades. Part of that border is buffered by woods, and it's in those woods where my friends and I would always play. One sunny day, we were particularly deep in the little section of forest. We were attempting to pick through what looked like very overgrown dozer tracks. The woods are thick across North Carolina, but the central and eastern portion is thick with kudzu in particular, and it was giving us hell. We had probably made a mile of progress into this track when we came across a depression full of water. I hesitate to even say that it was a pond, because it was perfectly round, like a crater. The water had obviously receded, and in the middle of it was the exposed roof of an old car. At about that time, one friend found a license plate under the pine duff. It was tagged with buckshot. Next, a door. A full car door, half buried under pine duff riddled with bullet holes and shot. Certainly not an uncommon way to have fun in the South, go out, have a few beers with your buddies and see some old junk. But what we found next wasn't a run-of-the-mill Saturday night. Bones. Our still innocent minds first assumed it was a white-tailed deer. We started dragging out bones and laying them out side by side. I'm not sure if our objective was to make a museum-quality deer skeleton or what, but that's what we did. Then, the pelvis came up. I recognized it immediately, because my uncle was a chiropractor, and had a full model skeleton in his office named Mr. Bones that I would always look at. The more I started to look at our growing collection, the more I started to see Mr. Bones taking shape. I got this weird gut feeling, and being the oldest, I told everybody to stop digging and that we needed to go. There was some protest, but I convinced everyone that this was the best thing to do. We hiked back the way we'd been coming in and went back to the pool down the road, finished out the day, and went home. But I couldn't stop thinking about those bones. That night, I told my mom about what we had found. Then I had to tell Dad the story. At first, they weren't convinced, but I wasn't a dumb kid. I knew what I had seen out there. They talked behind closed doors, going back and forth. The next day, I told the story to two sheriff's deputies and took them to the area where we had entered the woods. About an hour later, there were police vehicles packing the tiny dead end leading off to the woods. Chainsaws cleared brush, and men in white shirts with detective badges smoked cigarettes and talked amongst each other, as men carried bags from the forest and put them into vehicles. Then they were gone. I waited months to hear something, anything, nothing. I asked my parents what had happened, did they figure it out, and over time, their answers would get more and more uninteresting. Eventually I quit asking and forgot about it for the most part. It faded into a memory, fuzzy and dreamlike, the way childhood memories are. Eventually, I came home from college and I was sitting out by the fire with an old neighborhood friend who had been there that day. He saw everything I saw. We started talking about it after a few beers and got curious about the outcome. We started researching online and couldn't find a single word of information on a skeleton discovered in our neighborhood. It was baffling. I asked my parents the next day, and they said they had no idea what I was talking about. His parents said the same thing. Whatever happened that day, whatever they found, it was intentionally buried and forgotten. To this day, they all hold adamant that it never happened, but we hold adamant that it did. A little bit of background about myself. I've worked my entire adult life in the Pacific Northwest woods over 15 years in total, 
with about seven years of that being for the Park Service at Olympic National Park. Many, many experiences over the years could warrant the title of creepy. This one in particular has always stuck with me. While working for the Park Service, one of my jobs was that of a restoration carpenter. We would travel to old backcountry historical cabins, emergency shelters, homesteads, and things like that, tasked with repairing and restoring them to their original historically accurate states. This was a wonderful and demanding job. I'd spend eight days at a time living off the beaten path, usually deep in the backcountry. Sometimes we'd be flown in supplies. Sometimes we would use llamas or mules to pack our gear. All the while, we would sleep in thinly walled single tents, cooking over a fire or whisper light stove, using the same tools and techniques the original homesteaders had at their disposal in the late 1800s to construct and survive in this unforgiving environment. One late fall, I was assigned to work near Lake Ozette at an old homestead off the trail near the constructed boardwalk. For those unfamiliar with the area, Lake Ozette is eight miles long and three miles wide. It sits as the largest unaltered natural lake in Washington state. Lake Ozette has a long and rich history of Native American culture. The Macabre Tribal Center in Nia Bay houses discoveries found in the area dating back 2,000 years, along with a local village that was well preserved over 300 years ago by a mudslide that left most of the artifacts intact. The Ozette Loop Trail, which the homestead was directly adjacent to, is approximately 9.4 miles through and through. The man-made boardwalk takes you under giant cedar groves, meanders through huge patches of chest-high salal, before delivering you to Alstrom's Prairie, about two and a half miles from the trailhead. Alstrom's Prairie, a giant, soggy meadow, was once farmed by two Swedish immigrants. They constructed a small cabin and some outbuildings on the 150-acre bog. With cattle, sheep, vegetable gardens, and the help of a little Swedish ingenuity, they managed to etch out lives for themselves here for over 50 years. Over time, the forest, as it always does, decided to take back what was once its own. The now decades-long abandoned farm was hardly recognizable. Our job was to beat back the encroaching forest, put new windows in the main cabin, pipe in a new stove, apply fresh paint, and fix up portions of the semi-dilapidated barn. The ultimate goal was to allow guided tours to take place at some time in the future. For about three weeks, we stayed at the Ozette bunkhouse while working at Alstrom's. This was good duty for us. We weren't sleeping under the rain, our beds were warm, our hike was short, and the terrain wasn't difficult. We even had a TV. The bunkhouse was located near the highway and ranger station. We would hike the five mile loop every day bringing with us boards, tools, paint, and everything else we would need on our backs. These were full 10 plus hour days. Usually we started our morning hike at around 7 a.m. and we began our evening return hike back to the bunkhouse at around five. At one point during the fall, there were four of us working this project, but at the time of this event, there were only two of us remaining. Most of the hard work had already been finished. We needed to hike a few last boards into the prairie to complete a portion of the woodshed before we could call the job done. I volunteered to be the pack mule for the day, my only job being to carry as many boards as I could muster in each trip to the prairie before returning to the ranger station for the next load. It was late in the season for hikers at this point the weather had turned, and we'd be lucky to see two to three people in an entire day doing the loop. After around my fourth or fifth trip, I was pretty wiped. It was getting late in the evening now, around 4 p.m., and my co-worker had called it a day. I thought I could get one more trip in before it got too dark. My rationale being that the more trips I did today, the less I would have to do tomorrow. 
We passed on the trail. I told him my intentions, and I continued on. I delivered the last boards for the day, took a look around the prairie as the sun started to tuck behind the trees, and started my hour-long hike back to the ranger station. The lighting on the boardwalk was quite low at this point, the cedars blocking most of the ambient light left by the setting sun and making visibility quite diminished. I'm not a nervous hiker, and I failed to spook easily. Having solo hiked for weeks on end in the backcountry, I've been stalked by cougars, confronted by Kodiak bears in Alaska, and even ran into a few demented hillbillies over the years. As I left the prairie that evening, though, the hair on the back of my neck stood on end. Goosebumps erupted from my forearms. An uneasy feeling swept over me, and suddenly I found myself wanting to walk faster, to jog, and then to sprint. I didn't. Instead, I convinced myself that I had been reading far too many novels before bedtime. I walked another five minutes or so before I started to hear something faint, something that sounded like music. Impossible, I told myself. I'm the only one out here, and still at least two miles from civilization. That civilization, in reality, being likely the only other soul out there, my co-worker. Sure enough, however, I heard music. More specifically, a piano. It started out so faint, I had to stop moving and actually try to hear it. The steps on the wooden boardwalk were too loud and covered it up. Every time I paused to hear it, it became unmistakable. It got louder. I stood there, sun now fully hidden behind the horizon in total silence other than this piano. I became aware that there were no longer the noises of life no birds, no insects, no wind, no rustling of leaves or underbrush, absolutely nothing other than the piano. It was as if everything was being weighted down by a fog of emptiness of some kind. I've encountered this dead time before in the woods, certain places have it, but this was different somehow, unique to this location, unique to this moment in time. I tried to focus on the keys, but I couldn't quite recognize the composition. Unsurprising, since I mostly listened to Metallica and Korn at the time. It was playing with a purpose. It was controlled, in tune, thoughtful. It was a song, and somehow I felt that it was meant just for me in this moment. I started walking again, almost on cue, the music got louder. As my pace increased, so did the tempo of the keys, still in tune, never faltering. It reached a climax, the perfect combination of my haste, my dread, my heartbeat, and the tempo of the music. And then, as quickly as it came, the piano stopped, whooshed away in the fraction of a moment. It didn't trail off, it didn't fade into extinction, it was just gone. Suddenly, everything that was absent was swept away as if by a gust of wind. The stillness was gone. The gloom, the stagnation, and weight of everything was just lifted. My next step on the boardwalk was once again in reality. The evening was just as absent of light as before, but it felt like life, somehow, was once again injected back into the forest. The woods seemed normal again. I didn't hear the piano again that night, nor did I sense anything unusual. I told my co-worker every detail when I reached the bunkhouse, and he showed no sign of disbelief. We didn't talk about it again until years later, when something similar happened to another park service employee. I told my grandfather about what happened. He was a retired park ranger who had worked at nearby Mora just the next station over. Without the least bit of hesitation, he goes, Did you hear the bagpipes along with it, or just the piano this time?
This story is from when I lived off the grid in the forest of western North Carolina. Some friends and I all lived in these small shacks, essentially a shed with a loft. They were very close together, so we all lived together in a community. Living in such primal and close conditions breeds a kind of deep, trusting friendship that you just can't get from living anywhere else. Naturally, we did almost everything together. By our little semicircle of houses, there was a railroad track. If you followed it south, it would lead to a waterfall. This waterfall, in particular, is where everybody would go to get high. It was a normal night, humid, sometime in early July. A group of about six friends and I, Laura, Andy, Nick, and some of Andy's friends that I didn't know that well but recognized, decided to walk out to this waterfall in the dark. I was the only sober one in the group, so I felt a higher sense of responsibility for everyone and was therefore on edge and hyper aware of our surroundings. Others would walk faster or slower or stop altogether in the group. So it was natural and expected that we wouldn't be able to see everyone at the same time. Andy was in rare form though. When Laura had to stop to pee, he came out of the bushes and scared her and then ran off ahead behind the rest of the group. This pissed off both me and Laura since it was such a clear invasion of privacy and unnecessarily spooky in the already creepy night. Laura and I eventually got to where we could see Andy again, but he was walking by himself, and then he slipped back into the bushes without even looking at us. Dismissing it as him just being affected, we kept moving forward. Still not back with the whole group yet, we realized that Andy had followed in behind us, just far enough away that we could only see his silhouette. Finally, we catch up with the rest of the group and see that all of us are accounted for, even Andy. We asked him how he got ahead of us and beat us to the group, when he had last been seen at least 15 yards behind us just minutes ago. Everyone went dead silent, as Laura and I realized that whoever had scared her when she peed, and whoever had followed us after that, wasn't Andy or anyone else from the group. We never made it to the waterfall. When I was a junior in college, I went camping with four friends in Bald Eagle State Park in Pennsylvania. We had reserved a campsite that was pretty remote pretty deep in the park, way up on one of the mountains and not near any of the other campsites. It was located at the end of a narrow dirt road, maybe about 75 feet long, which itself broke off from the main road, which was also dirt. There was nothing at the end of the little road except for our campsite. We parked at the entrance and spent the day hiking up to the site setting up camp, and then hiking around. We made a fire, made dinner, and then turned in. Not long afterward, we discovered that one of the guys with us snored, loudly, like walls of the tent shaking snores. Truly deafening stuff. After probably an hour or so, the rest of us gave up on trying to sleep and climbed out of our tents, leaving our loud friend snoring away in his. My friend at the time was a DJ for our school's radio station, and she had a late night show. I think she was on between midnight and 2 a.m. Since we couldn't sleep, we trekked up to the main road, where the reception was a little better, and where we would actually be able to hear the radio over the snoring. When we got to the road, we stood in a loose circle near the entrance to our site. As we stood there, a black pickup truck with its lights off, appeared out of the woods and passed us, very slowly. It was unmarked, not a ranger. We listened to the radio for maybe half an hour or 45 minutes after that, and we even briefly called in to say hi. Finally though, 
we decided to head back to bed. One of the girls went off into the woods to take care of some things while I climbed back into the tent I shared with her and got into my bag. After a couple of minutes, I heard her moving through the leaves toward the tent, coming from the right. At the same time, I also heard the unmistakable rumble of tires on the ground. I stood up and looked out of the little screen window on the tent. We hadn't bothered to put up the rain fly, as it was a perfectly clear night with a very bright moon, so I could see everything. I saw my friend come sprinting back to the tent and duck behind it, just as the black truck pulls into our campsite, still with its headlights off. Then it shuts off its engine and sits there. Our friend is still snoring. I have a little knife in my tent, and I know my other two friends have at least one in theirs, but we have no other weapons, no guns, not even bear spray. So we just watch. As I said, it's a clear night, and I can see the truck just fine. It's maybe 20 feet from my tent, but I can't see who's in the truck or how many people there are. Nothing seems to move inside the truck. I still remember the metallic clunk sounds as the engine cooled off. I honestly have no idea how long I just watched it. My friend had ducked down behind our tent, and I could hear her breathing. I could hear that she was terrified, but neither of us said a word. It felt like it was a really long time. It had to be at least ten minutes that went by but it could have been a half an hour or more. We just kept waiting for something to happen. Nothing did. Eventually, the truck starts up again and then backs up along the narrow dirt road. It never turned its lights on. I heard it drive back in the direction it had originally come from, and that was it. My friend burst into the tent a second later. Now we're all talking. Did you see that? Holy shit! But our friend is still asleep. Eventually, we just went to bed. We packed up and headed out in the morning just as we had planned. And yes, we checked with the park, and they don't own any black, unmarked SUVs. Nor did any ranger come to check on our site during the night. To this day, we have no idea who they were or what they wanted. When I was working as a backpacking guide in Western North Carolina, my schedule dictated a full eight-day shift with six days off. During those six days, myself and other co-workers would play in the woods. In the summer, you can't beat a mountain swimming hole. One of our favorites was called Paradise Falls, alternately called Wolf Creek Falls. This is a cliff jumping spot with a huge swimming area, a tiny slot canyon, and an inner pool. Most will venture to do the small jump into the inner pool. Even though it's the smallest jump, it's arguably the least accessible. Even though the jump is nine feet at most, you have to work through a 10 minute rock scramble to get to the top of it. We were all venturing in, and from inside the tiny canyon, you can't see the main pool. Well, we got to the jump and coaxed the first person off a fellow guide who had never been to the spot before. She jumped successfully and swam out into the main pool and beach area beyond our eyesight, and then screamed. Because she was now out of sight, myself and another guide jumped in together and swam the short distance to her, with others in tow. Of course, we figured she was injured somehow. She was treading water and just staring, wide-eyed at the riverbank. When I looked to the shore, I saw what she had screamed at. There stood a man. He was massively large, easily 6'6 and a little change. He wore beat up overalls and no shirt. There didn't appear to be a hair on him. Perhaps the most disturbing was that he had folds of skin all over his body. Imagine the Michelin man, but 
made of flesh. His face, his arms, his chest, everything had a uniform layer of shingled fat rolls. And he was brandishing a shotgun. The area around Wolf Creek is just holler after holler, but there are a few residences, and those few have been there for generations, propagated by the same families. These people don't like outsiders, and so they keep relations within the family. I could only surmise that this individual was the product of inbreeding over decades. He just stood there and watched as we scrambled to grab anything important and stuff it in a bag. He stood and watched as we hightailed it out of that basin and back toward the parking area and never said a word. I was backpacking through Pisgah National Forest in North Carolina with my dog. Just the two of us, and we were exploring the woods around Little Lost Cove. We were going open orienteering style, so we were not on an established trail. We'd been hiking throughout the day, following a crick, and toward the evening, I noticed my dog was acting abnormally. She was very much caught in a scent of something, and wouldn't ease up. This continued for about two hours before we made camp. That night in camp, she remained on edge and stared off into the woodline. I went about my camp business as usual, and then, at around midnight, I got this prickly feeling, like I was being watched intently. I felt the feeling ride for a little bit, and I kept tinkering with the fire. And then, I heard the brush rustle. I got up from the fire and shone my flashlight up the hillside. A figure on all fours just managed to escape the beam, all but the tail. It was a tail that I knew was not supposed to exist in the southern Appalachians. I cast my light again across the hillside, and this time I caught its eyes. Two glowing yellow orbs, just watching and waiting. At that point, I went into a fury, grabbed my tomahawk, and charged up the hill after the beast, screaming and cursing all the while. The watcher ran off, but neither I or the dog slept that night. The following morning, we left camp at first light and began hiking up the mountain to the ridgeline, which would lead us out. Atop the ridgeline in the fresh mud were a series of tracks. Tracks left by an animal that officially no longer exists in the eastern U.S. They were catamount tracks. They commonly go by cougars in the east, but we'd been stalked by a mountain lion just the same. Those tracks ran across the ridge, revealing that it had been watching and stalking us throughout the entire previous day as we hiked through the creek bed below. They weren't bobcat tracks, I know those. They were way too big, and so were the eyes I saw. I truly believe that if my dog hadn't given me some red flags, I would have been mauled that night. It remains one of my personal scariest experiences ever, and it just goes to show that sometimes, when you feel that something's creepy and off, it can be a lot scarier than a ghost. This is my father-in-law's experience. This happened to him probably 10 years ago at our hunting camp in Alabama. It popped into my head as we're headed there tomorrow for a few days of deer hunting. He told me to go ahead and share his story. It's short, but as I get a little creeped out in the woods as it is, this would have freaked me out. So as some people probably know, you get out an hour or so before light and climb into a tree stand, a ladder leading up to a seat in a tree, usually fairly deep in the woods to hunt. 
this foggy morning, my father-in-law has been in his stand for a couple of hours, and it was getting light. He was reading a book as he waited for something to happen. Out of the fog, he hears a woman's voice, much closer than anyone should have been to him at the time. She's calling, Hunter, oh Hunter, in a very sing-songy voice almost like a mother calling her child in for dinner as he played outside. Now, as I said, he's pretty deep in the woods, and there are sticks and dried leaves everywhere. You generally make a pretty good racket getting to your stand, which is why you go out so early. Not only that, but in order to know where he was and spot him camouflaged in a tree, she must have seen his light when he walked out, followed him into the woods, and waited hours before calling to him. That's the only way she would have gone unnoticed. At first, he thought that the woman was calling someone named Hunter, maybe her son. She called again, and that's when he realized that he is the hunter. So he turns around, peers into the trees, and sees a young woman. She, in very few words and halting speech, explains that something is wrong with her hot water heater, and asks if he can come down and look. Now, the strangeness of the situation hadn't quite set in yet, and he's a give-you-the-shirt-off-his-back kind of guy, not to mention 6'2", nearing 300 pounds and carrying a gun, so he wasn't too worried about a small woman. He starts getting down the tree to go have a look. He follows her back to her mobile home, which borders our hunting land, probably a 10-minute walk. She walks inside and leaves the door open. He's trailing behind a little, so he gets to the door, kind of knocks, and sticks his head in to say hello. No answer. Where he entered is a laundry room, and he can see that there in the room is a hot water heater, and water is just pouring out of a valve at the bottom, just absolutely pouring out onto the floor. He walks over, turns off the valve, sticks his head in the house to say hello again, and nothing. No answer. The house seems completely empty. Empty of people, anyway, but it's a disaster inside. At this point, he's starting to see how strange it all is, and decides that this is just the sort of situation that gets you robbed and murdered. He nopes out of there and hurried back to our cabin. Now, we've hunted this land for years, and we've never seen anybody at this place, although until this season, it has shown obvious signs of being lived in. So, every time I pass her place, which backs right up to the road we take to our hunting stands, I always wonder about her. I'm not entirely sure if she's actually a real woman, or if maybe it was some ghost or something trying to get him to go there for a particular reason, but... It was a creepy experience, nonetheless. It's not unusual for me to trek out on solo hiking day trips. For context, I'm a 31-year-old female. I frequently visit the nearby provincial parks in Canada that are generally well used. It's rare that I end up on a hike not at least seeing one or two people. I grew up going on camping and hiking trips, and I feel very comfortable out in nature. I always inform people where I'm going and when I am expected to be back. Safety first, right? One day last year, I was going stir-crazy. So I took myself out to a popular nature educational center. A bunch of trails stem from this one spot. They're not long trails, but they are all interconnected, so it's easy to create your own distance. It was midweek, so I wasn't expecting to encounter many people, maybe a school group at most. I grab my backpack, lock the car, and head out. It was a beautifully sunny day mid-autumn, so it was a little chilly out. I was listening to the sounds of nature surrounding me. Some squirrels, birds, even a deer crossed my trail at one point. I was sticking with the main trail, 
which had educational signs identifying the different types of plants as he went along. I have been trying to teach myself how to identify different trees on site, so this path was the best. I made my way up the first little hill, and then I made my way down the path, where it takes a sharp right turn. Up ahead, I caught sight of a man wearing a dark blue jacket. Strange, I hadn't seen any signs of the person or heard them, but whatever. Normally, I'm comforted seeing somebody else on the trail, but this time my gut instinct was not happy. I made a note of which way the person went and continued along. Blue Jacket had taken the path that I wanted to take to create a longer hike. It would have been a lot more secluded and less traveled. So for once, I tried to be smart, listen to my gut, and just follow the main route back to my car. Keep it short and safe. There would be other days for a long hike. I still had about two kilometers to get back to the parking lot. Clouds decided that they wanted to skirt across the sky, making the woods a little dull and ominous. I kept looking over my shoulder, feeling very unsettled. The trees cast finger-like shadows that did not help calm my imagination at all. One of my favorite spots on this main trail had a few huge boulders or rock formations right smack dab in the middle that you had to go around. Really neat for photos and climbing on a normal day. But today, they filled me with even more dread. I couldn't pinpoint why, at first until I noticed some scuffs around the base of the rocks, going the wrong way around. The trail is very obvious which way to go, left, and these marks were to the right. It was like somebody walked around the rocks dragging their foot behind them. An animal? Maybe. I couldn't figure it out. I wanted to turn around and go back the way that I'd come, but that would have added another four kilometers to get back to the car. I stuck close to the far side of the real path, keeping a close eye on the rock formation. As I made it to the other side of the rocks, I caught sight of some blue fabric, the same blue jacket that I saw earlier. The person moved, as if ducking down between some rocks to avoid being seen. For blue jacket man to reach the rocks before me, he either cut his own path through the woods or sprinted through about five to six kilometers of trails. I didn't like the thought of either option, as I didn't know this person, and at this point, I didn't want to know them. Maybe he was taking a leak. Yeah, I'll go with that. I picked up my pace and dug my phone out. I texted my usual hiking friend, telling her all the details in case I went missing. Yes, I attempted to do this while following the path, I only walked into one tree. I glanced behind me again while the rocks were still in sight and I saw the man just standing there, looking at me. I ran the rest of the way back to my car, hopped in, and immediately locked the doors. Curiously, there wasn't a single other vehicle in the parking area or on the road nearby. This place was nowhere near any towns, so I have no clue where Blue Jacket came from. I took a couple of minutes to sort myself out in the car, and as I pulled out to leave, I looked at the trailhead. There was that damn blue jacket on the signpost I had just passed to get to my car with nobody visible nearby. I was so spooked by this encounter that I refused to ever hike there alone again. Maybe it was all just an innocent misunderstanding, but it sure scared the hell out of me. About 15 years ago, I lived in Sulphur, Oklahoma. My playground, the Chickasaw National Recreation Area. I loved that park so much. I rode more miles on my bike there than anywhere else. I've walked nearly every trail and ridden nearly every road. Every day, I would ride my mountain bike up and down the trails and would be home by nightfall most days. 
One night, however, I had ridden out a bit further than usual. On my way back, however, I decided to ride the trail from an area known as Buffalo Springs. As the name suggests, they have live buffalo roaming and there's a large spring and fountain for all to enjoy. As I was riding back, I knew the end of the trail was coming up and I would have to cross a stone bridge across the creek and then up the road to my home. It was dark at this time and all I had to see by was the full moon. I was maybe a few hundred yards from it when I got a sharp pain in my left thigh. I stopped and looked around to see what had just hit me. Then I heard a noise sounding like something hitting the ground hard in front of me. There was a rock, about the size of a baseball, rolling across the trail. Me being confused, I looked up the side of the hill. Just as I turned to look, I almost fall off my bike when another rock comes flying down hitting my front wheel. I finally get my eyes to adjust to look and see someone very tall and dark and covered in hair at the top of the hill, throwing things at me and screaming. I yelled that I had a cell phone and was going to call the police. I didn't actually have one as I didn't have a cell phone yet. This seemed to have pissed him off. He started charging down the hill at me. For obvious reasons, I lit up my bike and took off. Just as I crossed the bridge, I heard a huge splashing noise in the creek. I saw that it was a huge rock that had been thrown. I was in the clear to home, but was frightened all the way there. I went to the ranger station later the next morning and told a ranger I knew there about what happened. He said, So you're telling me you were attacked by Bigfoot? He started snidely laughing. I said, listen, I don't know what it was, but something was trying to hurt me out there. The ranger just laughed. Okay, Justin, if we have any more Bigfoot, I'll let you know what we get. I said fine and left. The very next week, I was riding in the daylight when the park ranger pulled up next to me and told me to get in. I asked him why, and he said he needed to show me something. We headed to the police department in town. Before we got out of the car, he turns to me and says, Justin, I owe you a huge apology. I'll be honest, I didn't believe you when you told me the story of how you were attacked, but it's come to my attention that a couple was out in the same area last night, and they were attacked in the same way, saying they had seen a large hairy creature throwing rocks and sticks and screaming at them. They called the police and they came out with some of the other rangers, myself included. I immediately thought about what you told me. When we arrived and started up the hill, sure enough, we were having rocks and things thrown at us. Guns drawn and yelling, two officers tackled a man to the ground. He was six foot five, naked, covered in mud, had long hair and a large beard. Turns out he had escaped from the Veterans Center across Veterans Lake. Apparently, in his mind, he thought he was back in Vietnam, and he was trying to, quote, take out the enemy. The park ranger said that I was very lucky, because while he wasn't Bigfoot, he was trying to kill me. We went inside so I could give the police my statements as to what had happened. They had to send him somewhere to a more secure facility, and... To this day, I still get shivers when I hike that trail, and I always keep my eyes on the ridge top. I definitely feel bad for the guy. That was also one of the scariest things I've ever experienced in the backwoods. I live in the suburbs of Dublin, Ireland, where I'm surrounded by greenery, beautiful hiking trails, and lots of Celtic mysticism. One particular hiking trail is called the Hellfire Club. There's a lot of stories that have been passed on from generation to generation as to where it got the name. But the most popular, as far as I'm aware, is that on top of the mountain where the trail passes, is an old, completely deteriorated stone house. Legend has it 
that back in the day, it was a hangout spot where men would drink, play cards, and have a merry old time. One night, a group of men were playing cards, and a stranger asked if he could join in. During the game, one of the men dropped a card, bent down to pick it up off the ground, and realized the stranger that had joined them had hoofed feet. So, present day, this trail is very popular for hikers and campers. This particular day, three friends decided to go camping and set up tent beside an old hunting lodge. After a few hours, they noticed that someone had set up camp quite close by. Not weird, but maybe a little odd. This guy decided to approach the three campers and introduce himself, and ended up chatting with them for a few hours. After some time had passed, one of the campers decided that they needed more firewood. The stranger went with him and the other two went off in another direction. As the camper was about to get firewood, he was grabbed from behind by the stranger, who put his left hand across his mouth and attempted to cut his throat with the knife. He was sliced across the throat three times before he managed to push the attacker away. He fell to the ground and was then stabbed in the chest. The knife broke, leaving the blade embedded in his chest. The other two realized something was happening and tried to intervene, one being knocked to the ground and the other escaping to go get help. The cops were called and went searching for the guy who they eventually found. It turned out that he had recently spent a lot of time in a mental institution, suffered from a deep-seated mental illness, paranoid schizophrenia, and he had had an acute psychotic episode that day. As far as I know, he got locked up for a few years, but this happened about 10 minutes away from my house. Horror movies come to life. I don't know if these two events are connected, but people say the Hellfire Club in that area, which also happens to be where these people were camping, is cursed. So, back in Halloween of the early 2000s, my friends and I were trick-or-treating, as we were only in our freshman or sophomore years of high school. We had taken a walk to a wealthier neighborhood in the hopes that they would have better candy than ours did, and we were supposed to cut through a slightly wooded area into a friend's backyard. My friend Will was leading us through, and he didn't really know the shortcut back. So, we ended up in a very small clearing, just barely still visible from the street. We could still see the street, though, so we didn't end up getting lost. The point, though, is the house that we found. It was slightly old and definitely abandoned, with all of the overgrowth covering it, making it hard to see from the street. We wanted to check it out, as it was Halloween, and we figured we should get a little spooked. We did get spooked, too, when we peeked through the back screen door and saw a little bit of movement in the pitch-black house. But we were already slightly creeped out, so we decided to walk back and take the right shortcut. As we went back, we saw a little bit of movement behind us, and all of us booked it home, being as excitable as we already were. This all happened five months before the actual point of the story occurred. By this time, we had explored the house, sealing off the first floor with a door, shower curtain, and weights, as there was some kind of substance in the air that would always make us feel unwell. We made a setup out of the upper floor of the house that we could relax in. We were using it as a spot to hang out, having filled it with battery lamps and chairs, as well as sleeping bags for when we would have get-togethers away from our parents for a long time. But as cozy as we made it, the things that we found in the house creeped us out endlessly. The ones I remember the most were the two closets, one with a hook and a rope on the ceiling, and possibly dried blood on the ground. The other closet was filled with plastic on the walls and what we think was also blood. New cleaning supplies were still under the kitchen sink, even though the faucet was removed as well as the oven. There was a functional cotton gin sitting in the empty garage, 
and a grime-covered knife sitting in the sink. We ignored most of these things, and simply sealed off more rooms that creeped us out. But when we found that knife in the sink, I was worried somebody could use it to attack one of us if they somehow ended up squatting in the hideout we made. So I got the genius idea of going to the absolutely filthy brown and black fluid leaking out of the wall's bathroom that no one would ever think to go in, and throw the knife in the toilet, which was filled with the same grime and sludge. But when I went in, I failed to notice the door, for some reason, ever so gently closing behind me. And as I was looking around the bathroom for a place to hide the knife, the room got thick and cold except for a slight warmth on my left shoulder. And I was paralyzed. That moment started to feel like hours. Then, ever so quietly and weakly and tiredly, I heard a noise in my left ear, like something that's a cross between a whimper and a dry-throated croak. It seemed filled with more sadness and panic and pleading than I've ever felt in my entire life. I quickly ran out, tossing the knife behind me, and slammed the door shut as hard as I could, feeling a force pull back against me. Then I ran out to my friends who were just outside by the door. We sealed that room up too, and we only went back to clean out our things. We called the police anonymously and the house was searched, and a few months later it was demolished. I'd like to say that although the police searched and apparently found nothing, I concretely believe that a woman, or maybe some poor girl, died in that house. I hope she isn't angry with me. I'm a 23-year-old boy whose family moved during the Yugoslavian War in 1999 from eastern Serbia to Switzerland. We used to live in a small village across the Danube at the Bulgarian and Romanian border, a region that has a very colorful history. Many bloody historic events occurred on the soil where we lived. Roman emperors used to rule this area as well as many historical figures such as Attila the Hun, Alexander the Great, Vlad the Impaler, and others. They were all once residing here and fighting battles. The region has been occupied many times. The longest used to be under the Ottomans. This occupation lasted for almost three centuries. After the Ottoman occupation, the country didn't have much time to recover and the First and Second World Wars had struck the country already. Many people died during the First World War, about a third of the population. As a result, guerrilla groups were formed, killing even more people. In conclusion, many people were unjustifiably tortured and lost their lives, which is probably why there are many occurrences of the paranormal here. Magic is also very common here. The so-called Vlak magic, or Vlaska magia, in Valation, is said to be one of the strongest in the world, and many people tend to practice it and religiously believe in it. As a result, there are many stories about paranormal events. One of my favorites was a story my grandfather told me. He grew up in the forest, in a small and old house that was about 300 years old. He was adopted by my great-grandfather, who used to be a leader in one of the upcoming resistance movements against the socialist regime after the Second World War. He fought in both world wars, and even with all this, he took great care of my grandfather and loved him as if it was his own child. Fifty years passed since he left his home, and all of those people living here died, but my grandpa still visits the house and stays overnight here. This place creeps me out. Even during the day, there's an aura to this place that just makes it uncomfortable to be here. I can't imagine staying here overnight, but he frequently does, and one day he told me a very weird story. While he stays there, he gets visited often. At first, I thought visits like the one you get from neighbors or something. 
but he told me that one night he woke up to a hand crawling on his head. It was a huge, white, pale man kneeling next to him, using his hand to just crawl across his head, speaking with a calm voice in Vlaski, the dying language that we used to speak here, a mix of Moldavian and Romanian. He told me that his skin was white and that it was glowing in the night. He didn't have any hair, and the hand felt very soft. My grandfather always respected the dead and was never really afraid. He told me that he didn't really speak to him and just enjoyed his company, since he knew in some way that he wasn't evil. Another time he told me that he used to fix small parts around his house. When it started to get dark, he slowly began getting ready to leave with his tractor, because it takes about an hour to reach the next civilized place. While putting stuff back into the barn, he heard loud noises in the attic. It didn't bother him, until a plank was thrown down the stairs. He recalled one time they even threw down a rock into the wheelbarrow that he was pushing into the barn. He told me he just turned around locked the barn, and didn't so much as frown. They expect you to react. Do not give them this pleasure, is what he told me while laughing. It makes them go crazy. Growing up, I heard a lot of these stories, and it really runs in our family, experiencing from time to time such encounters. The scariest thing that happened to me occurred during the summer of 2009. My grandfather told me during this summer break, as usual stories from the past, how he used to walk these woods alone in the dark, and what he experienced while doing so. Since I was in my teen years, I started to question the reliability of his stories. From time to time, I took out my old motorcycle and drove out into the forest. Driving around was the only time I could really think about things, you know? to be in this type of state that you don't have to question everything and think about the world. So one day I took out my bike and decided to drive around. I still don't know why or how, but somehow I find myself driving to the old house he grew up in. I didn't really bother to question why my intention was to drive there, so I just kept going. I always believed that I was a kid, pure by hearth, and no evil could come to me. While I was driving out, I thought about the probabilities of actually encountering a vampire. I live, as mentioned, in East Serbia, where vampires are very widely believed in. My grandpa always told me not to go out past dusk, but I didn't really care, so I still kept going. Remembering back, I thought that his intention was to keep me scared, so I didn't get lost in the woods. But being a teenager at the time, I thought that I was invincible. In fact, even a vampire wouldn't cross my path, that I would ease past with him to no harm. There aren't really any streets there, it's just a dirt road between trees that leads to pretty much nothing. After an hour, even the dirt road starts to vanish. While I was driving and thinking about how strong I was, I noticed that my hand felt very wet. I thought it was because I was sweating, since this region can get very hot. After taking a look at my hand, I saw that there was blood all over it. I thought maybe it was a bug, that I had squished it, but it was just too much blood. So I started to look at my hand for wounds, but my hand seemed to be perfectly fine. My heart slowly started racing, and I took a sharp turn and drove back home. I remember this to be the moment that I was the most scared in my entire life. I had the urge to look behind me every second that I was driving through the forest. It seemed like somebody was sitting behind me, just waiting for me to fall down or make a mistake. After arriving home and telling my grandpa, he just started laughing and told me never to question their abilities again. I have a ton of stories regarding these kinds of events. Also, we have a few witches in our family that used to practice black magic. It was taught to them by their ancestors.
I haven't really had a ton of encounters that I can't explain, but one kind of sticks with me from about a year ago. Last December, I was visiting my family who lives in Poland for the holidays, just some traditional stuff. A couple of days before Christmas, I decided to take a walk in the forest that I used to play in when I was little. There wasn't much going on for the rest of that particular day. It was in the late afternoon, and it was pretty foggy, with overcast skies. The temperature was around 5 degrees Celsius. When I entered the forest, it was normal. I could hear birds chirping and other small animals moving around. About 15 minutes later, it suddenly got really cold. The forest went quiet, and I could see my own breath. I was confused, so I checked the weather app on my phone to see if the temperatures matched up. But my phone said it was still 5 degrees, which didn't make any sense, because I could see my breath and my teeth were chattering. Then, when I turned my phone off, I saw my reflection in the screen, but standing behind me was a white figure. I didn't get a great look before I jumped and quickly turned around to find nothing behind me. It scared the shit out of me, so I started running back the way I came. As I ran, I looked back to see the figure calmly walking toward me. Only then did I get a good look at her. It looked like a girl, probably in her late teens or early twenties. She had mid-length curly dark hair and wore a dress that looked like it was from the early 1900s era. It didn't look like she had any eyes, just dark holes where the eyes should have been. This scared me even more, so I picked up my pace and ran full speed out of the woods and back to my uncle's house. As I exited the forest, I felt the temperature gradually return to normal. When I entered the house, I was out of breath. None of my family members were home except for my aunt, who was in the other room watching television. I never told them, or anyone, about what happened. I've tried finding a logical explanation for it all, but I just can't. I was always skeptical about ghosts, but I am a superstitious person, especially when it comes to demons or folklore. If anyone knows more about the paranormal than I do, and you know what the hell that thing was, please let me know. My husband and I really enjoy outdoor sports, especially camping. We sometimes go camping in forbidden zones, too, but we really do take care of the place we're staying, always cleaning up our mess and trying to leave it the way we found it. This happened during one of the times we were camping in a forbidden zone. We now call it the Fairy Forest. The forest is owned by a family that did a hell of a good job at decorating the place. Figures of fairies, elves, and angels were scattered around the brown fall leaves on branches and rocks. Dream catchers and other handmade artifacts, presumably made by children, were also hanging around the place. There were also little tables and chairs designed for the fairies, and info tables explaining about the fairies and elves. It was truly a fairy tale. There was one problem, though. Some douchebags threw things and broke some of the decorations, so we put them back up and mended what we could, and then we walked along. We set up our tent, cooked some food, enjoyed our drinks, and just chilled before going to bed. I woke up to three or four lights hovering over me at night. I wasn't scared, I was just surprised. I didn't want to open my eyes in case the lights disappeared. I wanted to prolong the experience as much as I could, but I soon drifted back to sleep. The morning sun penetrating our tent woke us up. As we were pouring our morning coffee, I casually told my husband that I saw lights hovering over us at night. He paused for a second and then said, I saw them too. We got into a heated discussion as to what they could have been. No, our overhead lamp could not have malfunctioned, 
because the lights were moving, almost swimming in the air, if you will. No, they could not have been people shining flashlights at us, because we didn't hear any footsteps, and the source of the lights were coming directly from our tent right above us. They were like balls of light, or orbs, not like rays. No, they couldn't have been airplane lights, or any other street lights, because again, the lights that we saw were moving. We believe that they were fairies, possibly thanking us for cleaning up the mess. We still go there from time to time, just to drink coffee, but we haven't camped there since. I always sense this amazing feeling each time I go there. That forest melts away my problems and gives me a content feeling, almost like it's telling me that everything's going to be okay. And it's absolutely beautiful. My stepdad and I are pretty cool. He's been in the family for about two years now, and he's told me a few stories that I'll always remember. This is one of them. He's a hunter, and he's always hunted with his family and friends from church. One weekend, he and some guys from church were hunting rabbits using dogs. While they were in the woods, they passed an abandoned barn, probably because there was a farm not far away. They kept going through some thick brush until it opened up to a less thick forest. In the trees, there were what seemed to be squirrel nests, but these were different. They were big enough for a person to lie down in. When they got here, the hunting dogs started barking and ran to the trees that held the nests, as if there was some kind of animal up there. My stepdad and the other men grabbed the dogs and kept walking, because they figured it was just raccoons, and they were only after rabbits. They kept combing the woods, and the dogs jumped one rabbit, which one of the men shot. After he shot it, however, one of the shells failed to eject, so he went back to the truck to fix the gun. As the rest were hunting, they heard a shot coming from the direction of the truck. They walked back, thinking that he had shot another rabbit. When they started on their way back to the truck, they met the man walking through the woods to meet them. He told them that he had fixed his gun and sat down to eat some crackers that he had bought at a gas station before the hunt. As he was eating, the shotgun went off, even though it was just a couple of feet away, laying on the bed of the truck. He also added that he clearly remembered the gun being on safety. After that incident, they quit the hunt. Before they left, one man brought up that he felt weird the whole time they were hunting, as if somebody was watching them. The others said that they felt the same way, especially after they encountered the nests in the trees. My stepdad told me about where it was they were hunting, and I've been by there before. What I can see from the road is thick, thick forest that's almost in the middle of nowhere, with that one farm and a cotton field. It makes me scared to go hunting by myself. This was back in June of 2016. My mom and dad had taken a trip out west. They had entered Muir Woods and were not very far in, no more than half a mile. Of course, they're both admiring the huge trees, taking it all in, snapping photos and basking in the general magnificence of the towering woods. So my mom says that both she and my dad are standing in front of this one huge tree. There are tourists bopping around close by, feet away. As she's looking, she notices this movement coming from the bark. I ask her how high up, and she says it was at approximately eye level, so four and a half to five feet. My mom is short, five foot nothing. She said all of this happened in the span of about five seconds. Movement in the bark directly in front of her, and then she sees it take the shape of a face, 
first the brows, then a nose, eyes, lips, and chin. She says the face is protruding out of the trunk. I ask how big this face is, and she says almost a foot tall from chin to forehead. As the face is continuing to bulge, she lets out a small, involuntary gasp. And just like that, as if the face realized it was being noticed, it shrunk back into the bark, and the tree returned to normal. Not looking away from the tree, my mom says, Kelly, did you see? And my father completes her sentence with, the face in the tree, yes. Not a question, it was a statement. Another woman who was a couple of feet away stepped up to where my parents were standing and said, I saw it too, and then moved away. Now, either the majority of the group was already moving out, or my father just began walking away on his own accord, but they both leave the tree. Mom said she started asking my dad about what he saw to see if it matched what she did. He said he wasn't comfortable discussing it right then and told her to hush, that if people heard them they would think they were crazy. So they leave it alone. But later during the trip, he still doesn't want to discuss it. Now, even though my dad has had his fair share of wild experiences, and he will usually humor bizarre conversation, he's handled this whole situation like a total Hank Hill. Maybe since he can't fully understand it, he rebukes it. I don't know. He's always been particularly sensitive on the topic of the paranormal. He almost rejects it, but I know he believes in it enough that he's afraid of giving it power by acknowledging it. Like he knows giving it a thought is the same thing as giving it energy and room to grow. I feel like I know this because I bought my mom dousing rods once. She didn't think I could find them. This was ten years ago when she didn't understand the vastness of Amazon shopping capabilities. I took it as both a challenge and a Christmas gag gift. My dad went into town and the rest of the family started playing with the rods, asking it questions. My dad walked in the door, saw the rods, and said, I don't want those in this house. He was pissed. He equated them to a Ouija board, which was absolutely off limits, in our house. To this day, my mom has so many questions. What did she see in that tree? What would it have done if it hadn't been seen? Was it an entity from another plane? Has this phenomenon ever been mentioned in near woods? I don't know, but it certainly was an interesting experience to hear about. I went to Moonville when I was in college in Nelsonville. We decided at around 10 p.m., let's go search for this supposedly haunted tunnel. We arrived at about 10.45 p.m. Unaware of the parking lot and the bridge that led right to it, we parked a few miles down the road from it, on an old railroad track that's now a path. Our friend promised that he knew the way from there. We followed the walking path, that just stops at a very steep embankment, almost 90 degrees. We all climb down and then come to Raccoon Creek and cross a shallow part. We wander around for a bit, roughly until midnight, trying to find this tunnel and anything particularly paranormal or out of the ordinary. All of a sudden, we're in this canyon type thing and everything in the middle of it is dead. Trees, birds, insects, nothing was living, and there were animal corpses that covered the canyon floor. One end of the cliff was about 35 feet down, so I'm not sure what was there. When we found our way out of the canyon, it was like we had just exited a completely different world. Everything was living again, and you could hear birds. Thinking to ourselves that we thought we had only spent about 30 minutes in there, we checked our phones. Our phones were doubling as our flashlights, and all of them were almost dead. It was three o'clock in the morning. 
Knowing that this was the witching hour, we all started to freak out a bit, and knowing that there were cults and sacrificial rituals that were performed in those woods often, we wanted to get out of there. We didn't know where we were, and we were trying to use our maps on our phones, but we didn't have any service, so that wasn't a lot of help. And then, our phones started to die, one by one, until we got to the last bit of battery on the last phone. That was when we found the one-lane gravel road, and instantly were able to run out and find our vehicles and get the hell out of there. Since then, I've only been back once, and it was in the daytime, after finding out about the bridge to it. Definitely one of the creepier experiences I've ever had, and I haven't ventured back to that spot from the first night, and I don't plan to again. Another interesting note is that it's said that a goat man lives on top of the tunnel, although I've never had any encounter to prove this, but I thought maybe it was worth a mention. I'm a bow hunter, and I still like to hunt, but something that happened to me last October makes me never want to hunt again. I was coming down a hill into a marshy area. It was kind of late, and the side of the mountain was covered in shadows. I live in Pennsylvania, where our mountains are completely covered in trees, and it gets dark fast. When I went to the bottom of the hill, I noticed that it was completely silent, no sounds at all, and I felt the hairs stand up on my arms. But I've been creeped out before in the woods so it wasn't too much of a big deal. I kept on. I've been hunting in this general area before, but I'd never gone down this particular hill. I continued creeping through the woods. Mind you, I'm walking very slowly, so you can barely hear my footsteps. Deer are hard to sneak up on. Then I hear a voice call out from behind me from a small thicket of trees. Help! And then my name. Come over here, I'm in trouble. Help. I swear it sounded just like my brother's voice, and I almost ran to it. But then I realized my brother lives in Nevada. There's no way it could be him. The second thing that creeped me out in that moment was that this thing said my name. It only took me a second to realize that something wasn't right. And when I did, I ran faster than I ever have in my life. Only my dad knew where I was hunting that day, and the area is so huge that nobody would have found me out there, and he's too old to have played any tricks on me like that. But something out there knew my name, and it sounded just like my brother. I don't know what the hell that was, but I don't think I'll ever be going back into the woods again. Maybe I'll move to the desert with my brother, where at least I can see everything around me. I didn't realize this before yesterday, but I might have experienced something paranormal on a camping trip. I realized it because I was reading a story online about a hunter that heard the voice of his brother in the woods. As I scrolled through the comments, I became familiar with some cultural stories about creatures that can lure us basically to our death. Well, last year, we went camping with some friends. It was early September, but still hot enough to sleep outside. We made ourselves a lovely camping spot, with a big bonfire and some candles around it. I have some psychic abilities and can feel if a spirit is near or something. Usually I can sense if it's a female, or masculine, or if it's a child presence. Sometimes I thought I could feel something, but I didn't want to think too much about it. I didn't want to get scared and fall into paranoia. The evening went fine and we stayed up until about 1 to 2 in the morning before going to bed. I woke an hour or two later in full mode panic attack. I have a history with anxiety, but I've never felt that kind of nausea before. 
It was like everything that I experienced before when I had my moments of high anxiety, but multiplied. I was sleeping with my boyfriend in the tent, and he asked if I was okay. I told him that I was feeling very bad and probably having a little panic attack, which had never happened to me before in that setting. I assumed it was just because we were laying on the ground and it wasn't very comfortable, and maybe I had gotten uneasy during my sleep. So I sat up and started doing some breathing exercises to calm me down. It didn't really work, and I ended up having to leave the tent to throw up. After that, it kind of got better, and I was eventually able to fall back asleep a while later. The next morning, we all woke up and started packing up our stuff. I told the others about my story, and my boyfriend and one of his friends started talking about how they heard footsteps around our camp during the night. I didn't think much of it, since I didn't hear it, but according to my boyfriend, it happened just before I woke up, and that's why he asked me if I was okay, because he was already awake, listening to the footsteps when I woke up panicking. Fast forward to today, I never really thought about this incident much. I thought it was just an episode of panic that was brought on by the fact that I pushed my body a little too hard that day when we went on a long hike. But now that I've read all these stories about all of these creatures, and I remembered that I sensed something early on, and given that my boyfriend and his friends heard footsteps, I wonder if I woke up that night feeling the intense danger that was around us. One year, when I was about 15, I went to a scout camp at Bear Lake in Idaho. I haven't forgotten about it since. To this day, I believe I saw a dragon. The whole week we were there, it had been mostly sunny and warm. But one day, it got really cloudy and stormy. It started out as a drizzle during the day, but quickly turned into a torrential downpour at night. The camping site that our troop was assigned to was right on the bank of the lake, toward the south end. Anyway, I woke up in the middle of the night. It was pitch black, and the wind was howling like a chorus of upset toddlers. The reason I woke up? I had to pee like crazy. So we have this buddy rule that if you go anywhere, you have to bring your assigned buddy with you, especially at night. It didn't get the name Bear Lake for nothing after all. So I wake up my buddy and tell him I need to pee. He groggily says, Are you freaking serious? When he saw me wriggling like a madman, he got out of his sleeping bag and grabbed his flashlight and jacket. We get our boots on and unzip the tent. Instantly, we're drenched. We start walking toward the outhouse, when about midway there, we hear this loud-ass roar. Thinking it was a bear, we started to panic. We turned around, but couldn't see anything with our flashlights. Suddenly, a flash of lightning illuminates the sky, and we see this creature with a massive wingspan, a long neck, and a spiked tail. As it flew over us, we could see the silhouette of it, its wings in a downbeat. As it passes, the air from the downbeat literally pushed us into the mud. Terrified, we run back to the tent and hide. Needless to say, I completely forgot about having to pee until the next morning. To this day, my friend and I still talk about what we saw, and we both agree that it was a dragon. This happened a long time ago. I was 12 and in my grandparents' village. We had a cow and an ox. Usually the son of the bull, usually just one, took all the cattle to graze and at night he would take them back. Cows know where to go when they're going home. My grandpa had a male ox and since my father was an adult and he wasn't there, I took the responsibility. 
Basically, my job was to go around the village with the ox trailing after me, calling the people to open their doors. Our ox would grunt to call the herd, and all the females came out. From then on, I had to take them to a clearing up in the mountains, and then later take them to the river. It was easy. The animals already knew where they were going. They were calm, and our bull was a gentle giant. All I did was ride him, and I had a thin rope on his horns. If any of the females wandered off, all I had to do was call, or, on rare occasions, poke her with a dull stick in the right direction. My grandpa said that if I saw a wolf, a boar, or a fox, I should stay on the ox. Not many animals would dare go near an ox herd. There's a dark part of the forest where it's very quiet and even the bravest hunters won't go there. It's very slippery and dangerous. They said that even the deer and boar dare not go there. I was forbidden to go there, and honestly, I never wanted to. It was an early morning and everything seemed fine. I was on the ox going up the mountain, and I was glad that he let me because it was hard to trek up. I saw that one of the females was wandering off. I followed her and left our ox and the dogs to guide the herd. She went into the forest. I ran to her and got on tying the rope onto her horns. I tried steering her away, but she continued. She went into the dark part and stopped. I didn't want to get off in case she ran back and left me there. I heard a crunch and turned around. A very old man was walking toward us. He looked frail with dirty clothes and a long beard. I was scared, so I laid on the ox, clinging to her, not wanting to fall off if she ran. Oxen aren't like bulls. They don't jump and kick when they're scared. They either attack with their horns and trample or run. I was ready to hold on no matter what she chose to do. Our oxen don't take kindly to strangers. Before I took them out, I had to go to every house and have the ox owner introduce me to the animal. That way, they saw that their owner trusts me, and their herd leader, our ox, trusts me too. I knew that she would either attack or bolt, but she just stood there. The stranger came to us and petted her on the head, whispering something I didn't understand. He looked up at me, and his eyes were completely white. Then he turned around and left, just disappearing into the trees. Suddenly the female grunted as if she had just woken up or come out of a trance. Our male does that noise every morning, and then she bolted the way we'd come from. We found the herd. I quickly got on our ox and yelled water. He knew that command and went down toward the river. There were houses there, and it was closer than home. I barged in to one of the houses and tried to explain. The couple there stayed with me and sent their daughter to call my grandpa. I couldn't sleep for days, remembering those whited-out eyes. My grandparents didn't let me out of the house or garden, and I wasn't allowed near trees. Later, I learned that they were protecting me from a lesnick a forest spirit which can take the form of a man, an owl, or a wolf. It hates when people go into his part of the woods and can kidnap you. I later learned that the ox which took me there had fallen ill and died. It sometimes stays in the trees as an owl, looking for the offender. For years, when I went to my grandparents, they wouldn't let me be alone. Not just outside, but inside too. All I know is that I'm never going into those woods again. The following happened in a nearby woods when I was in 7th or 8th grade, which was the late 1980s. And to this day, I have no idea what it was or why it happened. I'll preface this story by saying that, although I was fairly young when it took place, I had literally grown up in the middle of a forest, 
and spent just about every free moment out among the trees. I never had any fear of nature, and by the time I was in middle school, I was already a pretty competent hunter and tracker, and could identify just about any animal by its tracks, sounds, or scat. I had had close-up encounters with groundhogs, raccoons, deer, and even coyotes and great horned owls, which is why whatever my friend and I encountered that day confuses me. I was at my friend Roger's house, also a burgeoning outdoorsman. One afternoon we decided to walk to a small woods maybe a quarter mile from his house, just to check it out. I think it must have been late fall or early spring, because the trees were barren, the ground was muddy, and it was chilly outside, around 40 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit. We weren't looking for anything, it was just something to do. So we walk over, enter the woods, and just start walking around, talking and looking at the trees and the occasional bits of trash that people had left behind. Eventually, we wander apart from each other by maybe 30 yards. There's not much overgrowth, so we can still see each other. It was about this time that I started getting that being watched feeling. A second later, out of the corner of my eye, I catch a glimpse of a white flash four or five feet off the ground. It seemed to come from or dodge behind one of the trees. It wasn't light, exactly, but more like a very white object of undefinable shape and size. I looked around for a minute, but never did see anything else, and figured that it was just my eyes playing tricks on me. So I went back to exploring, but then it happened again, and I still couldn't see anything when I looked around more directly. After a few seconds, the flash or white object seemed to appear and disappear among the trees in different directions. One time it would be off to my left, then, just a few seconds later, it would be to my right, or just behind me. I was a little freaked out, but mostly just really curious as to what was happening. This went on for maybe three to four minutes. Right about then, I noticed that Roger was standing next to me, looking pale and shaken up. I think we should go back now, he said. I have to admit I was a little disappointed, but I had never seen him look or act quite that way before. Usually the kid wasn't afraid of anything and was a little bit of a troublemaker. So we trudged out of the woods and back onto the little gravel road that ran to it and headed back toward his house. Roger didn't say a word the whole way back. When we finally got back to his house, we went to get a snack, and as we were standing in the kitchen, I briefly asked him, So, out there, did you see some kind of white thing? Because I kept... Almost immediately he cut me off. Yeah, and I don't want to ever talk about it. Again, it was a response that was very out of character for my normally tough-talking friend. A couple of years later, he, I, and another friend would be on a late-night walk, get mistaken for burglars, and have a gun pulled on us. Even after being threatened with a firearm, he was never this quiet or freaked out. I dropped it, and I hadn't asked him about it since. I still see Roger occasionally, but we've never talked about that day again, and in decades of rambling around every sort of woods that I can find, I've never encountered anything like that again. Nothing has ever felt or looked like that. No bird, bear, mountain lion, or anything else. Not even people. I have no idea what we saw that day, but I hope somebody does, because it haunts me still today. I was probably around 10 years old when this happened. 
My dad and I were driving down the road one afternoon in Columbus, Ohio. I remember looking out the window and seeing a large plane flying really low. If memory serves me right, it appeared really old and was maybe a military plane. We do have an Air Force base that's not far, so that would make sense. I remember being fascinated by the plane and excitedly pointing it out to my dad. He continued to drive while occasionally peeking over to look at it. After a few moments, the plane started to aggressively swerve like the pilot was losing control. Not long after, it nosedived and flew into a patch of nearby trees. I remember my dad panicking and pulling his truck over to the side of the road. We just sat there and looked out the window, but there was nothing. There was no sound of any kind, no smoke or fire, nothing. The trees didn't rustle and everything was calm. We waited, thinking the plane was going to swerve back up and fly away but it never emerged. I remember asking him what happened, and he was just silent. After a bit, he started driving again, and we drove over to the area. We drove around for probably an hour, trying to find some explanation, but there was nothing. Eventually, we headed back to my grandmother's place. We had dinner and explained to her what had happened, but she probably just thought we were crazy. I remember us being eager to turn on the evening news to see if there was any mention of it, but nothing. Also nothing in the paper the next day. There was no real internet yet, so this was all we had. To this day, my dad and I still discuss this. The one thing we can't remember is if the plane was making any sound at all while it was flying in the air. Our radio might have been on or the windows up. We can't remember but we know for certain that there was no sound from the supposed crash. It was only about a half mile away from us, so we would have heard something. It's like the plane literally vanished. This is the only experience I've ever had like this. I know it's a long shot, but has anyone ever experienced something like this? Do you have any idea what we saw? There's great comfort in knowing that my dad saw the same thing. Otherwise, I would have thought I imagined it, but we didn't imagine it. We saw it, and we still want answers. For about the last year, I've been seeing flashes of movement, pitch black shadows in my peripheral vision. I've heard my name clearly called on three separate occasions by a deep male voice when I know I was home alone in the house. And I've started waking up covered in bruises and occasionally scratches. They're almost exclusively on my legs. The worst of it was the day I woke up with over 30 fresh bruises, some the size of softballs, many that look like random fingerprints. About three months ago, I visited a local metaphysical store and shared my experiences with them. Based on my experiences and the photo I gave them of my bruises, they did a remote cleansing, and, on their advice, I did a sage and holy wood burning in my home, buried black tourmaline at the four corners of my property, and placed one over the door to my bedroom. Everything had been fine since then, but the bruises are coming back, and on Sunday, I saw a large black figure slip along the ceiling after my husband as he walked out of the room in a particularly bad mood. This thing was pitch black, like I said, and moving faster than my husband was walking. It was not at all possible that it was his shadow. I'm not exactly sure how he feels about the subject. On the one hand, he probably thinks I'm crazy. He asked what the black stone was all over the bedroom door, so I told him a truncated version of the truth about my visit to the metaphysical store. I left out hearing voices. He didn't say anything. On the other hand, he keeps saints in his truck for safe travel, 
He was raised Catholic, so I think he's open-minded to a certain degree. We have two cats and two dogs who have all seemed to react to the unseen disturbances as well. Cats will stare at the wall or the ceiling. I write it off to passing cars throwing reflections and so on. My older dog has started barking at a corner in the middle of the day. I chalked it up to him going senile. He is an 11-year-old St. Bernard mix. But the other night, I had just laid down to go to sleep and was trying to find a nature documentary on Netflix to put me out when I heard something in the guest room next door to my room fall. It sounded like a little picture frame or a decoration from the dresser. One of my dogs, who likes to sleep on that bed, ran into the master bedroom, jumped in bed with us, and was shaking like a leaf. I assumed it was kitty mischief, or that the dog had knocked something over, thus the shaking, and I would deal with it the next day. The only thing is, I checked first thing in the morning, and there was nothing out of place, and my husband said he hadn't put anything back either. I have a feeling this thing is targeting my husband. He is very stressed out at work. He works 50 plus hours per week at a job that, quote, destroys his soul, as he puts it and another 20 plus hours per week trying to help keep our new business flourishing. He's very weak right now, emotionally and physically. He's very depressed about his day job and has chronic bronchitis, and I believe something nasty is trying to take advantage. I'd like to talk to him about it, but one, I'm afraid that admitting I know it's there will make it more powerful, and two, I'm afraid he'll think I'm nuts. But I know what I saw, and I know that I wasn't drinking or on any medications. I wasn't on drugs, and I'm not diagnosed with anything that would make me hallucinate. I know what I saw. Maybe I'm just stringing together random events here, but does this make sense to anyone? This happened in March of 2011, near my house in a small town, about an hour north of Indianapolis, Indiana. I was in eighth grade at the time, and it was during my spring break. That year, instead of sunshine and warm weather for spring break, there was a snowstorm, probably around eight inches or so of snow. My two friends, my two younger brothers and I, decided to make the best of it and just go play in the snow for the day. There was woods near my house. Not a huge woods, but big enough to hike around in for a few hours. So we decided to do just that. About an hour into the hike, we stumbled upon what looked like an old well, a stone circle about 10 feet in diameter, about four feet high off the ground, and partially filled with foul-smelling, half-frozen water. We threw a few rocks into it and stuck long tree branches in to try to find out how deep it was. We tried with a branch that was at least 20 feet long, but we were never able to hit the bottom, so it was pretty deep. Now, the well by itself wasn't really creepy or anything, but how old it looked and the way it was just stuck out in the middle of the woods was a little unnerving. The part that really terrified us came about 20 minutes after discovering the well. We had decided that we were done messing around with it and had just started to continue on into the woods when we all heard something that made us freeze dead in our tracks with fear. Echoing through the woods came a loud, shrieking laugh. It was a high-pitched, grating voice that was still very loud despite seeming like it had come from somewhat far away. We all just froze for a moment, trying to make sense of what we'd just heard. The laugh came again, this time distinctly closer to us, but still not in our immediate vicinity. At that moment, none of us were saying a word. We bolted back the way we came, away from the sound, in the direction of my house. 
We didn't stop running for what seemed like forever, and we eventually made it back to my house without any more incidents. None of us had a clue as to what we had just heard, and none of us were ever brave enough to go back there and try to figure it out. I would love to hear any thoughts about what it could have been, paranormal or otherwise. I don't know if the part about the well was relevant or not, but it could have been, so I thought I would include it in my story. This is a very real story, and it's something that I personally experienced, and to this day I've never been able to explain it. So if you can, let me know. The other night, around 9.30 at night, I was playing Smash Ultimate in my living room, minding my own business while I was watching horror videos. It was nothing special, a fairly normal occurrence. Then suddenly, as the narrator finished a story about a skinwalker, I felt it. The most extreme feeling of being watched I have ever felt. I could pinpoint exactly where it was coming from, the window. To my right. My window has blinds, but they suck, and they're easy enough to see through if you get close to the window. Personally, I believe in the paranormal, and I do believe my house is haunted. But the ghosts in my house have only ever been pranksters, who are rather kind-hearted. As a note, I also live in Arizona, not too far from a Native American reservation. Anyway, this feeling was intensely strong and struck an immediate response in my brain, which is typically pragmatic and relatively fearless. I paused the game, turned off the switch, and went straight into my room, closing the doors behind me, turning off the videos, and instead turning on Critical Role. Yet the feeling stayed, as if whatever was watching me could see through my doors. I had enough, so I grabbed my machete, it was a gift from my grandpa that I used while camping, and unsheathed it, then walked straight to the window, peering through it. There was nothing. Nothing but my neighbor's house. But the feeling hadn't subsided. I decided to take a more supernatural approach. I found the sage in the kitchen, grabbed a lighter, and began to burn it, spreading the smoke around my house, until it felt like the feeling had passed. Then I grabbed some clothes and took the bowl into the bathroom with me, and showered. The feeling was completely gone, as if the sage had repelled whatever was watching me. It was certainly freaky. I'm not sure if it was a skinwalker or not, or if my body just picked up on someone watching me who left when they saw my weapon. But whatever it was, it was strange. Everything I'm about to tell you happened this summer, when I was working and living in the Chicago area. I don't know much about spirits or paranormal events, so I'll just give you the facts of what happened, and you can draw your own conclusions. In the first few weeks of my new job, I met this really great guy. We'll call him Paul. We hit it off immediately, and one day he suggested that we go hiking in the woods. I'm from Russia originally, so I was practically raised in the woods. I spent half of my childhood in them, and I was really excited about the idea. As we're hiking, it starts pouring rain. I've never seen anything like it. We go deeper and deeper into the forest, until there are no more paths, and we're practically treading swamp water. All of this time, we're just talking about random things and getting to know each other, while not really paying a lot of attention to our surroundings. There's no one around, since we've gone pretty deep in already, and it was pouring buckets, like I said. Eventually, we stumble on the skeleton of a teepee, just the bare wooden structure of it, and I thought that was pretty cool. We kept going in that direction. Suddenly, we both hear someone crying. It sounded like a baby. 
It's a forest, so lots of animals can imitate that sound, like deer, cubs, etc. And the cry sounded distant anyway, so we didn't think anything of it and kept going. Within seconds, we heard the cry right next to us, which seemed so strange since it sounded so far away at first. It was so loud that it couldn't have been more than a few feet away. We start looking all around, even looking at the trees, but absolutely nothing was there. It was a pretty weird situation, so we kind of speed walked in the other direction. As soon as we stopped for a break, the sound started right up again, right next to us, like something was telling us to book it. So we did. We ran faster than what was probably safe in that kind of weather, half looking at Google Maps and half relying on memory. We made it back to the entrance of the woods. Both of us agreed that what happened was pretty weird, and we decided to look into the history of the place. Immediately, websites like Most Haunted Forests in Illinois started popping up. It turns out the place was a site of ancient Native American burial grounds. I'm not surprised, since a lot of tribes used to live in various parts of Illinois. And apparently it's where three young boys were brutally murdered and left in a ditch. Pretty dark stuff. Paul and I went back and I kind of forgot about the incident. Until one evening after work, he tells me that he can't stop thinking about the cry and that he wanted to go back to see what was there. Naturally, I think this is a stupid idea, especially because it was already dark out. But then Paul's friend Ryan joins him, for kicks, you know. And since I'm worried for both of their safety, I decided to go along, thinking that I could keep them out of trouble. Twenty-something fresh-out-of-college dudes can be very dumb, after all. So we hop in the car and we drive out there. The traffic is insane and my friend takes a wrong turn, so we get there at about 11 p.m. We get out and head into the forest. Now, there are no streetlights anywhere near us, except right at the edge of the road. And flashlights can only do our visibility so much good, so it's pretty bad. We eventually get to a small wooden bridge that leads us across the river into the actual deep part of the forest. As soon as we cross, I start feeling uneasy. We were not supposed to be in the woods that late in the first place, but there was a deeper feeling of guilt, like we were intruding on or disturbing something that was there. Ryan, who's been leading the way and feeling all confident and cocky, started saying, there's nothing here. He kept mocking and then all of a sudden, he stopped. On the other side of the bridge, the three of us were hit with this feeling of dread and panic. One I've never felt before in a forest, and I've been to lots, both in the day and at night. We all exchange nervous looks, and suddenly we hear crunching coming toward us from out of the dark. The feeling at this point gets so intense that Ryan, confidently walking around and mocking seconds ago, now looks uneasy and says, I think we should go back. We all slowly turn around and start speed walking toward the bridge. Nobody says a word until we get to the other side. Then Ryan says, I was just nervous because it, it might have been a homeless person and, y you know, I, I didn't want to deal with that. Sure. Eventually, we get to the road where our car was parked. Alongside the road, I see a girl, maybe in her early 20s. She looked to be either Native American or a mixture of Asian and Latina. She was walking along the highway, wearing very little clothing, and she looked off. Her walk wasn't a drunk one. She just seemed to be almost, I don't know the right word for it. Vibrating? Undulating? I'm not sure. But there wasn't a building around for miles, just straight road. My stepdad is Malaysian, and he's told me a bunch of ghost stories about young ghost women on the side of roads killing drivers. But I was willing to risk it, because I didn't want to leave this girl all alone, ghost or not. So I convinced Paul to slow down a bit when we got to her. I called out to her from the passenger window, asking if she needed help. The girl slowly turns around, with the creepiest, slowest smile spreading across her lips, and nodded. 
I was hit with that same feeling I got back there in the forest, and I almost regretted slowing down. But whatever, screw it. My sense of wanting to help this girl was greater than whatever weird crap I was feeling. If I died, at least I would die with a clean conscience. She gets in the back of the car, right behind my seat, and next to Ryan. He's a womanizer, and he starts to chatter up, asking where she's from and what she's doing out here all by herself. All this time, I'm turned halfway around, keeping an eye on her, because I feel like as soon as I turn around and face the road, something bad is going to happen. She's making consistent eye contact with me the entire time, even when Ryan is talking to her, with that slow, creepy smile, slightly vibrating. I don't know, it just seemed snake-like. Ryan asks her where she's coming from, and without taking her eyes off me, she says, Oh, just around. He asks if she's coming from a bar, and she nods her head yes, except that there's not a single bar anywhere even close, not for miles and miles. She said she was walking home, and she gives Paul an address which is 15 minutes away by car, along nothing but forest. My eyes hurt from making eye contact with her, and she just kept smiling and undulating. This feeling of dread just kept increasing. So eventually we just dropped her off at her street. Lots of old-looking small houses. When I turned back to look just a second later, she was gone. I couldn't sleep that night. I kept imagining that creepy smile. I imagined her creeping upstairs in the dark, her smiling face undulating from the shadows. Here's a little bit of background to start. I'm from Texas, and my boyfriend is from Maine. We both live in Texas now, in a decently sized city outside of Dallas. But during the summer, we attempt to escape the heat and visit his family in Maine for a few weeks. I had my fair share of experiences growing up in a haunted house, so I was raised as a believer. Weird things seem to happen frequently but I don't like to automatically attribute it to a ghost or whatever. I'd like to think that I'm a fairly logical person, and I like to try to debunk weird things. That being said, my boyfriend is pretty skeptical and doesn't spook easily, so that makes this story even more interesting. At around 11 p.m. one night, he and I were sitting on his dad's front porch, just chit-chatting. The porch is raised and looks down over a backyard that runs to the tree line at the edge of a thick woods. We were just hanging out, sober, I might add, when we heard what sounded like an adolescent boy singing scales. La 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 la. Over and over. It was just background noise, and honestly, we were so used to living in an apartment in the city back home that we didn't think anything of it. In fact, we were annoyed. My boyfriend actually said, do you think he knows we're here? That could be awkward. I laughed. And then I realized what we were listening to. We were hearing what sounded like a boy, in the woods, late at night, walking back and forth in the dark woods, singing scales repeatedly. My boyfriend was still bent on the idea that he should give the guy some warning that he had an audience. So, kind of mockingly, he sings back, la 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 la. The boy sang the same thing back from the trees. It sounded like whoever it was was instantly standing right at the tree line beside us. It was loud and sounded as if whoever, or whatever it was, had instantly covered a huge amount of space to go from somewhere in the woods to just a few feet away from us. We both instantly had the fight or flight response, and, without even thinking or discussing it, we both jumped up as if we were going to run into the house. 
Something about it felt weird, and we had flipped a switch from harmless, awkward fun to terrified. There's a house back there, right? I asked my boyfriend. There has to be, he said back. We were spooked and went into the house anyway. We both couldn't stop thinking about it, and suddenly the details began to sink in about just how weird this actually was. First, if that was an actual person, we would have heard them stomping around in the woods. It sounded as if they were pacing back and forth over an area of about 20 feet, and the woods were thick. You couldn't walk through them without making a ruckus and cracking leaves and twigs. Second, there were no lights through the trees. If that was actually a 12 or 13 year old boy, unless he has a night vision, he would have needed a flashlight to accompany him, especially if he was taking such careful steps as to not make a sound. If there was a flashlight, we would have seen it through the dark. Third, how did he instantly cover that much space to get right beside us at the tree line? I know that voices can be carried on the wind and sound distorted, but there was no wind that night. It also sounded enough like a real person, not a floating voice on the wind, that we both just automatically assumed that there was actually a boy out there. Lastly, we asked his dad where in the woods his neighbor's house was. He just looked at us and said, what neighbors? I don't have neighbors. There's not a house back there for miles. People in Maine don't tend to have close neighbors. But the next day, we went back and checked anywhere. As far as we could go, there was no sign of people anywhere. It was 2009 in my summer holidays when I was eight years old. As usual, for many years, my family and I went to Córdoba, Argentina and rented a cabin. Strange things often happened in that cabin, like moving objects, strange noises, or even things that just outright disappeared. One night, I was sleeping when suddenly I got up in the middle of the night. When I looked in front of me, an old, careless and creepy woman was looking at me. She didn't say a word, so I just closed my eyes, and when I opened them, she was gone. I ran into my father's bedroom and told my parents, but of course they didn't believe me. About two years ago, we went to those cabins again. One day I started talking with the owner, and he was telling me about some strange noises that he had heard that night. Surprised, I told him about the creepy vision I had. He just casually looks at me and says, You're not the first one that that happens to. Many people have reported visions of an old woman or a girl who stares at them in the night. My dad told me this story recently and I felt the need to share it. When my dad was little, he used to spend a lot of time at his grandmother's. She lived up in the mountains, and she was one of those people who just took care of everyone. He said he lost count of all the times that drunks or people on drugs would come in at all hours of the night, and she would always feed them, let them rest, and then send them on their way. She was a kind person, but also one who what you see is what you get, and she wasn't afraid to tell you what was on her mind. He said he grew up not being scared of much because of her, and he thought the world of her. But there was one event that happened to him in the woods that scares him to this day. It's one of the reasons he barely hunts or scouts alone anymore, unless he can't help it. He was about 17 or 18, and he had stayed with his grandmother so he could go deer scouting the next morning. The next day, he gets up early and heads out. My dad has a good sense of direction, but for some reason that day he got turned around and lost in the dense forests of the mountains. 
He walked and walked, and night fell with him, still clueless on where he was. Tired, frustrated, and a little uneasy, he stopped to take a break and sat down. He said that it was pitch dark, his little flashlight not giving much light. He was thirsty and starving, and he just wanted to get back to his grandmother's. As he sat there, thinking where to go, he heard heavy footsteps and twigs snapping behind him. This scared him at first, thinking that he may have come across a bear. He stood up, knowing if it was, he needed to get the hell out, but not be hasty about it as to spook it if it was a bear. He just starts calmly walking away, hoping he was going in the right direction this time. But the footsteps followed him. They were extremely heavy, thudding behind him in a distance. But as he walked, he noticed that they were speeding up and gaining on him. My dad starts walking faster, and, as I'm sure you can guess, the footsteps become faster. In a short time, he hears them now, maybe a couple of yards behind him. Scared shitless, he turns around and shines his flashlight to see nothing except for huge hoof prints. In their wake, the grass was dead, and everything around it that had been living was too. He started freaking out, and straight out sprinted, not caring which way he was going. He just wanted to get as far away from that thing as possible. The footsteps behind him were now following suit, sprinting after him. He only glanced back one more time, seeing nothing but giant hoof prints and dead grass and leaves wherever they had landed. By now, he's not sure how long or far he's been running when he sees lights in the distance. He runs toward them, hoping that someone can help him if he comes upon a house or store. He breaks out of the woods, and joy floods over him when he sees that it's his grandmother's home. She's sitting on her porch, the lights on outside. His grandmother was a religious woman, so she was reading the Bible at this time. As embarrassing as it was for him to admit, he said that he started screaming for her, tears falling down his cheeks. She stood up and looked behind him to see the hoof prints and hear the sounds for herself. She held her hands out to him, and he grasped onto them tightly as she pulled him into her. And then she said loudly, You can't have him. He said the silence that lingered after that was intense. He had buried his head into her shoulder, so when he looks up, all he can see is where the hoof prints and dead grass and leaves lay. She just held on to him as he cried, whispering to him that it was okay and that it was gone. He has no idea what was after him that night, and he doesn't want to know, but he's pretty sure that my grandmother saved his life that night. Back in October of 1989, my mother and I went up to the western part of North Carolina for a week to see the leaves change color. We rented a cabin which was owned by the cousin of my brother's former high school band teacher who had retired several years earlier. The band director was more or less keeping watch over the place. He lived down the street, but it wasn't until Friday afternoon that we saw him. The cabin was somewhat in the wilderness, but it was near a main road. The band director had to go away for the weekend and was letting us know. We had the number of his cousin in case we needed any help. This was on a Friday afternoon. Up until that time, the trip had been uneventful. Friday evening, we went to a church dinner, which was down the road. When we came back home, it was already dark. My mom started thinking about how we were the only ones on this road and we didn't know where the nearest neighbor was, which was a little unsettling. The moon wasn't full, but there was a light to the moon. We had separate rooms in the cabin. The power went out in the cabin shortly after we came home from the church dinner. Then my mother heard what sounded like footsteps and she saw what looked like the outline of a hat. 
there was a man walking around near the cabin. Then we saw this hat disappear into the woods. By this time, both of us are terrified that this man is going to come into the cabin and harm us. Both of us wondered aloud if he had cut the power source. I decided to sleep in the bed which was in my mother's room. We tried to sleep, but then we were awakened by an owl howling. My mother could see the owl's eyes which were looking into the window. The drape couldn't be closed the entire way. That owl didn't take its eyes off my mom the entire night, and it hooted all night long. My mother tried to ignore the owl, but its presence really unnerved her, and its eyes really unnerved me. Neither one of us could sleep as every noise jarred us. It would be like, what's that? What noise is that? Every once in a while, we would see the outline of the hat walking around the general area, and then it would go off into the woods. Both of us were freaked out at this point, but we weren't about to leave in the middle of the night. There was no phone in the cabin, and this was long before cell phones were in common use. The power finally did come back on several hours later, or so it seemed. We were in the wee hours of the morning. Originally, we were going to leave on Sunday, but as soon as the sun came up on Saturday, we left. We laugh about it now, but neither of us know what kept us up all night. It was a memorable night. I've been dying to get this story off my chest for years to people who don't think I'm crazy, as it's rather maddening. Before I begin, I don't believe in things like Bigfoot, werewolves, ghosts, supernatural or paranormal stuff in general, but that doesn't mean that I'm able to explain what happened this night. This was a long time ago. I was a teenager. My parents were not very strict, so I had a lot of freedom. I had two friends, and they had their own friends as well. And one of my friend's parents owns this huge part of a forest. My friends, their friends, and I went deep into the woods with a bunch of supplies, and we started making our own treehouse and forts. It was a big part of my childhood, building stuff with my friends, and this place became our sanctuary for a long time, where we'd spend a lot of our time away from the adults. This event happened years after we built the place initially, and also after we rebuilt it because one time it got destroyed. But that's another interesting story for a different time. This is the backstory for all of the events that I'm about to recall. One friend and I spent the night at our sanctuary that we had built, which none of us have ever done before. We only hung out there and then went home. We all planned to spend the night together because it would be fun. Most of our friends weren't allowed to spend the night there, though, because of parents and other things, and one chickened out because he was afraid. So it ended up just being me and one other person, my close friend's cousin. We weren't really close at the time, and we fought a lot, but surprisingly we got along well that night. We spent most of the day swinging from trees, climbing them and hanging out on this tire rope swing while talking. It was a normal day. And then we laid down for rest at about 9 p.m. About 10 minutes after laying down in bed in our sleeping bags, talking to each other under our makeshift tents, we heard rustling. I sat up and saw a very tall silhouette of something that looked to be like a human but was transparent. I could see right through it. I squinted and froze, and it very quickly climbed this tall tree and as I was looking at it, it disappeared. I was in complete disbelief and shock. I had no idea what I had just seen, if I had seen it at all or if I had hallucinated. I wasn't scared in the moment, just perplexed. Being young and worried though, I said to my friend that we should leave and not wanting it to hear me, I got close to his ear and just said, there's something in the woods looking at us. After I said that, I saw his facial expression turn to fear, so we got up and started walking down the path out of the woods, calmly. 
I didn't want to sprint because it might chase, and I also wasn't even sure I'd seen anything. I just didn't want to take any chances. Very shortly after we left, we both got this weird feeling of deja vu and confusion, like we'd been hit with hard drugs or something, except we don't do drugs, and we had only eaten food that we brought from our house. There are also no hallucinogenic plants in our part of the country. Nothing like that. Everything was so slow, and I felt disoriented. But we continued to walk in this direction for quite a while, stumbling in the darkness because of our mental state. I realized that we should have been out of the forest by now. I knew that this was the way out, 110%, because I'd been going in and out of this place for years, even in the dark. Yet, I didn't recognize all the trees around us, just the path. It was like our surroundings were changing. My friend randomly yells, Yeah, I'm coming, as I'm looking in the opposite direction from him. I turned around, very confused, and asked him why he said that. He said that his mom was calling his name to help lead him out of the forest. I heard nothing. I told him that I didn't hear anything, and he looked at me like I was insane and walked off the path and into the forest. I grabbed his arm and pulled him back, because I didn't want him to get lost. That's when my friend sees the transparent thing that I saw earlier, sitting perched on a tree branch in the direction that his mom was calling him from. He points it out to me. Its transparency is almost like a heat wave effect. We stared at it for 10 seconds in total disbelief. It looked like a transparent being, but we were trying to discern if it was something else and we were just imagining it being alive because there was no movement. But then, it hunched down like it was trying to stalk or be stealthy, and very quickly, it climbed up a tree a little more, and then went to the next one, and then the next one, getting closer to us. We can't hear it at all. It's completely silent. And its silence was exacerbated by the fact that all the other creatures had also gone completely silent, and it was only in that moment that I had really started to realize that. Not a single bug or animal had made a sound since we started leaving camp. This is when our curiosity turned into fear, and once again, we began to see it move. Once it got above us, though, the only thing we could hear was the crunching of the branch as its weight was put down on it. Every little sound that was made was so distinct, because it was so quiet and remote. We couldn't see anything because the tops of the trees are so dark. We actually started running, terrified, not worrying about being calm anymore. We heard noises in the trees above us, and finally it faded away ahead of us, as if it had gone ahead, but the sound was a lot quieter than if a normal animal had been running through the treetops. It sounded as if this thing was very light, but it wasn't very small, so that made no sense. We still kept running forward, despite it sounding like it had gone ahead, and we ended up back at the place that we started. Many, many minutes of walking, and we were back at this place after running for like 20 seconds. It was impossible. But instead of staying on the ground, we climbed to the top of the treehouse with our items as quickly as possible and closed the door, wedging a small piece of plywood on it to keep it shut. We heard something climbing up and extremely odd noises as well, almost like the mimicking noises of rain and wind, but there was no water seeping into our treehouse, and there would have been had it been raining, and it wasn't wet. This persisted for about a minute, and then we didn't hear from it again. I'm pretty sure at that point it had left, but we spent the rest of the night there until the sun came up anyway, just in case. When he checked his iPod touch for the first time, right after we closed the door, it was 5 a.m., we started laying on the ground at 9 p.m. Eight hours had passed in what felt to us like no more than 40 minutes of time. Hours after we could start to see the sun through the treehouse slats, we went home. I no longer talked to this friend, but after this incident we discussed it, and we told everything from both of our points of view, and it all jived. We randomly brought it up to each other every few months and relived it, making sure that we were still on the same page about what happened and that we both remembered. I never spent the night out there again, and 
I didn't really even let myself stay out there past 5 p.m. for a very long time. About three years ago, I went camping with my girlfriend, now ex, as she had always expressed interest but had never been. The spot we went to is in the Huron National Forest and is my go-to trail and camp spot, as it's hidden deep in the forest and the access to the trails is close and easy for ATVs and things like that. My family has been going to this spot for about six years and my friends introduced me about 10 years ago. We went on a weekend trip, and I'm glad we didn't go for any longer. When we got there, everything was going well, except we did notice a group of people hanging out next to our campsite. Still, they were just stargazing and ended up leaving, so it was weird, but not spooky at all. Then around midnight is when the weird stuff started to happen. At first, it sounded like someone was laughing at us, but the laugh never ended and got very high pitched and sounded as if it just kept going. After a while, we both got kind of scared and went into the tent to try to sleep. That's when the laugh noise moved up higher and then started to circle the campsite. After a while of that happening, it just suddenly stopped, and then it started again around 3 a.m. When it started again, the fire was going out, so I went to stoke the fire with my shotgun in hand and turned on my flashlight to see if maybe I could see any coyotes or something around the campsite, but I didn't see anything or hear any movements below. This went on until 6 a.m., when it finally stopped. And that was finally when we could get some rest. After waking up, we checked the campsite and saw nothing unusual, so we packed up. Once we were packed up and good to go, I started my vehicle, which was completely dead. That really freaked me out, as I'm always paranoid about leaving things plugged in that kill the battery and I made sure everything was closed properly and unplugged. Yet somehow, the battery still died. I got a jump from AAA. That phone call was hard to explain, and the lady who took the call didn't believe me, but in the end, we both laughed, and we did get some help. After that happened, I told my friend who had shown me the campsite, and also has a cabin in the same forest, about 25 miles away from the campsite, about what had happened, and he got really freaked out. He told me about two incidents that he's had, one at the campsite and one at his cabin. At the campsite, he stated that one night, after we'd all returned from trail riding and went to bed, he stayed up to hang out by the fire and have a few drinks. While hanging out, he was just looking off into the distance and he saw a pair of eyes up in the trees, looking directly at him. He described them as bioluminescent. He flashed his high-powered flashlight at them, but there was nothing there. And as soon as the flashlight turned off, they were looking right back at him. So he packed up and went to bed. He didn't tell us because he didn't want to scare us. At the cabin, he was hanging out with his brother, and they were both just chilling by the fire outside when they saw a pair of eyes looking at them from a trail that led into the woods. They stated that at the height the eyes were looking at them, whatever it was had to be over seven feet tall. They started shooting at it with their rifles and the eyes disappeared, but once they were done, they reappeared and were closer. At that point, they both freaked out and got back in the cabin and they didn't leave until daylight. We have no idea what this could have been, but we all felt very scared when these events happened. After we all talked about it, one of the brothers thought that it might have been a Wendigo. I don't know what it could have been, 
but I haven't felt that scared before or since. This happened a few years ago. I remember it was winter because it was really cold and snowy outside. I was left alone in my family's cabin while the others went Christmas shopping for food and last minute packages for some friends. I don't remember all the specifics of why they went out, but that's not really important. My point is I was all alone in our cabin playing some games on my phone while listening to some music on the radio in my room on the first floor of the cabin. I remember that suddenly I got really cold, so I went to go get a blanket that was on our sofa. Just when I was about to get up and grab the blanket, I saw some kind of shadow from my peripheral vision. I didn't really care that much about it at the time, because I thought maybe it was just my imagination playing a trick on me, because I really don't like being home alone in general and especially not in a cabin on a mountain in the middle of winter. I got the blanket and went back to my room to play some more games. About an hour passed and I had forgotten all about the strange shadow until I saw it again. But this time it stayed in my peripheral vision for about three to five seconds before it went away again. I was a little creeped out about it now since I was the only one in the cabin I decided to lock the door to my room, just in case. Right after I locked the door to my room, I heard some kind of crying upstairs on the second floor of the cabin. At first I thought it was my little sister, who was about three years old at the time. She used to cry a lot, so I asked out loud, what's wrong, did you hurt yourself? I heard her answer, yes, I fell while playing with my dolls. Can you come upstairs and help me? I unlocked my door and headed toward the stairs when it finally hit me. I was alone in the cabin, so whatever was upstairs could not be my little sister. I sprinted out of the cabin wearing only a t-shirt, shorts, and my dad's slippers. It was freezing cold outside. I stopped running about 150 meters away from the cabin and looked at it from a distance. In one of the windows on the second floor, I could see a shadow just standing still, and I got the feeling that it was staring at me, even though I couldn't make out any eyes. I stood there outside of my family's cabin in the freezing cold for about 30 minutes and cried until my family finally arrived. My mom and dad asked me what was wrong, but I didn't want them to think I was crazy, so I just made up a story. I honestly don't remember what I told them, but they seemed concerned about me. One thing I do remember though, is that I talked my mom and dad into driving me to my grandparents' cabin because I refused to go back into that one. Ever since that day, I have refused to join my family when they go to our family cabin. It's really hard to explain, but the feeling I got that day at the cabin can only be described as unwanted like someone or something wanted to harm me, was trying to lure me. I have nightmares about the shadow figure thing even today. It haunts my dreams and I'm in no rush to see it again. When I was 15 or so, a group of my friends and I all slept over at the leader of our friend group's house. This guy lived in the most absolutely rural area of our rural town, basically in the middle of the woods, a house just surrounded by thick walls of trees. In the evening, we decided to go out and start a bonfire deep in the woods. So we packed up, got all of our materials and went straight out there. On the way to the spot that we'd be making our campfire at, he told us about how messed up and creepy his woods are 
end the numerous things he's seen. White, skinny figures peeking around the shed, staring at him and running off when he looked at it, screaming and whispers from the woods, figures watching him, all that good stuff. It set the mood pretty well. By around seven o'clock that night, we had the campfire set up and it was pitch black outside as it was the middle of winter in New Hampshire. I can still remember how creepy the whole vibe was that night. You couldn't see a single thing besides the ring of light coming from the fire. Everything else was just a black wall of nothingness and the sound of the forest was so quiet that the silence was almost deafening. At least it was if we weren't talking. We ended up needing more firewood and a few other things that we were using for the campfire, so the leader took me to go with him to get it. Without a flashlight or any light source, he and I walked the mile and a half long trail back to his house in complete and utter darkness. It was all good, we were talking, joking with each other, having a good time and just hanging out when the first noises started. He immediately made me stop talking. To my left and my right were a bunch of different sounds. Screaming, laughing, talking and whispering, shouting, people saying unintelligible words. It sounded like there was something around 20 people just surrounding us. The natural night vision had finally set in a decent amount and I looked over at my friend who had his head down and didn't say a single word. Known for being a complete goofball and a wild, funny dude, I had never seen him look so shaken and serious in my life. He had this look to him that still kind of haunts me to this day as I knew him pretty well and he always portrayed himself as the fearless leader type. Seeing him so shaken up and afraid was very unsettling. I started to say something along the lines of, what the heck is that? Before he cut me off and told me to be quiet, face forward, and not to pay attention to any of the sounds. I did what he said, and the next three minutes or so were incredibly uncomfortable and terrifying. I remember feeling sick to my stomach by the time we reached his house, the sounds had stopped. We both grabbed what we needed in total silence. That's when I could really listen to the sheer quietness of that night. No birds, no sticks falling, not a single sound. Absurdly silent. We walked back to the campsite and nothing else occurred that night. It's still my most unsettling and bizarre experience that I have no explanation for, and I'll never forget it. My friend and I camped on his property in the middle of nowhere. It was in the area of Cane Creek, Kentucky, near Laurel Lake. There was no service, no noise, no anything but you in the woods. We set up our tent under an overhang and I was tasked with gathering the firewood. It was about 5 p.m. or so and while collecting, I got this odd feeling and then I started to hear whispers. They weren't saying anything I could make out it was just murmurings. At that point, I got this creepy, odd feeling and I moved closer to our camp to collect the firewood. I didn't want to stray very far after that. Night progresses and nothing out of the ordinary happens until we climb into our sleeping bags. I heard footsteps in the leaves and more murmuring. I was getting really freaked out, but I know the best thing to do is to ignore it and sleep, and so I did. The following morning, my friend and I found ourselves awake at 5 a.m. He asked me if I had heard whispering last night. I told him I heard it twice, and we were both 
just as baffled as the other. We were not the first people to camp in this area. His uncle and his friends attempted to camp there as well, but they couldn't make it through the night either. My dad is a hunter, and he refuses to go down there to hunt anymore, as well as another friend I have. His dad says that the air down there is rich in death. I don't know the reason for what happens down there, but I won't be going back. This experience happened to me a couple of years ago, and I never found an explanation for it. However, my dad recently found someone on Reddit with a very similar story to mine that happened around the same time and in the same area. I reached out to that person, and they said that I was the fifth person to reach out, saying that they had experienced something similar. So I figured I would share my story and see if this has happened to anyone else. Some friends and I had gone camping up in a canyon in Utah. This was in 2020. Some creepy stuff had happened earlier in the night before I made it to the campground, so we were trying to relax, wind down, and have some fun like we had planned. We were in high school at this point, so we were doing stupid games like Truth or Dare and whatnot. It was four friends, our friend's dog, and me. There was only one other group somewhat close to us, a couple and their dog, who set up their tent a few yards away. They weren't close enough to interact with us at all, though. My friends and I were staying up and talking, laughing, etc. When at some point it sounded like somebody's car alarm went off, maybe five to ten miles up the canyon. The next campsite was pretty far away from ours. We didn't question the sound and went on talking, until we noticed that the sound had gotten noticeably closer. It happened so gradually that we didn't notice it at first, until it sounded like it was just a few yards away. The noisier we were, the closer it would get to us. As we whispered amongst ourselves about what could be making the sound, it came closer and closer. Finally, the noise was literally just outside our tent, mere inches away from us. None of us dared speak or move an inch in fear of compromising our safety. When we became quiet, so did the noise. After we were dead silent for a few minutes, the noise started up again and began to once again go farther away until it sounded like it was about 10 miles away again. This all happened in the span of 10 to 20 seconds. As the night went on, we heard the noise travel from campsite to campsite in almost no time at all. It didn't go away completely until about three o'clock in the morning. We tried to stay pretty quiet for the rest of the night. All in all, Whatever had made this sound traveled the span of roughly 5 to 10 miles in the span of 5 to 10 minutes. After that one time when we quieted down, it started up again and then it went back to where it started. That was about 20 seconds of it. Either way, this thing was going like a mile per minute. It wasn't a vehicle because there was no engine sound along with it, no headlights. It wasn't human because there wasn't a single footstep or twig crunch, not even when it was right outside our tent. It made zero noise aside from the beeping. It didn't sound like any animal that any of us knew about, and it traveled way too fast and was much too loud to be any animal. At least any we have around here. We originally thought that the sound was either a vehicle or a machine of some kind, because of the consistent pattern of the beeping. However, when we stopped to listen to it for a while, there was a brief moment when the pattern got slightly off tempo, but it sounded accidental, and then it quickly returned to the beat. This led us to believe that something was imitating the sound of a machine or a vehicle. We considered everything from weird nocturnal birds to pranksters with an air horn, 
but nothing added up. We ended up waking up the next morning at 5 a.m. to pack up and leave. The other campers who were sleeping a few yards away from us were already completely gone by the time we got up. This leads us to believe that whatever was messing with us that night had messed with them too. I wish we could have seen our friend's dog's reaction to what happened, but he had already fallen asleep by 8 or 9 p.m., long before the beeping started. It started at about 11 o'clock or midnight, and that dog can sleep through anything. I recently got together with those same friends and brought up what happened that night. One of my friends said that when the rest of us fell asleep, the same thing happened again. But... Instead of a car alarm, this time the sound was a crying baby, traveling at the same speed and distance as before. And according to her, it circled our tent a few times before fading off again. The people who were camping closest to us did not have a baby. Oh, and one other detail. We were less than 50 miles away from Skinwalker Ranch. I work as a park warden in the Canadian wilderness, typically spending my shifts in solitude from 5.30 at night to 2.30 in the morning. My jurisdiction covers around 300 campsites, several beaches, and the corresponding amenities, such as shower facilities. My park closes for the harsh Canadian winter, typically from mid-October to early April, during which feet of snow accumulate and the cold is unforgiving. Several years ago, a tragic incident occurred. A man chose to take his own life with a sawed-off shotgun by the river on one of the more secluded beaches. His body wasn't discovered until the spring thaw. This particular beach, situated at the northernmost part of the park, requires a patrol at least once an evening. One overcast day, around 7 p.m., I was at the shower facilities near this beach ensuring the first aid kits were stocked and checking the fire extinguishers. The dreary weather had deterred any visitors, leaving the beach and parking lot deserted, except for my patrol vehicle. Suddenly, I was overcome by a sense of dread. I ran to my vehicle, slamming the door shut and taking a few calming breaths to shake off the panic. Feeling somewhat better, if not confused, I stayed in the safety of my locked vehicle completing paperwork and logs. Given my job, not a lot scares me, so I was more shaken by the fact that I responded that way, still not knowing what caused it. Out of nowhere, a large, dark figure moved swiftly past my driver's side window. Startled, I let out a scream, instinctively recoiling as I thought somebody was attempting to break the glass or open the door. However, when I checked, there was no one around. Needless to say, I delegated all future maintenance tasks in that area to the day shift and hurried out of there. It might not be the scariest story ever told, but it deeply unsettled me. Even after three years, I steadfastly refused to conduct foot patrols in that area after sundown. Echoes of Laughter I've always found solace in the woods near my home in a small New England town, a place where the dense canopy of trees and the soft, earthy path beneath my feet offered a respite from the noise of daily life. It was during one of these escapes, on a day when the autumn air was crisp and the leaves painted a mosaic of fiery hues, that I experienced something that would forever alter my perception of these woods. The day was like any other, with the sun casting dappled shadows through the branches. The only sounds were the crunch of leaves underfoot, maybe the distant call of a bird. I was deep in thought. I was just pondering the turns my life had taken. 
Then a sound sliced through the solitude, a child's laughter, clear and unmistakable. It was a joyful sound, but in the context of the deserted woods, it was unnervingly out of place. I stopped dead in my tracks, listening intently. The laughter came again, this time seemingly closer. My initial confusion quickly turned to concern. What was a child doing out here alone, so far from any of the town's homes? The thought that somebody might be lost or in trouble spurred me into action. I began to search the area from where I thought the laughter had originated. As I moved through the underbrush, calling out with reassurances that I meant no harm, the laughter continued. It seemed to dance around me, now from one direction, then from another, as elusive as the shifting breeze. Despite my best efforts, I saw no sign of anybody. The laughter, so full of life, was juxtaposed against the stillness of the woods, creating an eerie atmosphere that sent shivers down my spine. Still, I was determined to find the source. I ventured further, the laughter guiding me deeper into the woods than I had ever been before. The trees here grew closer together, their branches intertwining like clasped fingers, casting the ground into perpetual twilight. The air grew colder, and a sense of unease began to settle over me. The laughter, once innocent, now carried a mocking tone, as if enjoying a game only it understood. After what felt like hours, I found myself in a clearing I had never seen before. The laughter stopped as abruptly as it had started, leaving a silence behind that was so heavy it felt like a physical presence. I stood there, catching my breath, looking around for any sign of life, but there was none. The feeling of being watched was overwhelming, and the hairs on the back of my neck stood on end. It was then that I noticed the gravestones, half hidden by overgrowth, scattered around the clearing. My heart sank as the realization sunk in. This was the forgotten resting place of the early settlers of the town, their existence erased by time and memory. The names on the gravestones were barely legible, worn away by centuries of weather, but the dates were clear enough. These were the graves of children, victims of the harsh realities of colonial life. The laughter had led me to this place, a hidden monument to lives cut short, their joy frozen in time. As I stood there, a deep sorrow filled me, not just for the children who had died, but for the loss of innocence that the laughter in the woods represented. It felt as though the laughter was their way of reaching out, a reminder that they too once lived and played and loved. Even if all that remained of them were these weathered stones and the echoes of their laughter. This is one of the many things that I have never told to anyone before, because I'm pretty sure that nobody would have believed me, thinking that my imagination was just wild, and sometimes I still doubt that anybody will believe me. But I remember this happening for real, so I wanted to share. This thing happened to me in the past when I was around nine, and I always used to hang out with my oldest cousin, who was seven back then. We were pretty inseparable at the time, before everything changed when he turned 18. I was spending the night at my granny's house, as I used to be her personal dog sitter, and he decided to come hang out with me. He suggested that it was a good idea to go into the nearest forest, which was almost right next to her house. We were living in a medium-sized city, but the forest is almost always near buildings at some parts or areas. Around 10 or 11 p.m., we decided just to walk to the edge of the forest, since it would have been completely foolish to go deep into the forest that late. I told him that that would be a good idea, since we were both kind of bored and feeling adventurous. 
We headed out and just started to walk toward the edge of the forest, both up for having a small adventure. But that didn't even last a half hour before the weird things started to happen. I remember when I was standing against a big tree and looking just in front of me, my cousin was near my side, like six or seven inches away from me. I was looking in front of me and I felt like I was searching for something. I'm still unclear of what exactly it was, but I was just looking. All of a sudden, I saw red eyes staring at me from out of nowhere, but they were really far from us. I turned toward my cousin and asked if he was seeing what I was, but he ignored my question. So I turned back to look at the eyes and they were much closer than before. I blinked a few times, but of course I couldn't see anything around them and they weren't getting closer. I just saw trees. I turned back to him and asked the same question, but he kept ignoring me. So I turned one last time to look at them to see that they were even closer and closer. I just kept watching them, feeling a little bit afraid at this moment. And I swear that they started to come toward me, even when I didn't look away. So I just grabbed his hand and ran as quickly as I could until we saw the street lamps. After that, I've never seen or experienced the same thing ever again. The weirdest thing in hindsight is that I never heard it getting closer. I never heard anything at all. Even if it had been like a wolf or a dog or something like that, I would have heard rustling or branches or something. But there was just nothing. It's been 16 years since this happened, and it has always stayed with me. From May of 2010 to May of 2011, I worked as a security guard at a hydroelectric dam in Virginia. It was a fairly isolated location. If you needed an ambulance, you could expect at least a 20 minute wait. About a month after I was hired, one of the guys at the dam told me that most security guards out there quit after a few days because they got so creeped out being alone at the dam at night, and that he was glad I was sticking it out. In truth, it could be creepy. Sometimes at night, when I was patrolling the basement level of the dam itself, I would think about the fact that I was 50 feet below the water line on the low side, the only human being in about a mile and a half radius. Sometimes I'd hear weird noises in the woods or catch a flash of a shadow while I was inside the dam it takes a lot to scare me though, and I knew I was either hearing critters in the woods or my mind was playing tricks on me. One night, however, something happened that scared the living hell out of me. It was a little after 11 p.m. and I was sitting in the guardhouse reading a book. Suddenly, I heard a tap at the door. What was creepy about the guardhouse at night was that when you had the lamp inside turned on, People could look through the windows at you, but the glare made it difficult for you to see outside. When I heard the tap at the door, I thought it was a bug hitting the glass. It was so faint, and I knew there weren't any contractors at the dam. I had the place to myself. Then the tap came again, more insistent this time. I grabbed my flashlight and opened the door. There was no one there. Then I let the door slip from my hand and shut behind me. To my left, previously concealed by the door as I had opened it, was a huge man, at least 400 pounds, wearing a gray sweatshirt and gray sweatpants. The sweatshirt was smeared with fresh blood. My heart started hammering. My blood ran cold. I was so scared I couldn't speak. As it turns out, he was a local fisherman who had been fishing off the bridge over the trail race. And he was wondering why the power company hadn't started back pumping into the lake yet, because they usually started a little before 11, and that was what always drew in the big striped bass. He was smeared with blood, 
because he'd already caught and gutted a couple and wiped his hands on his shirt. He felt really bad when he realized that he had approached me basically in the same way that a murderer in a horror movie would have. I am thankful to this day that I was unarmed security, because if I'd had a gun, I would have either shot him or accidentally shot myself while trying to shoot him. Either way, paranormal or not, that was the scariest night of my life working that job. In 2008, I was in the Navy. We were over a hundred miles from any land, and it was about three to four in the morning off the coast of Peru. I was an electronics technician, so I worked in radio with one other guy, a radio man, and we just sat up scanning the HF, UHF, and VHF radios listening for drug runners. We intercepted a UHF signal that played a short piano preamble followed by a haunting, computerized-sounding woman's voice, reading numbers. Eleven. Nine. Four. Six. This went on for about a minute. Then the preamble repeated, followed by the same number sequence. Then it was gone. We recorded the transmission, wrote the numbers down, informed the captain, and shortly, a message was sent off to the area commander about the strange message. The reply we received was, Disregard. Creeped me out. I came to find out that this is a number station, and while the phenomenon is not entirely understood, it's likely a method for getting a secure message or code to an intelligence agent in the field over an insecure method of communication. Since the numbers could be attached to a one-time code, it's basically indecipherable. Either way, it was super creepy. I was big into off-trail hiking. I would usually track animals and find really cool spots to hang out, meditate, and smoke a bowl. I had a good friend that was into doing the same thing, and one weekend we decided to go hiking together, find some killer views, smoke a bowl, and talk about life. Well, we got lost. The road we wanted to take was closed, and we decided to follow the detour and see where it would take us. I should mention that we were in the middle of nowhere, the mountains are beautiful and are filled with hidden streams and waterfalls, but they are almost inaccessible due to the terrain. I have been out to the area many times and never encountered a single soul. Anyhow, back to the detour. The road should have connected with another arterial, but soon we found ourselves on a logging road that dead-ended in the middle of the middle of nowhere. We thought this was weird, but we were like, okay, cool, an adventure. We see what looks like an old logging trail and decide to take an animal trail to the south of it. We gather up our bags and let out my German Shepherd, a rescue dog and the best darn dog that I ever had. This is important because to get everything we needed, we had to walk around my truck. We head out about 30 minutes into the trail and we start to feel like we're being watched. It was a bad feeling, like the kind of bad that makes your stomach drop and instinct take over. Relevant side note, I left home when I was 16 and was homeless for a while. There is nothing like a situation like that to teach you how to have eyes in the back of your head. Back to the story. The forest is silent. Not a bird moving in a tree, not a squirrel. Literally, there is no noise. It is supernaturally calm. And then we hear a stick break about 30 feet behind us on the trail. 
We assumed that it's a cougar, as they frequent these mountains, and so we kept pressing on, but the feeling doesn't pass. I motion for my friend to keep talking as I slide off into the brush and double back. I have my dog with me, a hunting knife, and some bear spray. I'm still wanting to believe that it's a cougar, so I figure that I'll be okay. As I get close to a turn in the trail, I hear some crashing in the bushes. Odd, because the forest is still silent. But again, it could be a bear, a cougar, something like that. My dog goes running toward the sound and then stops and begins growling. I figure the gig is up and I step back out onto the trail. And that is when I notice a third set of footprints, new, large, and male. I pretend that my dog is lost and then head on back down the trail to catch up with my friend. I mouth to her that I saw another set of footprints and at that time, we decide to climb higher up onto the mountain so that we can see if anyone is approaching from below. I'm pretty sure that this decision saved our lives. As we're hiking back to the car, we discover several hunting blinds. This is off-season hunting, and it's illegal, and most of the animals people really want to poach are still higher up in the mountains, but there was still warm food sitting on a plate. It was eerie as hell. We flat out booked it off the mountain so fast, with my dog running off and growling at the person that we now know was following us. We unlock my truck as soon as we see it and grab my dog in as we're pulling away. And that's when we notice the flat tire. Someone had sliced my tire to shreds. This is when I said screw it and gave thanks for having a sturdy truck that I didn't care about. I didn't care if I ruined the car, the axle, or the wheel. I just wanted out of there. When we got down to the highway, a term I use loosely, I pull over and patch the tire and pump it full of air as fast as I can. I know that we saw something we shouldn't have seen. We made it to a gas station, just barely. Also very creepy, complete with the old man and dusty cans of beans. Change the tire and then drive as fast as we can back into cell range where we call the cops. I don't think that they believed us. I'm pretty sure they thought it was an animal, but people go missing in the woods all the time around here, especially in that area. Unfortunately, I didn't know this until I got home and did some research. That was the end of my off-trail hikes. I now only go on heavily populated trails with a group of people, and I always leave the name of the hike and a map along with my expected return time with my best friend. It isn't nearly as enjoyable, but it sure is a heck of a lot safer. Moral of the story? Trust your instincts. Tell someone where you're going and when you'll be back. Carry bear spray and your survival pack. Always have an emergency repair kit in your car, a battery charger, air pump for your tire, a patching kit, flares, and a couple of flashlights. No matter how safe and reliable you think the location you're going to is. I forgot to mention earlier, we saw the same footprints leading from the shelter down to the animal trail we had been on. There is no doubt in my mind that we were being stalked, if not hunted. So I'm an avid caver from West Virginia, and there's this cave not far from me that's been one of my favorites to explore. It's often my go-to cave to take friends and newcomers to to get them into caving, as it's rather easily accessible and not too challenging of a cave. Although, it is a rather large cave system. The first thing to note is that there's never any wildlife seen in or near the cave and I've only ever seen a few bats for as large of a cave as it is. 
Anyway, the first really strange thing to happen was that my friends and I stumbled upon a pentagram made out of salt with a dead bird in the middle, circled by what seemed to be freshly burnt out candles. Obviously it was freaky, but we took it to be a prank by some teens or something along those lines. I've always been very comfortable going through this cave and leading treks, but up until now I had always been with a group of friends. One day, I decided to take my girlfriend through, so just the two of us went. We didn't make it past the first chamber because I just had such an uneasy feeling. It was as if I just needed to get out of there. My way of describing it is the feeling of being watched, but on steroids. I've been in some sketchy places, but I've never had that sense of dread in all my life. The next thing to happen is that a group of us went back in and stumbled upon a newer looking jacket far back into the cave that was never there before. I wouldn't have taken it to be so odd, but it seemed to be a rather expensive jacket with no apparent damage or reason to just leave it laying behind randomly far back in this portion of the cave. There was also nobody else around at this time. The next thing to happen was when a group of us friends were exploring and on the way back out, one of my most serious friends just seemed really strange and off. Finally, I asked him if he was good and he nodded and quickly told me to just keep moving. Once we got out of the cave, he pulled me aside privately, which is really not like him, but he told me that he didn't think it was a good idea to go back in there. I finally convinced him to tell me why, and he told me that he swore he saw a person back there. From what he could see, a very pale, lanky person. He couldn't quite make it out at first, but he said that he noticed it following us. He even tried calling out a few times, but we didn't think anything of him doing that at the time because it's fun to yell and make echoes. Anyway, after this experience, I convinced the same friend to go back with me, along with our other buddy, to reach an extremely difficult place that I haven't been able to access yet, seeing as I've just been taking newbies. As we arrived at the cave, there was a man and woman camping nearby who were standing at the entrance. We made a friendly conversation and asked if they were going inside. They said no, they were just checking it out. So we continued on. After reaching our goal and being at the dead end of a very tight spot, we laid and rested for a while. Then we heard people. We all heard it at the same time as we looked at each other and squinted. We couldn't quite make out what they were saying, as it was very distant and echoed and muffled, but we could clearly make out that it was English, male and female voices, and we heard laughter and water splashing. We thought it was pretty odd, because it was in the morning, and we didn't expect anyone else around but those two campers, so we figured it was them. Anyway, as we were exhausted, we rested for a good while longer and shut off our lights to save battery. We remained quiet as we were just resting, and after a while we couldn't hear them anymore. Then we went ahead and made our way back out of the cave. As we exited, the man and woman were still there by the entrance. My friend asked, So, you decided to go in after all? The man replied, no, why? And we asked if anyone else had gone in or out, and they said they hadn't seen anybody the entire time. At this point, we were creeped out, as we all clearly heard voices, but we didn't really talk about it much amongst each other. Much later, while doing research, I started putting things together in my head and realized that my friend's description was very Wendigo-esque, and then I recalled how they're very often known for being able to imitate human voices to lure prey, and it just really creeped me out. I almost wouldn't believe what he said he saw, but if you understood the person that I was talking about, if you knew him, he's not someone to ever make up something like that. 
Anyway, I hope you found the story interesting. I still don't know what we encountered, but if you have any ideas, let me know. This was back when I was living with my mom, aunt, and brother. We lived in a townhouse. It was like a large house with a smaller house inside of it. My aunt owned the house, so she was alone in the larger house, which was two floors. And my mom and I lived in the smaller house. We shared the bedroom, and my brother lived in the basement. One night, my mom was in the living room watching TV. I couldn't tell you what show, but she really only watches old sitcoms, so it's a dead giveaway that this couldn't have been the TV. My brother worked as a landscaper, so by this hour he was almost always fast asleep. Our bedroom has an outside-facing wall, facing the very large fenced-in backyard, and behind it a small stretch of woodland bordered by a reservoir. There isn't any room for anything larger than a coyote to live there, and nothing larger is native to the area, considering that we live in the suburbs. There are mountain lions a little over an hour north, but wolves and other predators are not native at all. Around 1 a.m., I heard this blood-curdling scream. Before you say anything, yes, I am aware of mountain lion screams, and I've listened to them extensively, but this was absolutely not a mountain lion. It wasn't a fox, either or any other animal that I could think of that we have here, but I'm open to suggestions if you think you know any. It goes on for a good ten or so minutes, while I lay paralyzed with fear. It sounds almost like children screaming, except deeper and more terrified. It genuinely sounded like someone being killed. The next morning, I asked my mom about it, and she said she didn't hear anything. My brother said that he did, but he thought that I was just up watching TV, or that maybe my aunt was fighting with her boyfriend. My aunt thought it was my mom having a temper tantrum. To this day, I don't know what it was, and though I don't live there anymore, it still makes me very afraid. I will preface this by saying that I have never seen a ghost. I believed in them in my youth, and I'd been rather agnostic about my beliefs for a long time, simply believing that anything could exist. The older I got, however, the more skeptical I became. But this happened last night, and I can now firmly say that I'm a believer. My friends and I were in a local park last night. We were walking along a trail. And right away, something was off. One of my friends has always experienced the paranormal, and he was extremely uncomfortable. He said he was seeing figures and hearing footsteps throughout the extent of the walk. My other friend and I couldn't see out of the ordinary, so we kind of laughed it off and said that he was just scared, which I now regret doing. It wasn't until we sat down at a tree that things took a turn for the worst. Both of my friends reported feelings of cold dread washing over them that I did not feel. I assumed they just had anxiety. Then my ghost-seeing friend stared at the tree line. I asked him if he was seeing one, and he said yes. I looked into the woods, and I saw it. It was a small, wispy figure that had a white-gray coloration and seemed to be made out of smoke or mist. It was in constant fluid motion, inverting into itself as if it was barely staying visible. It would bend from just a smoke ball to a small humanoid figure, not childlike, just small, and it would wave. I pointed at it and I asked my friend if it was between the two trees. He said yes. I described what I was seeing and he said, Oh my gosh, you see it too. We ran out of there after that. I felt the same dread that my other two friends felt, 
and I could not shake the feeling for the rest of the night. It's all I can think about now. I mean, what was that? It didn't feel like a dead person. I mean, it didn't feel like a person at all. It also didn't feel like it was mocking us. More like it was trying to act in a way that was abnormal for it. Like it was trying to be human. I don't know. I'm an ex-skeptic that's now begging for answers. My friend and I both saw the same thing, and all three of us felt the same thing. So if you have any idea what that was, I'm all ears. My boyfriend and I went up to his parents' cabin a few years ago. We were the only ones up there for the weekend. We went on a short hike up along a creek known as the Strawberry Trail. We were about a half a mile up just enjoying the beautiful scenery. We embraced in a hug and we both closed our eyes as we did so. But as soon as we did, we heard this loud flapping of wings or running of some large animal. It was so loud that we could feel the vibrations and a sort of wind that came with it. It felt like the animal or thing had stopped right in front of us. I was so terrified I kept my eyes closed, but as soon as I opened them, we both looked around and there was nothing there. We didn't hear it leave, and trust me, we would have. We were spooked, so we booked it back to the cabin. It was around 10 p.m., and my friends and I decided that it was a good idea to play hide-and-seek at 11 p.m. So when we started to play, I ran into the middle of the forest, where I hid. Around a tree, I saw a woman in a white dress, just staring at me. Obviously, I got scared and ran outside of the forest. On the way out, I got a cut that was about three or four inches long on my left hand. I only saw it when I was clear of the woods. When my friends got the balls to do it and go in there, they saw her too. We all ran to the highway, which was about 200 feet away. The night passed and we didn't play anymore, but I had a camera at home, which I didn't use anymore. I decided to put a 128 gigabyte SD card in it and place it near the tree that I had hit around to let it record anything. When my friend went to get it, he said that the woman appeared on the camera until 3 a.m. when she suddenly disappeared. Unfortunately, we have since lost the footage, but either way, it was a very scary experience. So when I was like seven or eight, we used to live in Webster, Wisconsin, and we lived in a house a little bit wider and longer than a trailer house. No upstairs, just the base floor and a basement. It was a beautiful house with a big area that was just woods. One day, my cousin was supposed to be watching my two sisters and I, and he said that we could all go play outside as long as we stayed in his sight. But within five minutes, he ran into the woods and told us to keep up. Of course, we listened to him. We ran after him and he disappeared. We couldn't see the house or even the tree line where the woods stopped. We were lost and we started freaking out and crying. Then about a half an hour later, a really tall Native American chief came up behind us and asked us what was wrong and why we were crying. Asked if we were okay, things like that. I told him how we'd been chasing my cousin and we lost him and we don't know how to get back home. He just smiles and says, don't worry, sweetheart. I'll make sure you get home safe and sound. Just come to my village and rest for a little bit. Eat some lunch, 
play with the children, and when you're ready, you can explain to me where you live. I said okay, so we go back to his village, and it's a smaller one in the middle of the woods, in a clearing, but it had at least 60 people. We ate a stew or something like that that they made, and he had me draw in the dirt on the road where our house was. He smiled and said, I know exactly where you live. If you want to play for a little bit, that's okay. But I want to get you home before dark. There are a lot of dangers in these woods, like bears, coyotes, bobcats. Not good for children to be out in. So he took us home, and he didn't leave the edge of the woods. My mom came out crying, asking where we were, saying she was about to call the cops because we were missing for about four or five hours. She asked us why we left the house without Scotty, my cousin, and I said, he was with us. He ran into the woods and left us behind. We tried to call for him, but he was gone. Then he came outside and said that he had never left the house. He thought we were in our rooms. So I told my mom what happened, and she said we would figure it out the next day. The next day, we went and followed our footprints and found the village, or what used to be a village. There was almost nothing there. What had been a gorgeous place was now ash. It had all been burned down. The grass, which was shorter the day before, now stood taller than me. It looked like it had just been burned down and left vacant for hundreds of years. We called out for them, but there was no response. We found the chief's headdress and a doll made of deer hide and some other kind of cloth. As we were about to head back, I found a huge eagle feather the size of my arm. It was the most amazing paranormal experience I have ever had. I was hiking a section of the North Umpqua Trail in the northern part of Southern Oregon a few years back with my sister-in-law. It's a 72-mile trail broken into sections that can be easily hiked in a day. At the time, I lived about midway up the trail, fairly remote in a small community. It was mid-fall this one day when we set out. The trail was running along the south side of the North Umpqua River and was pretty up and down in the beginning. We made it to a fairly flat section that was running just above the river. There was this beautiful view of the river through the trees, so we stopped to get some pictures and take a water break. I immediately felt extremely uncomfortable, like somebody was watching us. I slowly turned my head to look behind us, across the trail, and up. At the top of this very small incline, I could see a small meadow through the trees. Across the meadow, maybe 15 yards from us, was a tent. An old canvas-style tent. As I'm looking, I notice bones strung from the trees all around the meadow, like creepy death wind chimes. My stomach just clenched and dropped. I leaned into my sister-in-law and whispered, do not, not, turn around and look behind us. Just continue walking up the trail and run when I tell you. We were close enough to the river that nobody who wasn't immediately next to us could have heard this. She did exactly as I told her to do, setting off at the brisk walk we'd been at before. We got maybe ten yards, and I could hear footsteps through the forest floor coming from behind and slightly above us. That part of the forest is very dense. There's thick moss cover under the trees, so footsteps on it make a very specific sound. I leaned forward and told her to pick up her speed. She did. I did. And so did whoever was behind us. I leaned forward again and told her to run as fast as she could and not to stop until I told her so. For two middle-aged women, both slightly overweight, we ran like the wind. I just kept telling her, go, go, go. I could see ahead of us that the trail had an incline and then veered to the right along the river and around a cliff. I knew at that point that whoever it was was going to have to come down onto the trail or stop. 
We kept running. We probably ran at least a mile after that, even though we could no longer hear anybody behind or above us. That section of the trail was about nine miles, and we weren't halfway when this happened. We eventually slowed down, but just hurried as fast as we could the rest of the way. We had arranged for her younger brother to pick us up. We made it to the next trailhead fairly early, so we made our way out to 138 and started walking east toward home, knowing that he would find us. He did, and was shocked at our story. We got home and immediately called our local sheriff, who lived just above us at the ranger station. He came to the house and heard our story. He explained that it might be a day or two before they could get on the trail as they had a missing hunter at the time that they were searching for. So a few days go by and he shows up at our house to let me know that we weren't crazy or imagining things and that somebody really did chase us. I asked what they found and who it was. He looked at the floor and then looked up and said, I'm not going to tell you what we found or who it was because if I do, you'll never hike anywhere ever again. What we found was not normal and it won't happen up here again. He then instructed me to never, ever hike unarmed again. I never found out what they found, or who it was. I never hiked that section of trail again, and it completely burned last year. I also never hike unarmed, ever. That was huge for me because I wasn't really a gun person at the time. But I am a living person, and I'd like to stay that way, so I took his advice. I had many incidents living up there in the national forest with wild animals and other strange things, but nothing ever scared me as much as another human did that day. In Sydney, there's this National Park Drive where people complete runs which consist of trying to complete the drives within a timestamp. I've been doing these so-called Nasho runs for a while now with my best friend. Nothing has ever happened before, and the drive through the park is spooky at night, sure, but I've always found comfort in the woodlands or in night drives, so I never really thought anything of it. A few nights ago, Three of my friends and I went for a Nasho run, and exactly at the halfway point, we hit a pothole pretty hard, which resulted in a flat tire, so we pulled over to the side on a long road. This place has no reception, and it's in the middle of nowhere, with no way of walking through or back. We had a spare tire, but no change kit, so I had one friend on call for help which was a pain due to the lack of reception. My best friend panics a lot, so she was on the verge of crying, and I was rummaging through the boot for a wrench and a jack. About 20 meters away was a parked car, which was strange because the last house we passed was about a kilometer away, but we just shrugged it off. Later on in the dead of night, we hear a group of friends laughing, and this spooked my friends so they stayed in the car. I told them I was going to follow the laughter and ask if they had a change kit in their parked car. Nate insisted on coming with me. We walked 20 meters to the parked car and nobody was in there. It gets pretty freaking dark, so I tell him to turn on his flashlight, which he does. We turn a corner on a gravel road and once we do, we see a woman standing there with her back toward us. The group laughter had stopped which left us in the dead of night, in complete silence, in the middle of nowhere, with this random woman who was just standing there. But she looked pretty normal to me, so I approached her slowly. I said, Hey! She didn't turn around, or react at all. So I stopped in my tracks, but Nate continued walking toward her. He stopped about five meters away behind her. I yelled out, Oi! And again, she didn't turn around. We weren't able to see her face, but something just wasn't right. She was tall, in all white, but I looked at Nate and he just stood there, 
and under his breath, he muttered my name and told me to go repeatedly. So I turned around and started walking back. By the time we passed the car, we started running back to our car. We sat inside and I asked what happened and he said that something was wrong because a woman just shouldn't be standing there by herself in pitch darkness in the middle of a gravel road. In addition to that, she didn't react to us or our source of light. He said he just felt ominous about it all. We told our other two friends and Nate was very shaken up. They sort of laughed it off. And when we ended up finally changing the tire, we turned the car back around and stopped right where we had seen the woman. I rolled the window down and shined my flashlight on the gravel road. The woman was gone though. No more laughter, just silence. I thought maybe I had imagined her, but we stood right there and Nate was right behind her. However, every single one of us heard the group laughter and there's a fair share of paranormal stories about this area but up until then I'd never really paid attention to it. I know it doesn't sound like much, but at the time, it was so crazy. Something just felt so, so wrong. And the way the laughter got relatively loud the closer we got but then came to a total halt once we saw her, something was just wrong. It was somewhere in the middle of the White Mountains in the summer when I walked into what looked like a scene from a horror movie. A person with zero hiking, camping, or other experience had gotten themselves into trouble. Big trouble. It was around 7 a.m. when I found the campsite. The first thing that hit me was the eerie stillness until I noticed the shredded tent under a tree and the desperate looking human figure covered in blood, whimpering quietly. I put my bag down, grabbed my kit, and went over to the person. They looked like they had just lost a knife fight with a four-armed man. Deep slashes from one shoulder to the hip, single punctures up and down his back, and hands and forearms full of what looked to be defensive cuts. I patched him up the best I could, gave him water, checked my map, and hightailed it to the closest road. This was before cell phones were super prevalent and barely worked in the mountains. Thankfully, the road was very close by, less than two miles, and I was able to flag somebody down. They took off and I waited for assistance to arrive. It took about an hour until rescue got there. I led them to the still unidentified individual. He wasn't very conversive when I first found him. I was sure he'd be dead before we got there, but I was wrong. I assisted rescue bringing him out and took them up on their offer to head into town and get cleaned up. After cleaning up and getting myself situated at their station, I went on my way, leaving them my number to call to let me know what was up with the person that we had helped. I got home three days later and there was a message on my machine. Story goes that the guy I found decided to go camping one day and heard that he had to keep food hung from a tree to keep bears away. Well, he did that, but he put it almost directly over his tent and not high enough. The night before I happened upon the site, a bear had used the tent and its occupant in an attempt to climb the tree to get the food. The guy had woken up to four black bear paws sinking into his body, shifting to reach up. The guy survived and swore to the hospital staff that he was moving to the city and never going into the woods again. I distance hike when I can. Sometimes this means getting up early or staying out late to get as many miles in as possible. Sometimes walking in the pitch dark with a low light headlamp gets spooky. I grew up in the woods of this area. I've slept under the canopy of stars more nights than I can count. I've trekked thousands of miles of trail, riverbank, lake shore, ridge bottoms, bogs and creeks. I've hunted the game 
I'm establishing this because it's important that you understand that I have heard, seen, and smelled about all this region has to offer in the way of wilderness. My scariest experience, though, happened at about 4.30 in the morning. It was late spring, so the first morning light wouldn't be visible in the treetops for another 30 to 45 minutes. Another hour passed that until sunrise. I was on mile five. I'm in a low bottom that's wedged between two steep ridges. The trail I'm on was narrow, muddy, and completely hemmed in by thick underbrush, young maple, and old oak growth. I'm focused on the small light from my headlamp, just one step after the other, zoned out. Then I heard a loud crack, and I froze solid. This is the part I have trouble describing. 4.30 in the springtime means I'm the only thing making noise. No birds chirping, nothing. Dead quiet. Mid-step, I froze. When fight or flight kicks in, you have these immediate instinct thoughts. The thought that instantly flashed in my mind as I stood there, balancing myself into silence was, if I hear that again, I'm turning around and going back the way I came in a hurry. Why? Because that sound was not a branch breaking. It wasn't deadfall, it wasn't a widow maker. I was sure that I had just heard something intentional. Hearing it twice? Well, that meant to get out of there. To describe it as best I can, it sounded like a decent sized wooden stick being violently whacked against a small tree. More a fungo bat sized stick than a baseball bat. The distinction in my head being that this sound was a crack, not a thud or a thump. I've described it in the past as explosive because it was so terribly loud and sudden. I had the sense that it was about 50 yards directly in front of me, and it was loud and clear. Now as I stood there, completely spooked, I realized the soon-to-be worst part of my situation. I knew where the sound had come from, and I knew where the trail went. In about 30 yards, I was going to come across a 180-degree turn and start up the ridge going away from the creek. This meant that as soon as I got the courage to move toward the noise, I was going to have to turn my back to it and get up that ridge. This made me very nervous. My head is somewhere between there's a murderer and there's Bigfoot, and I really didn't know which. Minutes pass. I just breathe the foggy breath and listen. Nothing. Dead quiet. I've got about 20 to 30 minutes until first light, so I crank up the headlamp and start to slowly creep toward that turn. When you wear a headlamp in the woods at night, every tree branch in front of you casts a big black moving shadow on the trail. That didn't help. I get to the turn and quickly make the bend. I'm moving pretty fast at this point, trying to be quiet, taking tiny shallow breaths so I can listen, and then I smell it. A stench hits me that I can't describe. I just imagined wet, rotten death. I've actually worked scenes where humans have expired in a past life as a firefighter. This was like days old decomposition, but it just smelled strange. I kept walking, fast. By the time I made the top of the ridge, I was huffing and puffing, and the first light was showing. I didn't stop moving until full light was out and the birds were chirping. I have heard it all in the woods. I've smelled it all. I'm telling you, I don't know what that was. Deadfall, and especially leafed out branches, make a lot of noise on the way down. I've heard that many times. This wasn't that. But what it was, I don't know. So I live in Kentucky, in the city now, but we lived way out in the country when I was younger, in a very old, giant farmhouse. My family got it for cheap because it was falling apart, and the basement would flood and have a crawfish infestation because it was so old. The basement floor was basically dirt and mud. My dad and I would go on walks across the property to our neighbor's pond to fish. 
he allowed us free access to do this. This neighbor also owned a herd of cattle. One day, we were walking there, and at the top of a very tall tree, it had to have been 40 to 50 feet off the ground, there was a young calf simply impaled on one of the top branches. It had not been stormy for days, so it couldn't have been a freak tornado. It's worth noting that I was also abducted from this house twice. This was over 20 years ago, but I will never forget that moment. It is one of the things that's convinced me there's so much to this world we don't understand. This happened when I was growing up, around 2004 or 2005, when I was about 13 years old. It took place in rural Texas. The town itself was really small back then, and not much to look at. It's just one of those towns that really isn't on the way to anywhere important. My father knew someone who owned a deer lease that was about a thousand acres, I think, down outside of that area and was complaining about a ton of hogs that were tearing up their land. Being open season on hogs in the south, my dad thought he would surprise me that summer and take me down for a week to go hunting for them. Not only did that help him with networking for his job, but it also gave us some quality father and son time. I remember the drive down there from Dallas was torture. It was about seven hours in my dad's hardtop Jeep Wrangler. The car was so uncomfortable. I hated it. All I had to do was either stare out the window or try and beat Super Mario Land 2 on my Game Boy Pocket, something I was never able to accomplish in my youth. The drive, obviously, took most of the day, so we got there in the early evening. The owner of the land had told my dad that he hadn't had anyone lease it that year and that the cabin in the property might be a little rough and dusty. I didn't really care. At this point in my life, I had been in scouts for a couple of years, and I spent a lot of my free time in the woods or fishing with friends. Needless to say, I was pretty comfortable roughing it. So, after unlocking the gate and driving to the cabin on the land, we settled in. The cabin was pretty rough, dust and dirt everywhere, flies. I remember that it looked like some raccoons had gotten into the cabin and crapped on the floor. After cleaning up a bit and getting the sleeping bags out and then setting up the cots, we decided to sleep. Something about that night was weird. I was never able to get comfortable enough to fall asleep for any restful amount. I couldn't put my finger on why, but I had that feeling of being watched. I was finally able to drift off for what I guessed was an hour, maybe. When we woke up, it was early, about 7 a.m. We decided to scout around the land for tracks and signs of hogs and find a good place to set up a blind. It was the summer and horribly hot in the afternoons, so morning was the best time to be out and about. After walking for an hour or so, we came to an area of trees, lightly dense, and luckily found some signs of hogs. Typical torn up ground where they'd been rooting, so we followed them into the trees. I was looking for more signs when my dad stopped me with his arm. I remember looking up and seeing someone standing about 50 yards away. Some of their body was blocked by trees. This was private land, so they definitely weren't supposed to be there. We also had confirmation from the owner before we got to the lease that nobody was there, not to mention the gate was locked up when we first arrived. The person was wearing some bright colored red jacket. We slowly walked toward them. My dad called out something like, Hey, we're, we're hunters. This is private land. The person didn't move at all, dead still. We were about 30 yards away and could see that he was turned away from us with his hands in his pockets. Weird thing was that the person was in a ski jacket and what looked to be ski pants. Now this is Texas in the summer. It was about 98 outside by then. My dad called out again, no reaction. He told me to stay behind him and unsnapped the clip to his pistol holder. That's all we had at the time since we were only scouting the area 
The rifles were back at the cabin. We approached the person's right side, and then my dad told me to stay put about 20 yards away. I stayed and crouched down, watched him circle around to the front of the man, all while talking to him, asking if he was okay. He finally passed around to the front of the man, and my dad stood straight up with a really confused look on his face. I called out and said, what's wrong? He called back saying, it's a mannequin. I walked over to it while my dad stood there staring, and as I got closer, one thing stood out the most. The clothes it was wearing were brand new. No dust, sap, bird droppings, or signs of being outside for more than a day at the most. At that moment, I looked at my dad and I could see him get worried. Almost immediately after, I felt that feeling again, like we were being watched, and I knew that my dad felt it too. I wanted to start crying. I remember feeling suddenly like I was so scared. My dad whispered, we're leaving right now. He grabbed my hand and drew his pistol. He scanned the area the whole way back while I was trying to hold back panicked tears. We got back as fast as we could. I was terrified, so it felt like an eternity, but in reality, it was probably only about 45 minutes max. After returning, we packed up and beat feet. We drove back home that day and didn't talk much on the way back. I remember right after we left, my dad called his buddy, the owner of the land, and he was confused. He said that he would go check it out next week when he was in the area. He also said that he had never had an issue with people on his property because it was high fenced. My dad normally isn't a paranoid person, but me being young and the least possibly having someone there that we didn't know about, he decided to be cautious and just get out of there. After we got back home, we talked and my dad wasn't able to sleep the night before as well. He had the same feeling, but didn't want to wake me up because he thought I was sleeping. Turns out that next week he got a call from his buddy and he checked the whole property and never found a trace of anyone, including the mannequin. A few years ago, my friends and I went on a 45-mile, three-night kayaking trip down the Green River in Kentucky. It runs above the Mammoth Cave System, the world's longest known cave system, with more than 400 miles of surveyed passageways. We brought everything we needed in our kayaks and one canoe, food, tents, water filtration, etc and we camped each night on the riverbank when it started getting dark, and we found level enough ground most times. The first night was uneventful, except to say that there's nothing like a wall of fireflies against a mountainous black tree line at night in the middle of nowhere. The second day, around sunset, after a long day of kayaking and baking in the July heat, we came upon a stream on the bank that opened up into a large ravine. The stream, as we found out, was a cave spring, pouring out blue, freezing cold cave water into a lagoon, about 30 feet wide and so deep the blue water turned black after a few feet. The lagoon had a long, sandy beach, secluded by hills on either side, and a tall, overhanging cliff behind and above us. It was a beautiful, otherworldly place. Time moved very slowly there. We decided to camp there for the night. The sand was soft, white, and very fine, ideal for sleeping. For some reason, the place deeply frightened me, but I didn't speak up. We were all tired and everyone was having fun. We built a small fire and enjoyed the stars through the leaf canopy for a while before everybody went to bed. I slept hard that night. At around 5 a.m., I woke up with an urge to relieve myself. It was still dark. I had the tent door zipper about halfway opened and had just popped my head out when I heard a loud and terrible roar or scream. I immediately cowered back into the tent and zipped it closed, and I waited. 
The scream came from about ten feet to my left, near the dwindling fire. It was high-pitched, but not like an owl's screech, although I'm not ruling that out. It was a wretched, pained scream that got lower-pitched at the end. Being that we were in the middle of nowhere Kentucky, most likely it was a fox, or a boar, or some kind of bird. Whatever it was, I lay awake for an hour, listening. I heard absolutely nothing. Granted, we were on a soft beach, but I didn't hear a single twig snap, not a single leaf crinkle, when, whatever it was, finally shuffled away. It was bizarre. I should mention at this time that up the beach and off to the side of the lagoon was a small, dry cave opening, maybe three feet wide. I cannot say with any certainty that it was not some ancient cave-dwelling creature that surfaced to investigate our camp. I somehow fell back asleep and awoke the next morning shaken. I asked if any of my friends had heard the terrible scream, but no one had. We pressed on down the Green River. The third night, at dusk, we came upon a large rocky beach. We pulled our boats ashore and decided this would have to do, as we didn't want to go farther down the river and risk being stuck on the water at dark. This rocky beach was where the river split into two, and in the middle formed a collection of pale rocks, tall grass, and dried out wood, a desolate pile of muck the size of a football field. The landmass was covered in jumping sand spiders and tiny frogs. Again, otherworldly. We set up camp, ate, and all went to bed at around the same time. It was silent for probably 20 to 30 minutes, I'm not sure. I was asleep, as the others most likely were as well. I was having a dream, but suddenly, my dream was interrupted by what sounded like a booming, loud, mechanical, wooden beast. I awoke and shot straight up. It was truly the loudest thing I have ever heard. It sounded like a massive bulldozer tearing down a huge steel and wood building. Then came a boom, followed by its echo throughout the river valley. The animals shifted and the birds flew away. We were all awoken by the crash and yelling and confusion to each other in our tents. Nothing but silence followed outside our tents, and nobody was particularly willing to shine a flashlight toward the woods. Eventually, we all just decided that it was a falling tree, and went back to sleep. The next morning, I thought about it some more. It didn't sound like just a falling tree. I must stress that it had a metallic quality, and it was projected purposefully. It almost sounded like a roar. In the morning light, we found no evidence of anything out of the ordinary, nor any obvious fallen trees that could have made such a loud sound. So we packed up and headed out onto the river, one last time, to head home. My friends and I still talk about that trip and all the weird things that happened. We did the same kayak trip a couple of years later, and nothing out of the ordinary happened. No mysterious forest noises, no crashing, no metallic groaning in the middle of the night, nothing. To both my disappointment and relief. This is a story that my mother and aunts told me when I was in high school. I'm 21 now, and it has never left me. I think about it constantly and ponder over what happened. My grandfather passed close to a year ago in June of 2020. He was 96 when he died, and it caused some issues in my family. They don't really pertain to the story, but there are some things about him that I have to share in order to explain the story in the best way. My grandfather, John, was a man who was extremely calloused and old-fashioned. He was bitter, abusive, and a complete macho man. My mother was raised never showing emotion or pain due to his abuse and lack of compassion for others. He had many secrets in my family that are now coming to light after his death. 
everything that happened around him was brushed off and forgotten because he had more important things to do, like drinking or having affairs. Just an overall intense and very no-nonsense type of man. He was also not religious at all and found things like faith or hope stupid. This story takes place sometime in the 70s, most likely early to mid-70s. My mom was born in 65 and remembers this story clearly. My aunts, as well, remember this happening. But nobody knows exactly what year. One summer day, John decided to take his family on a small outing with the intent to have a picnic in the woods. My mother, her three sisters, and her mother and my grandmother were all there and very excited about this. Where we're from, my family is more accustomed to the woods and has lived in this area for generations. Going into the woods for a fun family activity was nothing out of the ordinary and seemed to be just another normal day. They made their way down a dirt backwoods road and stopped once they found a clearing large enough to accommodate them. As all the kids started jumping out of the car and messing around, as kids do after being stuck together, my grandmother began unloading their food and picnic supplies. John began surveying the area and deciding where to set up. As he was doing that, something in the woods past the clearing caught his eye. Before going to see what was out there, he yelled to the family and said he would be right back. The kids and my grandmother thought not much of this, since they're all used to the woods, and these woods in particular were very familiar to them. They continued unloading and setting up the stuff that they had brought. One of the girls pointed out something in the clearing that caused a sudden shift from a normal day to something worse. It was a dirt mound that looked like something was buried under it. This mound was about the size of a small person maybe even child-sized. It was too big to simply be any animal in these woods. There were nothing but squirrels and raccoons in the area. Scattered amongst the mound were larger river rocks. There was no pattern, but they were definitely placed on the mound intentionally. Also, the dirt seemed to be fresh, as though just buried. It was loose and slightly darker than the area around it. The mood immediately shifted to something dark. My grandmother became concerned and told the girls to stay away from it. She was clearly upset and worried about it, but did her best to ignore it. The girls, all being children, didn't have the same amount of worry and continued playing while just avoiding the mound. They tried to return to their picnic, and the girls were already chasing each other in circles again. It was supposed to be a joyous, sunny day, and my grandmother wanted to keep it that way. Things seemed to return to normal for a beat. The trees around them created a wall of dense foliage, blocking their view from anything inside the forest. One of the girls again took notice of something strange. It was clear immediately what it was. Along one of the long branches of the tree hung a noose. It was tied with a rope and hung high above their heads. A lump of dirt can be explained away by nature but someone had to have placed the noose there. My grandmother stopped dead in her tracks when she first saw it. Something was wrong. Very, very wrong. They couldn't just pack up and leave. John was still out in the woods. Even children can recognize a noose as a symbol of death. The children started to become very anxious. Whatever innocence was keeping them from worrying about the mound had completely vanished. My grandmother, the resilient woman that she is, soothed her children and told them that it was just left by deer hunters. But she knew in her heart that they needed to leave. No deer hunter would hang a deer and then bury it. At least, no sane deer hunter. It wasn't until they started hearing something in the woods that they really began to panic. My grandmother, as well as all the children, began hearing a rhythmic chanting from deep inside the woods. It sounded as though there was a group of people all singing in deep voices to the beat of a drum. It went in a quick bum 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 pattern. Three steady beats followed by a pause, and then it would repeat. It sounded far away, but immediately fear began to take hold of each of them. They each listened and gathered together. As the seconds passed, it began to increase in volume. It was getting not just louder, but closer. 
What started out as a distant echo soon began to engulf the entire clearing. My grandmother was terrified and wanted so desperately to leave, but John had yet to return. They waited, fear-ridden, as the sound began to fill their chests. It felt like they were at a concert as the deep bass began to vibrate within them. It was everywhere and constant, as though the sound was being made by the trees themselves, surrounding the family in every direction. Suddenly, the sound of yelling broke through the constant drone of chanting. John's voice was yelling out to them from the trees. Go, he yelled. Get in the car. He came running out of the woods, yelling that they needed to leave. They had never seen terror on this man as they had at that moment. He was a man afraid of nothing, unbothered by the world around him. This was in fact the most emotion any of them had ever seen from him. He saw something in those woods, something that shook his very being to the core. My grandmother began throwing everything back in the car as the kids got in as well. John and my grandmother picked up their things as quickly as possible and threw it all into the car. They had no care for the things that they were packing up due to their fear. Food was all over the trunk. Items were broken. After everything was tossed in, they both got in the car and drove away. This is where the main grunt of the story ends. But one fact from this story is what really has caused me to wonder all these years. My grandfather has refused to ever speak of what he saw. He never told any of the children or even my grandmother. Every time this was brought up, he quickly rebuffed it and angrily told them never to ask again. He never went to the police or told someone outside of the family. My grandfather is the only person who knows what happened that day. When I first heard the story, I swore to myself that I would ask him one day. Now I can't and I regret it greatly. By the time I was in high school, he had moved out of the state with other family members and I mostly lost contact with him outside of occasional happy birthday calls or letters. This story doesn't have an answer to go with it. When he died, the only thing I was sad about was never knowing what happened that day. We weren't close when I got older and once I learned of all of the abuse he caused, I separated myself from him. His death looms over me and this story still haunts me. My mother and aunts just look back on it as a spooky memory from their childhood. Nothing more than a story to spook the little ones at Thanksgiving with. I am one of the only people in my family who is still curious about what happened. I've always been interested in mysteries, horror, and conspiracy theories. This story piqued my interest more than any others in my family. This isn't the only strange story from my family, but it is definitely the strangest. I wish I had answers, but I hope you all find this story as fascinating as I do. My wife and I have been having a lot of paranormal activity. After moving into a wooded area just outside of Pittsburgh, everything started. Our house is isolated from the neighborhood. That only makes the fear of something terrible happening even worse. I would like to point out that my wife and I are logical, rational thinkers who are educated to some degree. Since we can't explain these events and we fear ruining people's perception of our family, we've turned to all of you. All of these experiences have happened while sober and within the past two years. There's a lot, so please give us a chance and let us know what you might think it is. Incident 1. First things first, animals dying in the wild is common. Duh. But hearing the screams of struggle and pain, almost as if the animal is being tortured, I don't know if that's normal, but the sound sends chills down my back. This incident happens frequently. Incident two. When we're walking in the woods, accompanied by my wife and kids, I stumble upon a small clearing in the trees. Under the leaves were children's shoes. Shoes that were worn out, as if they'd been there for a very long time. Incident 3. This one is hard to believe. Trust me, I know. 
I was in denial and didn't tell my wife what I had seen for weeks because it just sounded so fake. And I didn't want to catch any flack for seeing whatever it was. Smoking a cigarette out of the second floor bathroom window last fall while scrolling on my phone, I had that feeling as if someone is staring at you. I glanced away from my phone to look. I caught in my peripheral vision a humanoid type beam. I use peripheral because before I could really focus on it to see it, it bolted into the woods behind my house on the east side. I was completely caught off guard and terrified. I didn't even watch it run into the woods. I looked straight ahead and acted like I'd never seen it, like a deer in headlights. I acted like scared prey. This creature was not human, and that's why I was so deeply terrified. It was tall and had shoulders and a head, no hair, and a color of skin that I couldn't really make out, but it just wasn't normal, you know? It's weird because my brain didn't know what to do. I couldn't process it fast enough. I just stared completely ahead and stayed straight, completely frozen from fear. Hearing the strides this thing had was unexplainable, and the speed that it had, rilling through with such ease in the middle of the night in the woods, is beyond human. I don't know what it was. Months go by. I was in the same bathroom window where my wife and I tend to smoke when we don't want to go outside at night. We opened the window to smoke, but it sounded like it was pouring rain. Both of us were completely confused because no water was falling from the sky at all. I walked downstairs to go outside to try to understand what was happening. The garden hose was on and the handle was pushed into the dirt, shooting water into the trees above, making a surprisingly loud raining sound. We have no idea how that happened. Incident number five. This is another ongoing incident. Basically, we always feel watched at night. In the daytime, the woods are normal and somewhat peaceful. But at night, it's totally different. You have that constant eerie feeling that you're being watched. Incident six. At this moment, we've become interested and are sitting by our window every night trying to find explanations as to what humanoid thing that was. We were in mid-conversation on a random subject when a loud crack came from the ground right below us. The noise was loud enough and close enough to make both of us jump. We were super scared and locked the window and decided to stop for the night. It sounded like a bat or an axe, maybe, hitting a tree really, really hard. From the humanoid creature to this loud sound, we've become so afraid that we actually have our children sleep in our room. Incident number seven. As we were laying in our bed, my wife woke me up at 2 a.m., freaking out, saying that she smelled burning plastic and thought that something was on fire. We have a two-story house and had our bedroom window cracked. We looked outside where we thought the smell was coming from. That's when we saw a lit up triangular shaped thing in the back of the house, deep into our woods. It was orange lights and blue lights and orbs next to it. You could see shadows of people walking around this thing. We immediately thought of a cult. We were so scared we were about to call the cops, but doubt set in when we double checked the window. So we never ended up telling anybody. Incident number eight. After all of this, we still have to stay active, so we went on a walk one evening with the children around the neighborhood. Noticing that the sun was setting, we headed home. Obviously, this place is weird, so who would want to be outside in the dark? We got to our gravel driveway, which is about a hundred yards, tall trees on one side and bushes and smaller trees on the other. As we're walking about 15 feet onto the driveway, we notice bats flying down left to right and right to left. We'd only ever seen up to this point maybe a couple in our yard, feeding off the bugs, I guess. I started to walk down the driveway. My wife stayed behind, opposing this idea. The farther down I got, the scarier it became. I had completely underestimated the amount of bats. I started running because my children became frightened. As I start running, Bats, and I'm not kidding, began to line their flight path with my head. They would turn away probably five feet from my face, maybe closer. 
This was completely terrifying. As I'm trying to avoid these demons, I hear my wife screaming as she flies past me and beats me home. My daughter, on the verge of tears, was saying that she was so scared she thought she was going to pee her pants. Now, before everybody loses their mind, I know that bats are docile and pose absolutely no threat to humans despite rabies. These bats were not acting like normal docile bats, which is why this was so weird. I cannot explain why or how it happened, but it was as though something went off in their brains that just said, attack, or at least make us really afraid. They came in a line at us and then veered off right at the last. I've certainly never heard of that happening, and I know that's not normal. So we didn't treat them like docile bats because they weren't acting like docile bats. Incident number nine. I didn't personally see this, but it was weird and doesn't add up, so I'll include it. One Sunday, my parents were over for dinner. When I came back down to talk to my wife, I said, yo, my mom said she saw some chubby girl with a black sundress come out of the woods, walk in the tree line, and then go further down. This lady came out of the north side of the house, like east to northeast. I know it's hard to picture if you don't know what the property looks like, but that's what happened. The odd part of this is that the northern tree line of the property is pretty rough terrain. Steep hills, torn bushes, loose soil. It would be hard to hike it, let alone in a sundress. Although about a mile and a half north through the woods, you do pop out right outside of a small town. So I suppose it could be rational, but it still seemed really odd with everything happening. Most people wouldn't go hiking through that kind of terrain dressed like she was. The last incident, so far anyway, is that if either one of us goes to smoke at night at the window in our bathroom, we always hear this kind of bell. It kind of sounds like a symbol. Being skeptical, we thought it was wind chimes. We've looked though, and there are no wind chimes at my neighbor's house. It's the only neighbor we have for about 200 feet in between each other on our south side. The bells are coming from the southeast side of the property. And this is something else that we cannot explain. We're pretty scared. And as you can tell, it's pretty unbelievable what's going on. We don't really know what to do. All these weird things just keep happening. And we're afraid that it could escalate or take a turn for the worse. It's already overwhelming so overwhelming that it's the only thing we've been able to talk about for a long time now. Anyway, if any of you have any idea what could be going on, let us know. This is a very long story but it's worth telling, and I hope I can find some answers. I live in the state of Georgia, in a rural town not too far from a major city. There's a set of woods that's behind our house, and it divides two neighborhoods. It's about a mile wide, if that. Strange occurrences have always surrounded these woods. Small things like random trash, tarps, etc. show up seemingly without warning. I should mention that it's more swampy marsh than woods, so it makes camping in there impossible. One night, I was taking our dog out. He stays in the back half of the house due to him not liking the other dogs. I took him out the side door and walked around the house to the fence. For some reason, when we left the house, he was absolutely terrified. He didn't want to go out. Very unusual for a dog who's quick to snatch someone's soul if prompted. Not thinking about it, we pushed onward. After he tinkled, we walked back. This is when I noticed it, or rather heard it, the crunching of leaves. At first I thought it was one of the dozen cats on our property, until I realized that it was matching my steps. If I walked, it would walk. If I stopped, it stopped. There's a small clearing between the woods where one of the sheds is, and that's when we saw it. My dog was the first to see something, and then I saw some creature of some kind. It was taller than the shed, so maybe a good eight feet tall, and it darted across the clearing at a crazy fast speed. 
My dog, who again isn't scared of anything, bolts so fast that I dropped his leash. He ran in the door, whining. I was quickly behind him. Once we were inside, I bolted the door and I ran to tell my girlfriend what had happened. She immediately wanted to investigate, saying that it was probably a woodland creature. Armed with two flashlights, we went out the front door. As we walked toward the wood line, we could hear something moving around. It sounded maybe 200 yards away. As we scanned with our flashlights, we saw nothing but kept hearing it. Then we heard it get closer and closer until it was maybe 20 feet away, but still nothing. No eyes, not even an animal call, just rustling. My girlfriend, now scared, heads for the house. I decided to check with the neighbors to see if maybe one of their many dogs had gotten out. When I arrived at his house, my neighbor, who we'll call Dave, explained that all his dogs were accounted for, but he was curious, so he came to investigate. This is when I noticed that whatever this thing was had followed me along the wood line to Dave's house and was now behind his house. Gun in hand, we went into the backyard scanning for something. We could hear it rustling, or maybe running, about a hundred yards away in the thick, swampy woods. Way too thick for a person to walk in, let alone run in. And then, it stopped. It was dead silent. Scanning and on edge, we hear and see nothing. And then, bam! All of a sudden, it was five feet in front of us, sprinting at me. It slammed the fence so hard that it rocked it back and forth. Dave, scared shitless, shot randomly at, well, nothing. We never saw it. We never heard it get close to us. Again, as I mentioned, the woods are thick. Too thick to run in, so what teleported silently in front of us and slammed into the gate? Spooked, we were about to run. But then, we heard it. It was human in nature, but not English. A language sounded alien-like, but not a known language, that's for sure. Dave, a hunter for the last 40 years, still to this day cannot explain what that was. Anyway, after we heard that, we bolted. He covered me and I ran to the house. Not 10 minutes later, we both hear a loud explosion coming from the woods. It shook our houses and flickered our power. I ran outside to see what it was and, of course, nothing. But when Dave came out and confirmed that he felt the same thing, we were both once again terrified. Moments later, a few strangers from the neighborhood came driving down to our cul-de-sac, and they all agreed that the blast sound that they heard came from behind our house. 911 was called, and the two police officers interviewed us separately. Our stories matched. The responding officers refused to go anywhere near those woods. They took the report and left. To this day, we're still not sure what that encounter was. Also, Dave doesn't go outside at night anymore. That's how bad it spooked him. The next night, earlier in the day, my mother-in-law and a police officer for a town 40 minutes away installed two motion-activated trail cams along the wood's edge. They were brand new. Keep that in mind. Thinking maybe we would see something, we waited for nightfall. Later that evening, I went outside to feed our outdoor cats. That's when I heard it again, rustling. This time, not taking any chances, I ran inside and told everyone what I heard. They all piled by the back door and urged me to go out there and look. Reluctantly, I agreed. I took my flashlight and walked to the edge of the woods. Knowing that there was a trail cam covering this area, I figured if it got me, it would be on camera and my sacrifice wouldn't be for nothing. As I got to the wood's edge, I could still hear it rustling. I'm shaking at this point because I could tell it was maybe less than 15 yards in front of me. Everyone at the door was just watching me and could hear this thing. And then it was quiet. For a moment, it was gone, or so I thought. Just as I'm scanning with my flashlight, trying desperately to see a normal woodland creature so I can laugh this whole thing off, boom, 
Something fell out of a tree and hit the ground so hard that it shook the soil beneath my feet. It was so close that I was sure it was going to lunge out of the brush and snag me. I dropped my flashlight and ran the hundred yards back to the house in what felt like two seconds. I just kept screaming, Get in the house! Get the F in the house! as everyone was already scampering inside. They had heard and felt the thud too. Our neighbor Dave called my mother-in-law to ask what that loud crash was. For him to have heard it from well over 700 yards away is insane to me. Once the adrenaline died down, we realized that this happened right next to the trail cam. Problem solved, right? We got the evidence of this thing. The next morning, we checked the SD cards on the trail cam. Both of the cams had videos up until 11.47 p.m. The rest is corrupted. They were brand new trail cameras and brand new SD cards. We reset everything and set them back up. And to this day, we've still never encountered the creature again or caught anything on camera. My dad grew up on a forestry in Queensland, Australia, as the son of a forest ranger. My whole life, we've spent a lot of time out in that forest, camping and driving through parts of the forestry that only rangers would travel, and only occasionally. One place the dad loved to take us was a little farm in the middle of the pines that was impossible to find if you didn't know the way. Locals knew the place as Spike's Hut. Spike was a local farmer who had lived there for decades up until the 90s and had a reputation for being abrasive, violent, bigoted, and not concerned with the laws of men. He had a habit of approaching guys in bars who were wearing earrings and tearing them straight out. And there were a few stories about people who displeased him suddenly disappearing. Basically, Spike was not a nice guy and his farm and hut reflected that pretty well. Dad would take us out there every time we visited the forestry to camp, and the hut would be more and more dilapidated. But the vibe was always the same. That straight-up feeling of being watched, even though Spike was long gone. As I got older, I became more aware of the signs of life in the place when we went to visit. There would be 44-gallon drums full of smashed beer bottles, fire pits with reasonably fresh coals. Someone was definitely out there. God knows why, since the place was literally a snake pit at that point, but Dad didn't seem concerned. On a trip when I was a teenager, it got strange real quick. My friends and I were all piled into my Dad's 4x4, and we were driving through the bush to Spikes, so Dad could tell his scary Spike stories and freak us all out. We drove onto the property, and something immediately caught my eye. Up on the hill opposite Spike's hut, there was what appeared to be a cowboy, slumped against a log, hat over his face, taking a nap. Something about his body position looked unnatural, uncomfortable. It wasn't the way you'd be sat if you were taking a casual nap in the middle of a workday, and even if it was, there was no reason for anyone to be out there. The farm was long defunct, and there was no forest business to be taken care of on the property. I pointed it out to my dad, and instead of letting us get out of the car at Spikes, as he usually did, he said he wanted to keep driving through the farm to show us something. He maintained that it was nothing, but that if the figure was still there when we came back through, we would stop and check it out. Of course, whatever he wanted to show us seemed totally made up, as he just drove through the forest a bit. And when we came back, I spotted the slumped over cowboy again, never having moved an inch still in that same unnatural position. I yelled out to my dad to stop, reminding him of his promise, but instead he acted like he couldn't hear me, locked the truck doors, and drove off the farm much faster than he'd ever driven on those dirt back roads. My friends and I all looked at each other in confusion, but we knew that when it came to this area, questioning my dad was futile at best and dangerous at worst. Dad denied that any of the events of that day ever happened after that, but my friends and I were still curious as heck about what was going on out there. So, a few months later, we went camping on our own and set out to find Spike's hut. 
It took hours of driving through the forest to find the gate to Spike's property, but eventually we found it without Dad's help. Something was off once we got there, more so than usual. My mates jumped out of the car, but were suddenly frozen, not wanting to walk any closer to the hut for no visible reason. The vibe was just wrong that day, and it felt like we had walked into something that didn't belong to us. The tug in my gut was to get out, but I had spent two hours finding the place, and I was going to explore it. One of my friends acted brave and walked from the car to the hut with me, quietly acknowledging more and more signs of inhabitants with knowing nods between us. We said nothing to the others, but we were on high alert. It felt like somebody could be back at any minute, or that they had never left and were watching us as we poked around the debris. We walked up to the side of the hut to find a kind of small shed with three walls. I heard my friend's voice go squeaky as he called me over to look inside. On the ground was a huge pile of ashes from what looked like a cooking fire, and confirming this was the presence of a giant makeshift grill made from cross-hatched wire sitting over the fire, hinged to the shed wall. As I'm looking at this setup, I figure that whoever has been here has been hunting and cooking large chunks of their kill over the fire. Pretty clever, actually. But then my stomach dropped. As my eyes traveled down from the grill to the ground, I saw a baby's sock, tiny, pink, and terribly out of place. Then another, then a shirt, then a ribbon from a child's hair, all sitting right beside the ashes on the ground next to a women's weekly Christmas cookbook. That's when the alarm bells in my head went off. I rounded up my mates to get out of there. Some ranger or crazy old bushy hanging out at that trashed hut was one thing, but there was absolutely no reason for a baby to be out there. And there's no way that anything good had come from having children's clothes right by a huge fire and grill. When we got back to the campground, we couldn't shake the rotten feeling of being watched, and all of us were so unsettled that we packed up our stuff and decided not to stay the night. When I got home, I told my dad about it, but he just shook it off, saying that weird stuff happens out there all the time. Being young and dumb, I never thought to look up missing persons in the area in an attempt to explain either the cowboy or the kid's clothes, but I can tell you that I will never make the mistake of going out to Spikes without my father ever again. I was with my niece, who's on her high school soccer team, and is taking it pretty seriously, and attempting to get some kind of scholarship out of it. I'm pretty healthy, and I don't really work out too much, but something I often do is run and hike. I live in Kentucky, not in a rural part, but there's a state park near my house that's 6,500 acres, so it's pretty secluded and densely wooded. There are some really nice trails that allow you to run for a good chunk and then hike for a bit to split up the long bits of the trail that are flat. She decided to tag along with me today for a quick three to four mile run. It was raining, but nothing too heavy. Kind of a spitting rain. Nothing we can't handle. We got up to the peak of this one hill, and it had been about two miles or so, according to our phones. So we decided to turn back and head back to the car. As we were headed down the steep side of the climb, we were walking pretty slowly, just to make sure we didn't slip and lose our footing. When out of nowhere, there was the coldest chill that came from behind us once we made it about halfway down. At the time it happened, we both commented on how cold it was, but we didn't make too much out of it and just went on with our conversation. In these woods, there are some wildlife, like small deer and maybe some coyotes, but they tend to stay away from the paths. At least I have only heard them in my many years of coming here. Never once have I seen anything more than a few tracks. Once we got off the hillside and hit a stretch of the trail that was flatter ground, we began to pick up the pace when a deer darted across the path, maybe ten yards in front of us, causing us to stop in our tracks. 
The first deer was then followed by three more, and not one of them even so much as looked in our direction. My niece looked at me, puzzled because of the oddity of it. To me, they acted like they were running from something, a predator of some kind. Once they'd gone, we started back with our run, and we heard a noise behind us, a loud, booming noise of something of substance falling to the ground from some height. When we stopped and turned, we saw nothing. No animals scurrying away like one would expect after a substantial noise in the wilderness. In fact, everything was eerily calm. Just as we looked at each other to ask what the actual hell that was, there was yet another cold wind gush through the valley, pushing all the rain off the leaves surrounding us, soaking our sweatshirts. Internally, I started to freak out, but I was doing my best to stay calm for my 17-year-old niece, but I'm pretty sure she could tell that I was freaked out. I tell her, come on, let's get to the car, and we turn to take off again, and there was a man leaned up against a tree on the side of the trail dressed in a black suit with a white button-up shirt. His collar was open, but he had a tie on, sagging like a tired businessman on the way home from a long day. It startled me at first. I wasn't expecting to see anybody out there for a few reasons. One is that we were at the very least a mile away from any parking lot or street. Another being that we never heard or saw him coming. And the stretch of trail we were on was flat and open for a good half a mile. I got over to put myself between the man and my niece as we jogged past him. When we did, I looked him in the eye and gave him a how you do and nod as we went along. He was sort of pale. His eyes were very white, but his irises were ice blue. Everything that I saw from the quick look I got up close looked to be clean cut and proper. I didn't notice a speck of mud anywhere on him, and the two of us had it caked on the bottom of our shoes and even on the backs of our pants and shirts from kicking it up as we ran. We had to get to the top of another hill smaller than the last, but still quite the hike up. Once on top, I took a quick look behind us, and he had seemed to vanish without a trace. Now with having the vantage point of the hill, I could see out past the trail, and see most of the hill that she and I had just come from, and yet he was nowhere in sight. I scanned off the sides of the trail, and still nothing. My niece asked me who that guy was, and why he was out so deep in the woods wearing a suit questions I simply didn't have the answers to. We made it back to the car with nothing else out of the ordinary happening to us on the trail. As we came to my car, I pulled the keys from my pocket and unlocked the doors from maybe 10 feet out. Walking up to the only car in the entire lot, I noticed muddy footprints coming away from my car door from the driver's side. Weird, considering I had no mud on my shoes when we got there but there are trails leading up to the lot, so I figured maybe somebody came through before we got there and I just never noticed. However, when I pulled the handle to open the door, the handle was caked with mud underneath, almost like somebody was attempting to open my door with a muddy hand. Nothing more happened, but the entire encounter leaves chills covering my body the more I think about it. My mother and father divorced when I was eight. I lived with my father until late 1995. I was 13 when I moved in with my mother. But in 2002, I had a falling out with my stepfather and ended up moving in with my father. My father lived in the country while my mother lived in a small town. My father's home was surrounded by a forest with few neighbors situated on a hill. When I was a child, I used to walk through the woods so I knew them really well. In 2004, my father's home burned to the ground, and we left the area, moving into a small town and living in an apartment. I ended up in college studying film, and I was tasked with making a film, of course. I decided to shoot a short film about a serial killer stalking campers in the woods, because apparently I was really unoriginal at the time. 
so me and my two friends, Adam and Zach, were looking for locations. I figured the forest where I used to live would be perfect because it was in the middle of nowhere and there would be no sounds. So we did what you normally do, scout locations. One for the campsite and routes that the protagonist and antagonist would take through the forest. We arrived and were deep in the woods, as this time only one person still lived in the area, and he wasn't home, nor did he own all the land, so we stayed well clear of his land. As we were moving through the forest, trying to find the perfect clearing, all was quiet, which was startling, because though we were deep in the woods, the sounds of birds and bugs were kind of a normal thing. It was in the afternoon, so there really wasn't any reason for the forest to be silent. We came across a clearing that I knew well, but it was different. When I was a child, deep in the forest there was an old wooden structure. It was flat, and we called it the stage because that's what it looked like. It was in a clearing, right next to a tree line with a wide field that could fit hundreds of people there for a concert. Whether that's what it was, or it was something as simple as the floor of an old shack, I don't know. All I know was when I had gotten there, there was a camper, and someone built a pond right in the middle of the clearing. We decided that clearly somebody was using the space, so it would be best to find a different spot. We went to the tree line and descended down a steep hill to a creek. All the while, talking to ourselves about how weird the silence was. If you live in or around a forest, you hear wildlife all the time. The lack of it in such a dense area was strange. We crossed the creek and made our way through fallen trees and large rocks, until we found ourselves in a very wooded area. Adam had noticed first and pointed to a grouping of trees that made a perfect circle. Under the dead leaves lay stones, arranged in a circle, and in the center was broken bottles. I walked over to it and ended up tripping. I braced myself with my forearm and deeply cut it on a broken bottle. As I stood up, the silence was broken by a loud scream. It sounded human, female, but it was a scream. I turned to where I thought it came from, and beyond the trees, in the brush, I saw something red run off. We decided to head back. As we came back to the stage and pond area, a truck pulled up. The guy that was the only person living in the area ordered us into his truck to take us out of the area. He said that he owned all that area and that we were trespassing. He knew me, so he didn't give me a hard time or threaten me. He dropped us off, and I asked him how he had known we were there. I didn't, he said. I just heard some scream and thought some idiot fell in the pond. I ended up with stitches in my arm after going to the ER. I only have two plausible explanations for that scream. First is that we didn't know what was beyond the brush. It could have been a home and maybe kids were playing. While the scream was loud and I saw something bright red running, we could have startled someone. But the problem with that theory is that the guy who came in the truck heard it too. And we were far enough away from where he lived to where he would have a hard time hearing it. The only other one is that the scream had come from behind us and because of the trees, sound echoing made me think it was in front of us. This might account for how the guy had heard it too. His home is halfway to the stage area, which is why he was able to get there so fast. But that doesn't account for the red thing I saw, or what the scream was in the first place. And no, I don't think it was a fox or anything like that. I've spent enough time in the woods to know what those sound like. And the red that I saw wasn't like that of a fox. It was bright red, like dyed fabric. I still am completely unable to explain this. This story takes place in North Italy, back in 2014. It was early September. A friend of mine suggested that we take a short hike in the woods near his town, and obviously I agreed, since I love hiking in nature. We prepared our backpacks, grabbed some food, and drove out to the place. My friend knew the area very well, so we didn't take a map. 
We didn't have any flashlights either, since we had planned to return to the car in just a few hours. And in early September, daylight lasts a pretty long time. As we got deeper into the woods, we saw a lot of beautiful things. Rivers, a pair of caves that we explored. We had lunch and proceeded to follow a trail into a deeply wooded area. After around a half an hour, at that point we were about 50 minutes away from the car, we arrived to a pretty large clearing. In that clearing, there were four to five people, normally dressed. They were simply talking and laughing. No satanic cults or dreadful chants or praying in circles or anything like that. Just super ordinary people, like my friend and I, talking to each other. They obviously saw us too, since the clearing had no trees or rocks to cover the views and we couldn't avoid that. As we approached them, we just said, Hey there, what's up? They didn't answer back, and they just started to stare at us, without saying a single word. Obviously, this was a huge red flag. We stopped, too, and I looked over to my friend. He looked back at me, concerned. We again said, Hey! No answers. I've started to feel uneasy, so we decided to return back to the car. Soon after we moved back, though, we realized that they started to follow us. As we noticed that, we yelled, Hey, why are you following us? Did we do something wrong? Yeah, we were pretty young and dumb. In those kinds of situations, it's often the best thing to just run immediately out of there, but we thought we would try to be nice. No answer. Obviously, we proceeded to walk faster, and we tried to go off the trail. Another pretty dumb choice. But again, my friend knew the area well. But no matter what we did, they were always around, at about 15 meters distance. We started to panic, so we looked to each other again and agreed to get out of there as quickly as possible. As soon as we started running, we could hear behind us that they began running too. This obviously made us freak out even more. We did our best to put distance between us and them. Another thing that made me panic was, like I said, we were about 50 minutes away from the car. We were in a very isolated area, so I thought our situation was hopeless. At a certain point, when we were about halfway back, we started to notice that they weren't behind us anymore. We thought that maybe, and luckily, we had managed to lose them. The area, like I said, is pretty heavily wooded and has plenty of slopes, so it's easy to get lost if you're not used to it. Plus, we took an off-trail way that my friend knew. We hid behind a thick bush and tried to listen. Silence. No footsteps. No voices. Although, even when they were following us, they didn't say a single word. So, we took our breath and managed to return to the car, trying our best to be as silent as possible. We jumped in the car and raced the hell out of there. But it doesn't end there. As we left the woods on the main road, we saw coming from a secondary road another car behind us. They were following us again, and they surely never lost our tracks while we were returning to the car. We're very sure that they were the same people, because one, they were basically tailgating us, Two, the area is very rarely visited, and there were absolutely no cars in the parking lot except for my friends. And three, their car had no plates. We drove to my friend's town, avoiding going to his house, taking every country road, and every turn we made, they did as well. As we reached the town's ingress, they made a U-turn and returned back to the woods direction. We were fucking terrified, and we immediately called the police, and informed the people that were in the small town square as they approached us. My friend and I were basically crying as we got out of the car. We checked the area out, but no evidence of activity came up in the following hours. They never showed up anymore in the following days, but we became paranoid for some weeks to even get out of our houses. This is why I took a break from hiking for about four years. I have no idea who they were and why they acted like this but that experience nearly gave me PTSD. It's been completely terrifying, and it still affects me to this day.
When I was young, I attended the local scout group based in my village in Hampshire. The amount of things I learned from scouts and the lessons it taught me are innumerable, but one particular memory stands out. Once on a camp at an old scouting campsite, I remember we were playing a game at night, which was World War II themed. Our leader loved creating military themed games. In this game, each team had a bomb, which was just a colored string of wool, that they had to fix to the enemy base, a random piece of rope that was put up in the woods, making sure not to get caught by the enemy soldiers, which were just leaders with flashlights. As somewhat of a tactician, I departed from the other scouts who were heading straight down the main path toward the enemy base, and also toward the leaders, instead opting to flank around deep into the woods, which took longer, but proved to be more successful in the dark. Eventually, deep in the woods and on my way to another bombing run, I heard the distant sound of the whistle. This signaled that the game was over and that everybody should return to camp. I began making a leisurely stroll back through the darkness. I can't remember if I was alerted by sight or by sound, but my attention was drawn to a short silhouette walking through the woods about six to eight meters away. Assuming that this was one of the younger scouts who was also returning to camp, I decided it would be funny to try to scare them by making growling noises. Immediately after making the noises, the silhouette stopped dead in its tracks, turning toward me. In the darkness, I couldn't make out any of their clothes or features, but I could clearly see the blackout silhouette of a child. After the figure had clearly noticed me but not made a sound, I decided to carry on making this growling noise. But then the silhouette simply turned around and began to walk away from me. They were clearly unfazed by my attempt to scare them, so I figured that I would follow them back to camp. However, after a few steps, the figure literally face-planted into the ground, still about eight meters in front of me. I jogged a bit to catch up with them to make sure they were okay, but upon reaching where they were, there was no trace of anyone. Confused, I looked around for a short while, seeing if they had scrambled off, but there was no noise of someone running away, and I didn't notice them get up. They just vanished. Still in a state of confusion, I continued to walk back to the camp alone, and I didn't really tell anybody until years later when it clicked in my brain that things just didn't add up. Something else that sticks in my memory from that camp, which is probably unrelated but still strange, was that that part of the woods had been cut down and the ground heavily churned up by some sort of heavy-duty machine. Whilst exploring this area, some of my friends and I found an old leather briefcase that looked like it had been churned up by whatever machine had been in the area. Upon opening the briefcase, we found a really old scouting uniform with quite a few loose badges and some other personal items that I can't remember. I've always wondered if the boy and the briefcase were connected. I had an interesting experience while camping with my husband a couple of weeks ago. It was a nice drive in a campsite, a corner spot next to one of the other campsite and woods on the other three sides. We had a nice day hiking and cooked some fajitas and s'mores over the fire, and then we settled into our tent to sleep. Later that night, I woke up and heard a weird noise. It sounded kind of like an electronic tone, and then I heard what sounded like people talking right outside of the tent. They better get out of that tent. I saw a possum go in there. Thinking that there must be other campers walking around, I turned over and tried to go back to sleep. A couple minutes later, I heard a strange noise again, the same one, and then what sounded like a cat meowing and walking around the tent. It sounds like my cat when he wants to be let into the house. Now I'm not about to let strange animals into my tent, so I just laid there and it stopped after about a minute. A couple of minutes later I heard the tone once again, and then I heard a lower, gravelly voice talking outside the tent. They better get out of there, before I get them. All of this happened over the course of maybe ten minutes. I didn't react as strongly as I probably should have, 
but I was tired and thought at first that it might be some kind of dream. My husband got up and left the tent to use the bathroom a little while later. He hadn't heard anything, and I didn't hear anything else after that. The next morning, while eating breakfast, I could hear the neighboring campers talking. One of their children, about five to seven years old, was upset with his brother because they'd clearly heard somebody telling them to get out of the camper last night. He was arguing with his brother, who was vehemently denying that he had heard anything at all. I'm not sure what exactly happened that night, but it was interesting. This experience has left me feeling extremely shaken, and I would love some opinions, especially from somebody with experience. Last year, I had a very strange experience in a national forest out in California. I was by myself on a road trip with my dog, and I was driving pretty far into Mendocino National Forest. I like to camp in national parks and forests because it's isolated, so my dog can roam and they're free of charge a trade-off for sketchy and rough drives into the park sometimes, and a lack of service and assistance. Anyway, I was driving up this dirt road, kind of curling up a mountain, around maybe 5 p.m. It was very nice out, sunny and warm with a slight breeze. Nothing serious happened, but I felt extremely uncomfortable driving into the area, and that feeling did not let up. Driving up the mountain, I felt like I shouldn't stay there, and I even texted my boyfriend about it, for as long as I could, before my phone completely lost service. I was looking for a sign of another person having been around the area lately, but I didn't see anything. I pulled over and got out of my car with my dog to look over the edge, and I noticed a dead squirrel and some broken glass mixed in with the dirt and gravel road. Yucca, my dog, started to growl slightly. She is vocal, but I have almost only ever seen or heard her growl at or with other dogs. I did see her growl at a possum once, so it could be something she smelled, maybe. This place continued to make me feel quite on edge, but I pride myself on being an independent traveler and backpacker, so I decided to continue at least a bit further with my grumbling pup to see if I could find a good place to camp. I continue to notice more and more dead animals. Keep in mind, no one's going to be driving more than 5 to 10 miles per hour up this thing, and that's if there's even anybody out there. I hear men's voices. They sound close, and I think that I should call out to them, so I stop my car. But then I kind of freeze up and feel like I shouldn't. I can't really make out what they're saying. I don't see any sign of people anywhere. I get back in my car and continue to slowly drive forward and cautiously look for where the voices could be coming from. I've never run into other people in a national park or forest when I've gone in this deep. The unsettling feeling grows about these voices, which have sort of come and gone a few times, and I give up and begin to turn my car around. I honestly don't even remember how Yucca was acting on the way down. I was scared and focused on getting out of there. I just distinctly remember being surprised at her grumbling when we were standing outside of my car. A bit dangerously fast for the road, I went back down the mountain not seeing any sign of anybody. I decided to spring for luxury and get a hotel for the night. I figured I was just fine. Huge and open spaces can be intimidating, I told myself, and the voices could have been echoing from somewhere far off and they just sounded close. Animals die glass gets broken. Nothing happened. Cool. But I remember this place. It sticks with me. Whenever I'm watching scary movies, if I'm walking my dog in the woods at night, nothing compares to the feeling I had driving up that mountain. And it's honestly kind of interesting to me, as well as frightening. I recently happened across some information, as well as some Native American lore, that made me feel extremely uneasy. Fast forward a year, I have mentioned this place to a few people and the haunting vibes that it gave me, but nothing much more. I googled the national park ones and didn't see anything, but I didn't look much either. I like scary movies and things of that nature, 
hence my fascination with this little event. So my boyfriend and I were coming up on finishing our road trip just yesterday. We were in Wyoming for a wedding. There were only two to three hours left, and the sun had set, so we decided to listen to some scary podcasts and YouTube videos. We went from the No Sleep podcast to the X-Files and ended up on a true story video dealing with Native American lore. I'm half paying attention, petting my dog, playing Pokemon on an emulator. And I hear the narrator mention Wendigos. Very briefly says what they are, and casually mentions that they can mimic voices. I mean it when I say the most horrible chills I've ever had in my life crawled down my spine. I stare at my boyfriend and I ask him if he remembers that national forest that I was freaked out about last year. He says he does, and he reminds me that he texted me that I was probably close to a Wendigo. I remember him saying that, but I didn't know much about their lore, and I thought he was just being funny. Like, haha, yeah, Bigfoot is stalking you, or some other dad joke. And he was like, no, I mean, I was mostly joking, but I said it specifically because you said you were hearing voices that you could find no trace of. I started to feel super strange, and I began googling Wendigos and things like that. They are allegedly able to mimic human voices, and they would live in that sort of area. It all matched up. Obviously, there's a ton of questionable information out there, but I tried to find more reputable websites and authentic experiences. I then specifically looked up missing persons in the area, and the first headline that catches my eye is another family goes missing in Mendocino. I went through different websites and news articles of people going missing, but they're all a little bit hidden underneath national park websites and pictures of trees. I remembered looking up the forest about a year ago, but I didn't see anything, and I realized that these stories didn't seem to be talked about very much, which also piqued my intuition and interest. It was stated that well over 100 people in the past eight years have gone missing and not been found out there, on top of the many which are found dead. It just has my interest super spiked, remembering how unsafe I felt, how badly I wanted to get out of there, terrifies me. And I felt so uneasy about what I was hearing, and I do to this day. My dog and I are very close. She was a stray that started following one day, and I ended up bringing her home from Costa Rica, so her little growls along the way make me feel like there was something wrong. Even though it was just a storytelling video, these stories originate from somewhere, right? This is a collection of my experiences revolving around the Blue Ridge Parkway. From the summer of 2002 until early 2004, I lived in a small town outside of Asheville, North Carolina. There wasn't much to do in the area on a Friday or Saturday night, other than hang out with friends at the movies, go to the bar or pool hall, or, in our case, the scenic overlooks on the Blue Ridge Parkway. My group of friends go to meeting spot was one of the two overlooks off of the Blue Ridge Parkway. We would jump on the parkway off of the Tunnel Road, US 70, and drive about three miles north to the Hawk Creek Overlook, park our cars, and depending on the weather, sit outside and just talk the night away. It may sound boring, but those nights were some of the best of my life, filled with laughter and pure joy. It's where we went to decompress from our early 20s, stress-filled days. We would usually meet up there any time between 9 to 11 p.m. and not depart until well past 2 a.m., often ending our nights at the nearby Waffle House. Depending on the time of year, the Overlook would get busy with other groups of friends doing the same as us. Romantic dates, nature enthusiasts either camping out in their cars or returning from or embarking on hikes. On certain occasions, Hawk Creek Overlook would be too crowded for our liking, so we would just proceed to the next overlook, which was Tanbark Ridge. That was almost always nearly empty. 
It was in these areas that my friends and I experienced truly paranormal and possibly demonic experiences. On most nights, they would come and go without any of the normal events to speak about. That slowly changed. On certain nights, there could be as many as six of us hanging out on the overlook, other nights only two. On one particular night, and the first Blue Ridge Parkway experience that I can recall, we were standing and talking near the back of my car while we smoked a cigarette, facing the road, the parkway. We were the only car at the second overlook, Tanbark. When we weren't talking with each other, it would get quieter than quiet up there. The whole night we kept hearing what sounded like conversations or voices coming from the side of the mountain across from where we gathered. It wasn't uncommon for there to be night hikers or campers in the area, but these voices were not coming from an area that was known for trails or camping. As we were standing near the back of my car, we all heard the voices, louder than before this time. At first it was from our left, then immediately from our right, and then finally straight in front of us. The voices, although rather loud, were unintelligible. We couldn't make out what they were saying. It was almost like gibberish or some kind of made-up language. We were all expecting to see someone by how close in proximity the voices were, but there was nobody around us. No car had even passed the overlook for a while. We wrote it off as having to be hikers conversing somewhere on the mountain, and their voices somehow carrying or being projected through the woods in some weird acoustical thing. For weeks after, we told the story to our other friends and co-workers, who would all share similar accounts with us. That was the start of many more strange and sinister occurrences. Simultaneously with the strange events that I experienced on the Blue Ridge Parkway, my family and I were also experiencing paranormal activity at the house we were renting in Swannanoa. I wondered at the time if the occurrences were related in any way, which as time went on and more events happened, I don't think they were connected at all. The night that I believe triggered a string of events was a Saturday after work. Before heading to the first overlook, I stopped and picked up my friend, and we proceeded to get on the Blue Ridge Parkway. About halfway up from the entrance to the Blue Ridge Parkway and on the first overlook, we noticed a pickup truck three quarters of the way into the woods, off of the road, with only its interior dome light on, and a man returning to the truck with a shovel in his hand. My friend and I instantly got creeped out by this peculiar sight, and half-jokingly both said that the guy was probably hiding a body. Later that night, when we were leaving the Blue Ridge Parkway, I drove past that exact spot where we had seen the truck and the man earlier. I nearly drove off the road, as my dome light in my car turned on and nearly blinded me. It's dark on the Blue Ridge Parkway, no lights at all. Almost gave me a heart attack. The light was on for maybe a second or two, and then it shut off. I'm generally a level-headed and rational person, but at that moment, I was shook. My friend was equally in shock, and we both calmed ourselves down. When we got to his house, we sat in his driveway and tried to make sense of it. That light only turns on if you open a door. We did not open a door. That light had never once turned on for any other reason before that. After I dropped off my friend, I had to drive under the Blue Ridge Parkway bridge on my way back home. As I passed under the bridge, my light again turned on. But this time, it flickered a few times and then stayed off. In my opinion, this was now past the point of coincidence. That was not the last time that my light went off in my truck, for a span of a few months. Not every time, but almost the light would come on or flicker near that spot on the Blue Ridge Parkway where we saw the man and his truck. One of my friends who was driving behind me one night saw the light go off from her car and it scared her so badly that she did not return to the Blue Ridge Parkway at night anymore. On one night, three of us gathered at the first overlook. It had rained a lot the day before and that morning. On the opposite side of the overlook, there was a sheer rock wall that ascended about a hundred feet. There was enough moonlight to see the water trickling down the rock wall. It was my friend that was riding with me when we saw the man, 
that noticed that the water coming down the rock wall appeared to resemble a person's head, tilted sideways. I agreed, and so did our other friend. But as more water ran down, it looked like it formed a rope around the person's neck. And as time went on, more water rolled down, and the person resembled a girl. It was almost too clear, like somebody was purposefully creating this effect. We started to concoct ideas that perhaps that man did do something bad in those woods, and maybe the light flickering and the water on the rocks was a calling of sorts. I had disabled the light in my truck from going off. It still went off a handful of times after that, which should have been impossible. But the cherry on top of it all was on the night that I was the last one of my friends to leave the Overlook. As I drove down to leave the Blue Ridge Parkway, again near that spot, my front driver's side tire blew out. I pulled over on the shoulder of the road and tried to call one of my friends, but I didn't have cell reception. If it wasn't that I had to be at work in the morning, I probably would have just slept in my car until there was light, but that was not an option. I proceeded to get out and change my tire in the pitch black night. I felt so vulnerable. And although nothing happened, I felt as if I wasn't alone. I felt that at any moment, something, I don't know what, would occur to scare the living shit out of me. But nothing did. Until I got back in my car and started pulling back onto the road. At that moment, my light again flickered. And I swear I instantly felt my right side of my body get about 30 degrees colder. The next day, my friend and I called in anonymously to the Asheville PD and reported what we had seen in the woods, the truck, and the man. Obviously, we did not mention any of the paranormal events that had occurred after that. We felt as if we had to say something, but for the longest time we weren't sure what or how to. We hadn't heard of any disappearances or murders in the area. But then again, in my early 20s, I wasn't an avid reader of the paper or watcher of the local news. These events all happened around spring to late fall. We stuck to the bars and pool halls for months after those events, until early the following year. We finally decided to venture back to the Blue Ridge Parkway more frequently. My friend and I, the same friend, were starting a new band, and the Blue Ridge Parkway was a great place to collaborate and write songs. One night, and my last night ever spent on the Blue Ridge Parkway, we took up an acoustic guitar to help finish writing a song. That night, both overlooks were crowded, so we drove to this little cut right off the road, just past the first overlook. We settled there and propped open the tailgate of my GMC Jimmy. We were up there for a couple of hours, probably around 1 to 2 in the morning at this point, when we start hearing straight up laughing coming from the woods and the tree line close to the car. We stopped what we were doing and just froze and listened. The laughing stopped, and we heard what sounded like a hoarse snarl, followed by a whisper. We heard a laugh again, and finally, we hear somebody go, Psst. We immediately closed my tailgate, jumped in the car, and drove down to the first overlook. At this point, it had cleared out, and there were no other cars there. I pulled into the overlook with my car still facing the road not pulled into a parking spot. We had no idea what those sounds that we had just heard were or what they'd come from. It just didn't make any sense. At the overlook, my friend got out of the car to relieve himself. We both lit a cigarette and decided to head back to the car as it started to rain a little bit. Just before we got back, we heard what sounded like a gallop or horse hooves getting louder from the area we'd just left. I had a sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach and I had an overwhelming feeling to just get the fuck out of there, and so did my friend. Without saying anything to each other, we ran and jumped into my car to leave. As I turned over the key and started the car, I happened to look back, and that's when I saw an image that to this day I will never forget. I saw what looked like a tall, goat-like man. I distinctly saw horns as it began to run full speed toward the car. I didn't look back again, and I drove like a bat out of hell from that area. My friend didn't look back, but he heard the galloping getting louder and closed his eyes. Neither one of us has ever returned to that area at night again. 
I moved away from North Carolina in 2004. My friend still lives in the area. However, to this day, he does not go up onto the Blue Ridge Parkway at night. He only visits during the day. When we get together, we can't help but talk about all the shit we saw and experienced during that time. We always talk about one day returning to that area at night again. Even though we're scared to death, the curiosity of the unknown draws me. And we both have questioned why those things occurred to us. And we want answers. It was Labor Day of 2015. My mother, my wife, and my three children and I went to a very remote cabin that we rented out. It was an old fire watchman station or something of the sort, so it had the cabin and three other sheds and shops. I'll try to keep this short now, but it's a bizarre story. We unpacked, settled into the cabin, and then decided to walk a couple hundred yards down to the river, barefoot and sandals with shorts for all of us. We got down to the pebbled shore and were playing and throwing rocks, etc. When I realized that there were one foot long snakes everywhere, my wife, my mom and I yanked up the three kids and boogied off. After reaching a safe distance from them, I went back with a water bottle and caught one in it to see what it was. Turns out we were in a nest of diamondback rattlesnakes. If one of those things had latched onto one of my kids, they surely would have died. We were about three hours away from any medical facility. We got back to the cabin and my mom and I went for a hike and a walk alone, while my wife calmed the kiddos and fed them lunch. Upon returning about 15 minutes later, all three of my kids and my wife were inside with the doors and windows all closed up, even though we had had everything open to cool the place off. We went inside to hear all four of them yelling about a bear that was about 150 yards from the cabin puffing and puffing at the wife and kids on the front porch and eating. It was down by the river, another 30 yards or so down the hill, that he poked his head up and over from. A few hours go by, and in that amount of time, an ATV passes by three times, with two inbred-looking freaks on it. Each time they stopped in front of the gate onto the property and stared at us, or the cabin. Keep in mind that we're two hours into the wilderness in Idaho, with no sight of a person the entire trip except for them. We decide it's bedtime for the kiddos as it's pitch blackout. Within ten minutes, our son, who was five at the time, went from being perfectly fine and active and talkative to having a fever of 103 degrees, slightly foaming at the mouth, and then being completely unresponsive. That was it. We were leaving immediately and going to seek medical attention. I opened the front door to the cabin to start loading the two cars by the light of one porch bulb and the headlights on the cars, which were both parked facing the gate. And that's when all three of us adults heard about four to six large and heavy animals running all around the cabin and the property. There was one on the right side of the house when exiting that I could hear pacing back and forth and breathing heavily. I made everybody stay inside and close the doors every time I went out to transfer stuff to the cars, about four or five trips of this. I had a stick and a big pot that I was smacking as hard and as loudly as I could on each trip, and I was yelling loudly at random. As soon as I'm done loading, I take each kid out individually and load them up between the two cars. Then I escort my mom and my wife out. My wife and I were in the lead car, so we pulled up out of the gate and for some stupid reason or another, I felt that I needed to close the gate. So I got out of my vehicle and walked behind it in my mom's car about 15 feet, and I closed the gate. Now, this gate was literally a log that slid from one post to the other. It offered zero protection or barrier between me and whatever was out there. Right as I went to turn around, I heard loud padded footsteps walking up to me, directly in front of me, no more than 10 feet. And then, I see eyes shimmering from the moonlight as the deepest, scariest growl I've ever heard in my life emanated. I turned and ran so fast 
that I swear I must have jumped from where I was to the driver's seat. I landed in the seat and slammed it into drive and spun out, finally leaving. But it gets weirder and scarier. About 15 minutes down the road, we were still panicking about our unresponsive son, and we both kept having this horrible, evil doom feeling, like a shadow was cast over us. I looked down, and I realized that I still had that baby rattlesnake in the water bottle in my cup holder. So I grabbed it and threw it out the window immediately. Not even two minutes later, we hear our son softly crying. We realize he's responsive, and he stated something along the lines of, Why are we leaving? What's going on? He was crying because he didn't want to leave. He couldn't remember the last hour or so. Quick backstory for what's next. My mother was about 58 years old at the time. She's been a Jehovah's Witness my entire life, plus many more years before that. And she's the last person in the world to believe in signs or evil spirits or omens or anything of the sort. The next day, my mom completely broke down, sobbing her eyes out, hardly able to talk. She confessed to my wife that the night before we left, she had a nightmare in which we went on the camping trip. We came across snakes, a bear, and a pack of wolves. She said she knew a lot of bad things happened at that outpost and that it was full of evil. Most of all, she said, In my dream, one of your kids died. I swear on my life to this very day, if I ask her who died and how it happened, she immediately starts crying and refuses to tell me or anyone. She lives her whole life now with the guilt that she willingly ignored this nightmare and feels like she put us into that danger, nearly taking one of her grandkids away from the world. She doesn't deserve to feel like that. I know this sounds crazy as hell, but a week later, on the local news, there were reports of a wolf pack in the area. Wolves and bears may not coexist in harmony, but as far as I know, they do share territories and respect each other. This outpost station of sorts was about an hour and a half into the wilderness from Loman, Banks, Idaho area. If you want to verify the animals actually exist around there, go for it. Sadly, I grew up in the mountains for most of my pre and early teen years, as did my wife until she was 10 years old. I even have a half sleeve of the wilderness and trees on my left arm, but with that said, we don't care to go to the mountains anymore. I don't care if you believe me or not. This was and is real to my family, and it did happen to us. That night changed a lot of things going forward. My husband and I really enjoy outdoor sports, especially camping. We sometimes go camping in forbidden zones, too, but we really do take care of the place that we're staying, cleaning up our mess and such. This was one of those times when we went camping in a forbidden zone that we now call the Fairy Forest. This forest is owned by a family that did a hell of a good job at decorating the place. Figures of fairies, elves, and angels were scattered around the brown fall leaves, on branches and rocks, Dream catchers and other small handmade artifacts, presumably made by children, were also hanging around the place. There were also little tables and chairs designed for the fairies, and info tables explaining about the fairies and elves. It was truly a fairy tale. There was one problem, though. Some douchebags threw things and broke some of the decorations. So we put them back up and mended what we could, and then we walked along. We then set up our tent, cooked some food, enjoyed our drinks, and just chilled before going to bed. I woke up to three or four lights hovering over me at night. I wasn't scared. I was just surprised. I didn't want to open my eyes. I felt like if I did, they would disappear. I wanted to prolong the experience as much as I could, but soon I drifted back to sleep. The morning sun penetrating through our tent woke us up. As we poured our morning coffee, I casually told my husband that I perceived lights hovering over us at night. He paused for a second and said, I saw them too. We got into a heated discussion as to what they could be, 
No, our overhead lamp could not have malfunctioned, because the lights were moving, almost swimming in the air, if you will. No, they could not have been people shining flashlights at us. We didn't hear any footsteps, and the source of the lights was directly above our tent, like right above us. They were like balls of light or orbs, and not like rays. No, they could not have been airplane lights or any other street light, because again, the lights we saw were moving. We believe that they were fairies, possibly thanking us for cleaning up the mess. We still go there from time to time just to drink coffee, but we haven't camped there since. I sense this amazing feeling each time I go there. The forest melts away my problems and gives me a content feeling, almost like it's telling me that everything is going to be okay. This is one of the most magical and unbelievable experiences I've ever had. A few years back, I went to an outdoor electronic music festival and was riding a natural high. No drugs, other than a little bit of pot, so a drug. The first night, at around midnight, the party is starting to amp up. I'm really into the music and I'm connecting with the DJ like there's no tomorrow. We're making almost constant eye contact and it's obvious he's aware of how deeply I'm appreciating the music. As the set goes on, we're connecting more and more. I know he can tell that I'm fully involved and giving my all to everything around me. Finally, he motions with his hand for me to turn around. I whip my head around to look behind me for one second, and when I turn it back, my jaw is dropped and I'm absolutely stunned. For the second that I looked back, I saw several brilliantly blue humanoid glowing beings walking intensely and purposefully through the forest. I just stood there in stupefied amazement, staring at the DJ with my mouth hanging open. As he looked back at me, he slowly and knowingly nodded his head. The beings looked exactly like the ones depicted in the movie Knowing. Note that I hadn't seen that movie yet when I experienced this though. They looked like humans, without the hair, but they glow with a brilliant blue, almost white light, and you can see through them. I told one of my friends about the experience, and he said that they're called the Devas, and that he is another friend who's seen them too. So when I was like seven or eight, we used to live in Webster, Wisconsin, and we lived in a house a little bit wider and longer than a trailer house. No upstairs, just the base floor and a basement. It was a beautiful house with a big area that was just woods. One day, my cousin was supposed to be watching my two sisters and I, and he said that we could all go play outside as long as we stayed in his sight. But within five minutes, he ran into the woods and told us to keep up. Of course, we listened to him, so we ran after him, and he disappeared. We couldn't see the house or even the tree line where the woods stopped. We were lost and started freaking out and crying. Then about a half an hour later, a really tall Native American chief came up behind us and asked us what was wrong and why we were crying. He asked if we were okay and if we were lost. I told him how we were chasing my cousin and we lost him and we didn't know how to get back home. He smiles and says, Don't worry, sweetheart. I'll make sure you get home safe and sound. Just come to my village and rest for a little bit. Eat some lunch. Play with the children. And when you're ready, you can explain to me where you live. I said, Okay. So we go back to his village and it's a smaller one in the middle of the woods in a clearing. But it had at least 60 people. We ate some stew or something like that, and he had me draw in the dirt the road and our house. He smiled and said, I know exactly where you live, but if you want to play for a little bit, that's okay. I do want to get you home before dark, though. There are a lot of dangers in these woods, like bears, coyotes, bobcats. Not good for children to be out. 
So he took us home. He never left the edge of the woods. My mom came out crying, asking where we were, saying that she was about to call the cops. Apparently we'd been missing for about four or five hours. She asked us why we left the house without Scotty, my cousin. And I said, we didn't. He was with us. He ran into the woods and left us behind, and we tried to call for him, but he was gone. That's when he came outside and said that he had never left the house. He thought we were in our rooms. So I told my mom what happened, and she said, we'll figure it out tomorrow. The next day, we went and followed our footprints and found the village, or what used to be a village. There was nothing there. What had been a gorgeous place was now ash. It had all been burned down. The grass, which was shorter the day before, now stood taller than me, and it looked like it had been burned down and left vacant for hundreds of years. We called out for them, but got no response. We found the chief's headdress and a doll made of deer hide and some other kind of cloth. As we were about to head back, I found a huge eagle feather the size of my arm. It was the most amazing paranormal experience I've ever had. I don't know if he was a guardian angel or what, but I'm really glad I got to meet him. So this is something that I've kept to myself for two years now, and every time I think about it, the hair all over my body stands up. Here's some context. My girlfriend and I really like to try and find new hikes in western Colorado. We decided to try a new trail that was not on the National Monument and was a pretty far way away from any other trail. It was a good deal of the way out of town as well. Anyway. We were one of the only cars parked at the trailhead, and as we were walking, it quickly got dark. We made it all the way until the moon rose, and I stopped to hug my girlfriend and have a romantic moment. All of a sudden, farther down the trail, at least a few miles, we hear automatic gunfire. It was just pop, pop, pop. Then silence for a couple of seconds. And then pop, pop, pop. Now, this kind of thing is normal for my area. Even though it was not public land, I knew a lot of buddies who would know of many forgotten trails to shoot on and not get caught at. My girlfriend asked me if I thought that those were gunshots, and I told her that I couldn't think of anything else it would be in the middle of the wilderness. We decided it would be best to turn back. We were about two miles down the trail at this point, at the top of a very large hill covered in desert shrubs. As soon as we stopped talking, we realized that something was wrong. All of the insects had stopped chirping. There had been dozens of crickets the entire hike up. All of the sounds of nature completely stopped. My girlfriend was facing farther down the trail and I was facing back the way that we'd come, ready to turn back. She looks behind me and then screams and starts to run. I was already scared shitless, but I figured the worst it could be is some drunk redneck about to give us some trouble. I turned and looked where she was looking, and then I immediately ran after her. I've never run so fast in my life. The shrubs were about two to three feet high in varying spots, and when I turned around, I don't know how to describe it, but it looked like a shadow, even with the moonlight directly shining on it. It was almost an absence of light. It was already slowly standing up when I turned around. As soon as it fully rose up, I realized that I was looking up at it, and this thing had to be at least a foot taller than me. I'm six foot three. It looked very much like skin and bones, but it wasn't human. We sprinted back to my car with nature silent the whole way. I was in such a hurry when we ran to my car, and my girlfriend and I were both so scared that neither of us noticed I hadn't had to take out my keys to unlock the car. I didn't take them out until I was in the car. We were halfway through the drive home when we realized that every single hair on my body was raised, and if I'm being honest, 
I've never felt anything like I did when I saw that thing. Every fiber of my being screamed, run, and I was simultaneously almost paralyzed by the fear that washed over me. Does anybody have any idea what this could have been? This happened a while ago, somewhere near the end of seventh grade. My aunt, my brother, my cousin, and I were visiting our grandparents' house in Washington. They lived in a pretty remote area, with only a handful of other houses around, and a good chunk of forest between each of them. Keep in mind, it's also kind of an island, so they don't get many funky creatures there. My aunt and I went out while it was dark outside, just walking the path in the forest and trying to figure out what was making this loud noise. Not a weird one, just a normal forest sound. I said it was frogs. She said it was crickets. I was right. Anywho, we pass a pond area and make our way to a clearing. I'm not really sure if this is relevant, but the clearing was a little bit small, with an apple tree in the middle. That's where my brother and cousin and I would hang out whenever we were outside. When we reached the clearing, I started to immediately get this really bad feeling. I figured, you know, it's dark, I'm typically terrified of the dark, and I'm tired, but nothing's really going to happen. The path was a little bit overgrown around there, so we decided to turn back. Right before we did, though, I caught a glimpse of what could have been a really big owl up in one of the trees, just staring at us. Now, I'm an Arizona girl, so I don't know what creatures are normal in the forest, but this thing just didn't feel right to me. It just gave me a weird vibe. But my aunt kept walking and I caught up. Keep in mind, the path was pretty short, and it only takes about 10 minutes to get to the clearing and 10 minutes to walk back. But when we got closer to the house, we heard my grandma yelling for us. We run back to the house and she says that we've been gone for hours. We swear we'd only been gone for a half an hour at most, and when my brother and cousin come back, they tell us that they'd been out looking for us. We check the time, and they're right. Another interesting thing that could be connected. A few days before that, we heard some really weird noises coming from the woods while we were out making s'mores. Even my grandparents, who have lived there longer than I've been alive, admitted that it was unlike anything they'd ever heard before. It continued getting closer and closer, and stopped any time somebody would try to get a video of it. Eventually, I had to go inside because all of this was freaking me out so badly. I guess it's not all that interesting, but it was really creepy. Everything else in the story could probably be explained, but the time loss thing really haunts me. Where I live, we've had relatively few cases during the pandemic. There were almost none back in the fall. Because of that, although we were still living under certain restrictions, we had more public health sanctioned freedoms than many other places. For example, at the time we were permitted to share our social bubble with one other household and travel within our region. My family and our fellow bubble family decided to take advantage of this by going on a fall getaway. We rented two side-by-side -side cabins in a beautiful waterfront wooded area and had a lovely relaxing weekend. Although there were other cabins nearby, most were unoccupied and we saw no other people, although we did hear a dog barking a few times somewhere not far off. On our final night there, my son decided to sleep in the other cabin with his bubble siblings, quote unquote. Around 11 p.m., he called over asking for some forgotten thing. It was a very dark night and there were certainly no streetlights in the deeply wooded cabin area. So I grabbed my flashlight and we walked the short distance to the neighboring cabin to deliver whatever it was that he needed. On the walk back, I heard a whistle. It was a very human sounding whistle, exactly the kind of whistle one makes to call in a dog. 
It sounded very close, but shining my light around, I saw nobody. I heard it again, and assumed that somebody was whistling for the dog we'd heard earlier, so I didn't think much of it. A short time later, another call came from next door. My son couldn't settle and wanted to come back to our cabin. This time, my husband and I both walked over, collected our child and his things, said goodnight to our bubble family, and walked back. We heard the same whistle again, several times. It seemed to be on the dirt road ahead of us, gradually moving away. My husband commented that the dog must have gotten loose, and the owner was out looking for it. Inside our cabin, we continued to hear the whistling, coming at irregular intervals of maybe two to four minutes. At first, it would be loud and seemed quite nearby, and then it would gradually grow fainter, then stop, as though the whistler had moved out of earshot. Then it would seem to circle around, coming from the other direction, getting louder as it moved past our cabin, then fading again into the distance, and then it would start all over. Still not thinking much of it, my husband climbed into the loft to go to sleep while I started to pack for the trip home the next day. Our son was sleeping in a little room on the main floor to the left of the front door, and the small window in his room was cracked open to let in the unseasonably warm night air. I was standing by that window, quietly gathering his scattered things, while the whistle once again drew closer. But this time, instead of fading as it passed by, the next one was very close and incredibly loud, as though the whistler was just outside my son's window. The blind was down, but I was sure that somebody was on the porch, right outside. I leapt to the front door, flung it open, and threw on the porch light, ready to tell off some prankster on our doorstep. Nobody was there. I grabbed my flashlight and took a few steps out past the circle of light, then thought better of it and retreated inside. I locked up the cabin, closed and latched all of the windows and lowered all of the blinds. If someone was creeping around outside our cabin, I didn't want them looking in at us from the darkness. Deciding that I did not want to leave my sleeping son downstairs by himself, I settled on the sofa with a book. The whistles continued. Between each one, I would convince myself that it was just a bird or an animal only to hear it again and be certain that it could only be a human sound. The irregularity of it and the slight variations in pitch and tone also told me that this wasn't something mechanical or electrical or automated. Around 1.30 a.m., my husband suddenly got up and started to get dressed. I asked him what he was doing. I'm gonna find out whoever that is and ask them why they've been whistling for hours, he said. I was horrified. My husband's a pretty big guy, and I was as curious as he was, but I also felt, deep in my bones, that it would not be safe for him to go outside that night. I begged him and insisted that he go back to bed, and thankfully, he did. I sat vigil, listening to the intermittent whistles, for at least another hour, until finally I dozed off on the sofa. When I awoke, it was morning. The sun was peeking around the blinds and the whistling had stopped. I cautiously peered outside, half expecting to see some sort of evidence of a nighttime intruder, but there was none. A little while later, we wandered next door, coffee mugs in hand, to get our friend's take on the mystery whistler. Amazingly, they had not heard a thing, despite the fact that the sound was so clearly audible in our cabin and would have had to have passed right by them. We couldn't understand how they hadn't heard it. At checkout, I asked the woman at the kiosk down the road about it, but she just looked at me strangely and said she didn't know what it could have been. When I got home, I searched for audios of bird calls common to the area, and then ones not common to the area, in the hope of finding that same whistle. Nothing I found was even close, and we still don't know what we heard that night, circling for hours and stopping just outside our cabin door. I grew up in the Arctic. In the town I lived in, as long as it was a clear night, 
It was an extremely normal occurrence to see all sorts of strange lights move across the sky. Keep in mind, the winter is long in the Arctic, which means longer amounts of time spent under the stars. It's quite beautiful, as long as you don't mind the cold so much. Sometimes I would drive a snowmobile a few kilometers out of town, shut it down, and just lay down on the snow looking up at the majesty of it all. The only thing disturbing the silence being the occasional breeze. The northern lights are also a common occurrence. Doesn't happen every day, but often enough that they start getting ignored after a while, as long as they aren't too spectacular anyway. On one particular night, without asking my parents, it was their snowmobile, I decided to go on one of my midnight drives out of town. I drove a few kilometers over the hills to find a spot devoid of light pollution from town, shut off the machine, and settled into a good spot to look up and be introspective. It wasn't all that interesting a scene. A few satellites passing here and there, some relatively boring activity affecting the magnetic field and so on. And then I started noticing a clicking noise. At first, I thought it was the sound of the snow machine cooling down, as the engine expands and contracts a lot in the cold. But the source of the sound definitely wasn't coming from that direction. My next thought was that there must be an animal nearby, in which case I need to get out of there fast. You don't really want to be messing around with wild animals, especially in the Arctic. But the clicking is far too regular for an animal to produce it. It was fairly mechanical sounding. And again, the source of the sound isn't coming from anywhere around me, not laterally anyway. It was coming from above me. So naturally I look up, determined to ascertain the origin of this strange noise. I see what I always see. Stars, northern lights, a lazy satellite crossing the sky. All normal stuff. But before I dismiss it altogether and begin heading home, I noticed something strange in the Aurora Borealis. There were three rather strong points of light. I ignored them at first, thinking that they were just oddly symmetrical stars, but this proved to be false. They were definitely getting brighter. I kept staring in morbid fascination as they grew stronger and stronger yet still only remaining single points in the sky. All the while, the clicking noise is getting louder and louder and more pronounced, almost like someone started with tapping a pen on a desk to clacking billiard balls together inside my head. Then it stops. The lights are gone, the clicking isn't heard, and aside from being a little stiff, cold, and rather petrified, so I jump back on the snowmobile, thinking maybe I'm going crazy. The machine takes a little longer than usual to start up, and I'm beginning to worry, but soon it's running and I'm heading back to town. As I'm driving back, several plausible scenarios as to what occurred are running through my head. I'm thinking it could have been a helicopter from the mine, or some strange northern lights behavior. Probably not that big of a deal, right? I pull up to my house. The lights are all dark. Strange. It wasn't that late when I left. I open the outer door as quietly as possible, remove my winter gear, and enter the inner door. The house is quiet. Really quiet. My parents are teachers and are usually up late marking or watching TV. All I'm thinking is I have to get to bed without anybody noticing. Proves to be easy, and I'm soon under my covers. I go to set my alarm for the next day, and all of a sudden, everything makes sense. The engine was hard to start. I was really stiff. It was rather chilly. Nobody up when I was gone what felt like a relatively short period of time. It was almost 11 p.m. when I left. And now, it was creeping up on 6 a.m. I stood, staring at clicking lights, for almost seven hours. I never ended up sleeping that night, and I don't go on late snow machine rides anymore. This story takes place in August of 2013 in the mountains of Southern Oregon. I'm a U.S. Air Force Security Forces Airman, 
military policeman. My girlfriend was at work, and as a swelteringly hot day began to turn into thunderstorms, my buddy Nick, another military cop, and I decided to go explore some back roads and get out of the heat in town. Southern Oregon is crisscrossed with logging roads, some actively used and many totally forgotten and grown over. Nick and I spent many of our days off starting on roads that we knew, finding roads that we didn't know, driving for hours into the mountains, and eventually navigating back to paved roads. On this particular day, with storm clouds building over the mountains, we set off on a road we had never been on and began the drive into the mountains. After driving for around an hour, we hadn't seen or heard any signs of other people in the woods. We rounded a bend in the thick fir woods and emerged in a meadow that was totally surrounded by thick aspen groves. The meadow was perfectly flat and eerily still. We both noticed the strange stillness almost immediately. No birds, hardly any insect noise, no squirrels, and certainly no other people. On the far side of the meadow, right at the edge of a tree line, there was a picnic table. The table was very odd, however. It was painted a bright orange and was much larger than a typical picnic table in a park. Remarking on this, Nick drove through the meadow to get a closer look. I remember being apprehensive as we approached. The whole scenario was exceptionally strange. The overall silence of the aspen grove was unsettling. Also, it was nearly impossible to see far into the trees, as aspens grow extremely close together. When we parked by the table, I hopped out of the passenger seat of the truck to check it out. I'm not very tall, only about 5'5". Five five. Regardless, the table was ridiculously oversized and practically unusable. The seats were nearly at chest level, meaning I would have to climb up to even sit on them. As I was looking at the table, Nick called me over to the truck and I noticed that he was looking back into the aspens. At first, I couldn't see what he was looking at, but then I noticed a splash of color that was completely out of place in the thick trees. A small, one-man tent was set back into the trees, about 50 feet from the strange table. I had an initial feeling of dread, and felt certain that there was someone in the tent, and if we could see the tent, they could see us. There were no campgrounds in the area, no people, no main roads for miles. Surely somebody camping so remotely would be, at the very least, a strange person. However, as we observed the tent, we didn't see any movement or hear any sounds coming from it. Nick suggested that I call out. I didn't want to, but I did. Hey, anyone in there? I yelled. No reply. Feeling completely on edge, Nick and I thought about driving away and leaving this strange area, but we began to fear the worst. What if there was a body in the tent? What if somebody had gotten kidnapped? Foolish, I know, but we thought it all the same. After some debate, we decided to have Nick turn the truck around to drive away from the camp. Should we need to leave in a hurry, he would be waiting behind the wheel. With my heart pounding, I started walking through the trees toward the tent. I was totally keyed up with my senses on full alert. When I reached the campsite, several things struck me as odd. Backpacks were scattered all over. No fire had been built, no wood collected. The tent, the tent was literally full of backpacks and women's clothing. Full of dread, I turned to leave and tell Nick what I had seen. As I left, I heard Nick start yelling. Let's go, let's get the fuck out of here. Not knowing why he was yelling, I ran back to the truck. When I broke out of the trees, I saw a beat up old Ford Taurus on the road blocking us from leaving the meadow. I immediately leapt into the passenger seat and Nick floored the gas pedal. The car was occupied by two men. A third person was laying against the window in the back. As we drove across the meadow, the driver attempted to block us from the road, but Nick drove around them and accelerated the way he had come from. I looked back and saw the car attempting to turn around on the narrow road. Nick drove like a madman, and though I was honestly terrified that they would catch up, we hit the highway without seeing the car again. I still don't know if the person in the back was male or female. I called the state police and they promised to send a trooper out to check the scene. However, 
I received a call the next day from a trooper stating that the campsite, the backpacks, and the women's clothing was all gone, though he could tell that people had been in the area. The strange table was still by the thick aspen grove. I have not returned to that area, and I don't intend to. Growing up, I had a childhood friend that lived relatively close by. We were like two peas in a pod. We were both adventurous, believed in the paranormal, enjoyed astronomy, and generally just liked being outside. She was born in Alaska, and her dad had lived there for quite a while, so they were always into camping, hiking, fishing, skiing, you name it. It was with my friend's family that I got introduced to fishing and did a lot of camping. This happened during the mid to late 90s, and we were maybe about 10 to 12 years old. It's been a while, so I can't remember exactly. One camping trip, we went to this lake in the forest that was surrounded by a meadow, and feeding the lake was a small stream leading out of the woods. We played in the meadow and stream all day while my friend's dad fished. The lake wasn't very big, and because it had a meadow all around it, he could keep an eye on our whereabouts while he fished. While messing around by the stream, the wooded area it was coming from gave me weird vibes. I can't explain it. I just felt really uneasy. The day faded away into early evening and it was time to leave and find a camping spot. My friend's dad packed up his fishing gear and we all walked back to the truck on this long winding path through the woods. Once in the truck, we drove into a more remote area of the forest and made our way up the steep road it was so rough and at such an incline that I was convinced that my friend's dad was going to break his truck. He had a four, maybe six cylinder Toyota pickup that was about as basic as a truck could get. In fact, I'm not even sure if the truck had four wheel drive, but being an Alaskan outdoorsman with years of experience, I trusted him. We finally made it up to the top, which was flat and relatively open, with a big area of forest in the opposite direction from the road we came up. We pitched our tents, got everything set up, and my friend and I decided to go explore the area. We were maybe 50 yards from the tent when we heard a big crack as a tree branch snapped in the woods behind us. We got quiet and looked in that direction, but didn't see anything. Thinking that it was just a deer, we brushed it off. As we were walking, we heard it again, and whispered to one another about what it could be, but still kept going. It stopped briefly, and when we were about 200 yards from our camp, we sat on a boulder looking down the steep, wooded hill overlooking the dirt road from where we'd come. Suddenly we heard another cracking branch from behind. Whatever it was seemed to be following us. Our imaginations going wild, we came up with everything from a serial killer stalking us in the woods, to deer, to Bigfoot. When we got back to the campsite, we told her dad what we had heard and how it seemed to be paralleling us. He kind of played it off as a black bear and secured all the food. Later on, my friend confided in me that her dad had gotten out his pistol and slept with it that night. My friend and I were sharing one tent and he was in his own tent not that far from us, so we figured everything would be okay. I awoke sometime in the middle of the night hearing something or someone walking outside. As I lay still, listening, I could hear it quietly circling the tent. It sounded like it was walking on two legs because there was a distinct rhythm in how it walked. Whatever it was sounded big as I could hear its weight, if that makes any sense, as it put each foot down and walked. I could even hear relatively quiet but deep and heavy breathing at times. As I lay there, listening, I could hear it wandering to other parts of the campsite and then back to our tent, almost as if it was walking in a big, repetitive loop. This went on for who knows how long, but it felt like an eternity. Terrified and unable to wake my friend, I lay there and listened until eventually I somehow fell asleep. The next morning, I told my friend and her dad about it, but I don't know if they believed me or not. Interestingly, absolutely nothing in the camp was disturbed in any way. 
The ground was not very soft, and in some places it was covered in grass, so there were no footprints either. This is something that I have never been able to explain, and to this day, it lingers in the back of my mind when camping. I always wonder what it was that walked around our tent all night. I've had these pictures for a few years and finally thought that I would share them. These were captured on a couple of different motion-activated trail cams on the same night and appear to show the same girl carrying a bag of some sort. These pictures were taken by somebody that my dad used to work with, who sent them to my dad, who then sent them to me. So I can't be entirely sure that these are legitimate, but I have no real reason to doubt them. I don't think they were shared with many people, and I can't find them posted anywhere else online. According to my dad, this guy, who is a hunter who is using the cameras to see wildlife in the area, was so freaked out by these pictures and other strange occurrences at his home that he wanted to sell his property and leave the area. His property is in western Wisconsin. I did notice that one of the pictures is dated 2014, and another is dated 2015. I can't make out the date on the third picture, since it's a picture of the guy's computer and the date is cut off. I still have the email from when my dad sent me these pics, and I received them in September of 2014, so the picture dated 2015 has to be showing the wrong date. I'm not sure what to make of that dating error, but I still think the three pics together show some pretty convincing evidence of a ghost. The other interesting thing about these pictures is that apparently there was an ATV accident in these woods and a young woman was killed. The guy living on the property who captured these pictures showed them to a friend who was one of the EMTs at the scene of the accident, and he thought the girl in the pictures was dressed similarly to the girl who died in that accident. I have absolutely no idea when this accident occurred or the specifics of the location, so again, I cannot be sure that this is credible information. I've tried researching it, but I can't seem to find anything. So the girl in these pictures is still a mystery. I've had many of my own paranormal experiences near this area, in small town, middle of nowhere, Wisconsin. So I definitely believe these pictures could be showing a ghost, but I'm not 100% convinced. I'd love to hear others' opinions on this. So I just wanted to share the story and the photos and see what you all think. Fifteen years ago, I went camping with two school friends in Bushland that backed onto my dad's property in Wurriyalak, Australia. My dad didn't spend much time at the house, but said that we could use it as a base to dump any gear we might not need. He also gave me a heads up that he might creep up to our campsite that night and scare the guys I was with. We hiked from the house for about four hours through very dense bush, where we found a clearing and decided to set up our camp. Looking around the place for firewood, we kept turning up a lot of old bones some so old that they almost looked like wood. We concluded that due to the land once being used for farming, it was likely that they were cow bones. We came up with a few more theories for the sake of scaring each other, and then built our fire, even burning a couple of the wood-like bones just to see what would happen, and settled in. I was woken up by one of my buddies at about 1 a.m., who said that he swears he saw a torchlight on the tent wall. Excellent, I thought. We sat in silence for a few minutes before the light came back. This was great. My dad was clearly doing an awesome job. I really hammed it up, making up stories about murders in the area and escaped prisoners. The light from the torch fixed on our tent, then switched off. We could hear leaves and sticks moving around outside, and my buddies were on the verge of tears. Then we started hearing whispering outside, 
as well as some low mumbling. Did Dad bring friends on this prank? Dedicated. The torchlight came back on and pressed right up to the tent wall, and a hand began tapping across the top while the whispering continued. My dad had brought some friends in on the prank and convinced them to walk four hours through dense scrub in the middle of the night just to shine a torch on our tent. That didn't seem right. I started to panic. Then it just stopped completely, about an hour after it began. We sat in total silence aside from the sobbing of my buddies, and at dawn we packed up and got out of there. We got back out to the house, and Dad was there. He apologized and said that he had planned to come out and see us last night, but fell asleep at his girlfriend's house. We told him about what happened, and he was genuinely dumbfounded. Interestingly, I went back to the spot a couple of years ago after telling this story to a friend. We found a small shack made of corrugated iron, pockmarked with bullet holes, a 44 gallon drum full of burned clothes, a pile of firewood, and two axes. Who knows if it's related, but it was freaking creepy. Back in 2003, when I was 12 or so, my parents and I went on a road trip to Tasmania. At one point during the trip, we stayed over two nights in a modest caravan park. It seemed to have originally been built in the 70s with some refurbishments here and there. Standard budget cabin layout, sliding glass door entry to the kitchen and living area, hallway with a three-bed bunk on the right, bathroom on the left through to main bedroom with double bed. After we turned in for the night, I found myself laying awake, well after my parents had fallen asleep. Nothing new though, I've always had insomnia. It was dark enough that I could only see vague shapes in the gloom. I could hear, through their open door, each of their distinct sleep sounds. Personalized pace, depth, intermittent snoring, and the like. Being a tiny cabin, they were mere meters away from me. I had gleefully taken the top bunk so as to be the warmest because it was a bit cool. The bunk was a little bit irritating, being made of pine. It would creak loudly at the joints. But that wasn't a deal breaker. I'm not fussy. At one point, I chose to lay on my left side, facing the wood veneered wall. I toss a lot when I'm trying to fall asleep, but this time I was refraining. I didn't want to make the bunks creak and wake my light sleeping mom. I limited my rolling. So I faced the wall, one ear planted into the pillow, trying to not give in to the urge to flip over again, trying to drift off in vain. After a while, I was aware that I could now hear a third person breathing in addition to my parents. I was confused must be my own breath echoing as I was facing the wall, but how can a tiny cabin echo like that, with its compact, wood-veneered, linoleum-floored, linen-covered furniture nature? It confused and annoyed me, as I couldn't figure it out, and it was a little bit louder than my parents' collective breathing. So as an experiment, I held my breath. Still, I heard three separate bodies breathing in the cabin. I thought to myself, okay, it's my parents breathing echoing weirdly. I'm too tired to try and ponder as to how, it doesn't make any sense, but I'm tired and I don't care and I just want to sleep. I carefully rolled over, the bunk creaking, so as to perhaps point my top ear in a different direction. With my top ear pointed in a bit of a different position, I could still hear the inexplicable additional breathing. As soon as I registered how truly weird this was, and started to actually get spooked, I heard a sound. It was a sort of cough, and also sort of a sigh, combined. It was nothing akin to my parents' voices, and nothing had interrupted their rhythmic breathing. This sound came from directly across my face, as though somebody was standing beside the bunks facing me. 
In an instant, my heart rate, breathing, and body temperature all increased. Thanks, adrenaline. I couldn't see anything. There was nobody there. At least nobody I could see, thanks to the minimal light. I spent the rest of the night drifting in and out of sleep, with the blanket covering my hands, blocking my ears. I had cold flushes of fear and squeezed my eyes shut. I didn't tell my parents the next day. The next night, I asked if I could sleep on the sofa in the kitchen and living area. I was not braving that bunk again. I need sleep. I scored. The sofa was actually a sofa bed, and the cabin had an old clock radio. My folks and I had adventures during the day, and I turned in for the night once more. I set up the sofa bed. Not really comfy, but I'm not hard to cater for. It was fine. I set the clock radio over to the other side of the room and turned on a local radio station. Also not a great station, but I'm easy. My parents went to bed a little bit before I did. I was still fussing about. Not much later, maybe 15 minutes later, I eventually turned the lights off and climbed into the sofa bed. As soon as I set my butt on that bed, the radio turned to static. I got up and switched the light on to tune the radio. It had a manual turn dial for tuning. As soon as I set it again, switched the light off and sat down, the tuning was thrown. Eventually I gave up, turned it off, and buried my head under the blankets the whole night. I didn't sleep. I didn't tell my mom about this odd occurrence until about ten years later. It might be a mundane story, but it definitely rattled me given that it felt so inexplicable, and still does. I can't understand how it happened, and that's why it bothers me so much. When I was young, I attended the local scout group based in my village in Hampshire. The amount of things that I learned from scouts and the lessons it taught me are innumerable, but one particular memory stands out. Once, on a camp at an old scouting campsite, I remember that we were playing a game at night which was World War II themed. Our leader loved creating military themed games. In this game, each team had a bomb, which was just a colored string of wool, that they had to fix to the enemy base. This was a random piece of rope that was put up in the woods. We had to make sure not to get caught by the enemy soldiers, which were the leaders with their flashlights. As somewhat of a tactician, I departed from the other scouts who were heading straight down the main path toward the enemy base, and also toward the leaders, instead opting to flank around deep into the woods, which took longer, but proved to be more successful in the dark. Eventually, deep into the woods and on my way to another bombing run, I heard the distant sound of the whistle. This signaled that the game was over and that everybody should return to camp. I began making a leisurely stroll back through the darkness. I can't remember if I was alerted by sight or by sound, but my attention was drawn to a short silhouette walking through the woods about six to eight meters away. Assuming that this was one of the younger scouts who was also returning to camp, I decided it would be funny to try to scare them by making growling noises. Immediately after making the noises, the silhouette stopped dead in its tracks, turning toward me. In the darkness, I couldn't make out any of their clothes or features, but I could clearly see the blacked-out silhouette of a child. After the figure had clearly noticed me but not made a sound, I decided to carry on making growling noises, but then the silhouette turned around and began to walk away from me. They were clearly unfazed by my attempt to scare them, so I figured that I would follow them back to camp. However, after a few steps, the figure literally face-planted into the ground, still about eight meters in front of me. I jogged a bit to catch up with them to make sure they were okay, but upon reaching where they should have been, there was no trace of anybody. Confused, I looked around for a while, seeing if they had scrambled off, but there was no noise of somebody running away, and I didn't notice them get up. They'd just vanished. Still in a state of confusion, I continued to walk back to the camp alone and didn't really tell anybody about this until years later when it clicked in my brain 
that things did not add up. Something else that sticks in my memory from that camp, which is probably unrelated but is still strange, was that part of the woods had been cut down and the ground heavily churned up by some sort of heavy-duty machine. Whilst exploring this area, some of my friends and I found an old leather briefcase that looked like it had been churned up by whatever machine had been in the area. Upon opening the briefcase, we found a really old scouting uniform with quite a few loose badges and some other personal items. I'm a 23-year-old boy whose family moved during the Yugoslavian War in 1999 from eastern Serbia to Switzerland. We used to live in a small village across the Danube at the Bulgarian and Romanian border, a region that has a very colorful history. Many bloody historic events occurred on the soil where we lived. Roman emperors used to rule this area as well as many historical figures such as Attila the Hun, Alexander the Great, and others such as Vlad the Impaler. All of them once resided here and fought battles. The region has been occupied many times. The longest used to be under the Ottomans. This occupation lasted for almost three centuries. After the Ottoman occupation, the country didn't have much time to recover, and the First and Second World War had struck the country already. Many people died during the First World War, about a third of the population. As a result, guerrilla groups were formed, killing even more people. Many people were unjustifiably tortured and lost their lives, which is probably why there are so many occurrences of the paranormal there. Magic is very common here. The so-called Vlak Magic, or Vlaska Magia, in Valachian is said to be one of the strongest in the world, and so many people practice it religiously and believe in it there. As a result, there are many stories about the paranormal events that happen there. One of my favorite ones was a story my grandfather told me. He grew up in the forest in a small and old house. It was about 300 years old. He was adopted by my great-grandfather, who used to be a leader in one of the upcoming resistance movements against the socialist regime after the Second World War. He fought in both world wars, and even with all this, he took great care of my grandfather and loved him as if he was his own child. Fifty years passed since he left his home, and all of those people living here died, but my grandpa still visits this house and stays overnight here. This place creeps me out, even during the day. There's just an aura to this place that makes it feel uncomfortable. I can't imagine staying here overnight. But he frequently does, and one day he told me a very weird story. While he was staying there, and whenever he does, he often gets visited. At first I thought a visit like the ones you get from neighbors or something, but he told me no. One night he woke up with a hand crawling on his head. It was a huge, white, pale man kneeling next to him and sort of crawling his hand across his head, speaking with a calm voice in Vlaski, the dying language that we use to speak here, which is a mix of Moldavian and Romanian. He told me that his skin was white and that it was glowing in the night. He didn't have any hair and the hand felt very soft. My grandfather always respected the dead and was never really afraid. He told me that he didn't really speak to him and just enjoyed his company, since he knew in some way he wasn't evil. Another time he told me that he used to fix small parts around the house. When it started to get dark, he slowly began getting ready to leave with his tractor, because it takes like an hour to reach the next civilized place. While putting stuff back into the barn, he heard loud noises in the attic. It didn't even bother him until a plank was thrown down the stairs. He recalled one time that they even threw down a rock into the wheelbarrow that he was pushing into the barn. He just told me that he turned around, locked the barn, and didn't even frown. They expect you to react, he said. Don't give them this pleasure. He laughed and then said, it makes them go crazy. Growing up, I heard a lot of these stories, and it really runs in our family, experiencing them from time to time. The scariest thing that happened to me occurred during the summer of 2009. 
My grandfather told me during this summer break, as usual, stories from his past of how he used to walk these woods alone in the dark and what he experienced while doing so. And since I was in my teen years, I started to question the reliability of his stories. From time to time, I took out my old motorbike and drove into the forest. Driving around was the only time that I could really think about stuff, you know? and be in the kind of state that you question everything and think about the world. So one day I took out my bike and decided to drive around. I still don't know why or how, but somehow I found myself driving to the old house he grew up in. I didn't really bother to question why my intention was to drive there, so I just kept going. I always believed that I'm a kid, pure by heart. No evil can come to me. While I was driving out, I thought about the probabilities of actually encountering a vampire. As I mentioned, I live in East Serbia where vampires are widely believed in. My grandpa always told me not to go out past dawn, but I didn't really care so I kept going. Remembering back, I thought that his intention was to keep me scared and not get lost in the woods, but being a teenager at the time, I thought I was invincible, and in fact, even if a vampire would cross my path, that I would ease past him with no harm. There aren't really streets there, it's just a dirt road between trees that leads to what seems to be nothing. After an hour, even the dirt roads start to vanish. While I was driving and thinking about how strong I was, I noticed that my hand felt very wet. I thought it was because I was sweating since this region can get very hot. After taking a look at my hand though, I saw that there was blood all over it. I thought it might be a bug that I had squished, but there was just too much blood. I started looking for wounds, but my hand seemed perfectly fine. My heart slowly started to race and increased in pace, and I took a sharp turn and drove back home. I remembered this to be the moment that I was most scared in my whole life. I had the urge to look behind me every second that I was driving through the forest. It seemed like someone was sitting behind me, just waiting for me to fall down. After arriving home and telling my grandpa, he just started laughing and told me never to question their abilities again. I have a ton of stories regarding these events. Living in the Wallachian forest, you run into a lot of this stuff. But to this day, that was still the scariest thing that ever happened to me. Everything happened this summer when I was working and living in the Chicago area. I don't know much about spirits or paranormal events, so I'll just give you the facts of what happened and you can draw your own conclusions. In the first few weeks of my new job, I met this really great guy. We'll call him Paul. We hit it off immediately and one day he suggested that we go hiking in the woods. I am from Russia originally, so I was practically raised in the woods. I spent half of my childhood in them, so I was really excited about this proposal. As we're hiking, it starts raining, like pouring rain. I've never seen anything like it. We go deeper and deeper into the forest until there are no more paths and we're practically treading swamp water. All this time we're just talking about random stuff and getting to know each other while not really paying much attention to the surroundings. There's no one around since we've gone pretty deep already, and like I said it was pouring buckets. Eventually we stumbled on the skeleton of a teepee, just the bare wooden structure of it, and thought that that was pretty cool, so we kept going in that direction. Suddenly we both hear someone crying. In fact, it sounded like a baby. It's a forest, so a lot of animals can imitate that sound, like deer, cubs, etc. And the cry sounded distant anyway, so we thought nothing of it and kept forward. Within seconds, we heard the cry right next to us, which seemed strange since it sounded so far away at first. It was so loud it could have been just a few feet away. We start looking all around, even looking at the trees, but absolutely nothing was there. It was a pretty weird situation, so we kind of speed walked in the other direction. As soon as we stopped for a break, 
The sound started up right next to us again, like something was telling us to book it. So we did. We ran faster than what was probably safe in that kind of weather, half looking at Google Maps and half relying on memory. We finally made it back to the entrance of the woods. We both agreed that what happened was pretty weird and decided to look into the history of the place. Immediately, websites like Most Haunted Forests in Illinois started popping up. Turns out the place was the site of an ancient Native American burial grounds. Not surprising, since a lot of tribes used to live in various parts of Illinois. And apparently it's where three young boys were brutally murdered and left naked in a ditch. Pretty dark stuff. Paul and I went back, and I kind of forgot about the incident. Until one evening after work, he tells me that he can't stop thinking about that cry, and he wants to go back to see what was there. Naturally, I think this is a stupid idea, especially because it was already dark out. But then Paul's friend Ryan joins him for kicks, and since I'm worried for both of their safety, 20-something fresh out of college dudes can be very dumb, I come along thinking that at the very least I might be able to keep them out of trouble. So we hop in the car and drive over there. Traffic is insane and my friend takes a wrong turn, so we get there at around 11 p.m. We get out and head into the forest. Now, there are no street lights anywhere near us, except right at the edge of the road. And the flashlights can only do so much, so our visibility is pretty bad. We eventually get to a small wooden bridge that leads us across the river into the actual deep part of the forest. And as soon as we cross, I start feeling uneasy. We weren't supposed to be in the woods that late in the first place, but there was a deeper feeling of guilt, like we were intruding or disturbing something that was there. Ryan, who's been leading the way and feeling all confident and cocky, says that there's nothing out here and then all of a sudden he stops. On the other side of the bridge, the three of us were hit with this feeling of dread and panic, one that I've never felt before in a forest, and I've been to lots, both in the day and at night. We all exchange nervous looks, and suddenly we hear crunching coming toward us from the dark. At this point, the feeling gets so intense that Ryan, confidently walking ahead seconds ago, now looks uneasy and says, I, I think we should go back. We all slowly turn and start speed walking toward the bridge. No one talks until we get to the other side. Ryan says, I was just nervous because it might have been a homeless person and I didn't want to deal with that. Sure. Eventually, we get to the road where our car was parked along the side, and that's when I see a girl, maybe in her early 20s. She looked to be either Native American or a mix of Asian and Latina, just walking along the highway. She was wearing very little clothing and looked a little strange. Her walk wasn't a drunk one. She just seemed to be almost, I don't know the right word for it, vibrating, undulating, I'm not sure, but there wasn't a building around for miles, just straight road. My stepdad is Malaysian, and he's told me a bunch of ghost stories about young ghost women on the side of the road killing drivers, but I was willing to risk it because I didn't want to leave this girl all alone, ghost or no ghost, so I convinced Paul to slow down a bit when we get to her. I called out to her from the passenger window, asking if she needed help. The girl slowly turns around with the creepiest, slowest smile spreading across her lips and nodded. I was hit with that same feeling that I got back there in the forest and almost regretted slowing down. But whatever, screw it. My sense of wanting to help that girl was greater than whatever weird stuff I was feeling. And if I died, then at least I'd have a clean conscience. She gets in the back of the car, right behind my seat, and next to Ryan, who's kind of a flirt, and he started to chatter up, asking where she's from and what she's doing. All this time, I'm turned halfway around, keeping an eye on her, because I feel like as soon as I turn around and face the road, 
something bad is going to happen. She's making eye contact with me the whole time, even when Ryan is talking to her, with that slow, creepy smile, while slightly undulating, vibrating. I don't know, but it just seemed snake-like. Ryan asks her where she's coming from, and she says, oh, just around. He asks if she's coming from a bar, and she nods her head yes, except that there are no bars anywhere even close, not for miles and miles. She said she was walking home and gives Paul an address, which is 15 minutes away by car. All along, nothing but forest. If she was going to walk home, she would have walked around two hours, all on highway. My eyes hurt for making eye contact with her, and she just kept smiling and undulating. This feeling of dread just kept increasing. Eventually, we dropped her off at her street, lots of old-looking, smaller houses. And when I turned back to look at her a second later, she was gone. I couldn't sleep that night. I kept imagining her creeping up the stairs, her smiling face undulating from the shadows. About three years ago, I was on a family vacation to Eastern Washington, and a central aspect of our trip was visiting Lake Paragon State Park. It's in an extremely rural area with a tiny western town about a mile away, and that's about it, for miles. Anyway, we had just arrived for our 10-day stay in the afternoon, and it was now around 11 p.m. My mom and I left our hotel to go down to the park, as she was really into photography and the moon was full. If you're not familiar, eastern Washington as a whole is very desolate, so the night sky is generally incredible, no light pollution. There were no clouds to be seen, and we were a ways down a dirt back road over the park. We were above the campground, with no real roads anywhere in sight. We got out of the car and took some pictures, with nothing more unusual than the eerie silence. About 15 minutes into our visit, we were both facing away from the moon, looking at the rolling hills, and we noticed an odd concentration of light on one hillside about a quarter mile away. Before either one of us could point it out to the other, the mass of light shining on this hill rolled away into nowhere. It took two seconds and was entirely gone. The whole hillside was brightly lit up, and then nothing. We freaked out and got out of there as fast as humanly possible. We both saw it. There were no other people, no moving clouds, and no roads from which headlights could shine. Any explanations? 